uh, sometimes these uh, discs are tilted because uh, the optic nerve may enter the globe directly or may en enter it at an angle which gives the shape of a tilted disc. Now, uh, regarding peripapillary atrophy, now uh, the uh, alpha zone I said is normal, the beta zone is generally uh, associated with glaucoma and the extent generally corresponds with the location of the area of mark, the most marked loss of the neuroretinal ring. So if you know that the patient is not a myop but you are seeing a large beta zone, this may be a patient with glaucoma. So look for the peripapillary atrophy on the, uh, which is more marked on the temporal uh, margin of the disc, more and inferiorly than superiorly. Uh, disc hemorrhages may be seen either on the disc or on the border of the disc. So now these are associated with glaucoma and associate, indicate a progression of glaucoma because later on you see uh, loss of new, uh, nerve fiber layer uh, in that uh, area. But they are not, they are more uh, strongly associated with normal tension glaucoma, uh, but they, they are not necessarily seen in patients with glaucoma, but may be seen in uh, other diseases as well. Then uh, retinal nerve fiber layer defects uh, can be seen as areas uh, that are dark bands by using the green filter. We use the green filter on the slit lamp. There's a, a green filter on the ophthalmoscope as well. So uh, there's uh, thinning and a loss of brightness and density of striations. Uh, with these may be either wedge-shaped defects or uh, dark bands. Then uh, the cup disc ratio. Now uh, the isn't rule. Isn't rule is that the, in the uh, uh, neuroretinal rim, the uh, nerve fiber layer is thickest inferiorly, then superiorly, then nasally, and last temporally. Now uh, this is applicable only to normal sized disc because in a large disc, the uh, distribution may be equal and this may not uh, apply. And uh, usually in glaucoma, the inferior and superior uh, retinal nerve fiber layer is the first to go so that uh, this isn't rule changes. So you have to look for the uh, isn't rule, whether the disc uh, is uh, respecting this rule. Then the uh, depth of the cup. So the depth of the cup uh, is actually seen uh, three-dimensionally on a slit lamp, but you can uh, just assess the depth of the cup because that is where the uh, blood vessels bend because the cup is not the white area. It is the, the margin of the cup is where the blood vessels bend to bow up. Then uh, the uh, neuroretinal rim the, uh, the black arrows show the um, out, outer margin and the uh, blue arrow heads show the inner margin of the neuroretinal rim and the cup to disc ratio uh, is the, usually you consider the, uh, the vertical cup disc ratio here. Now regarding the cup disc ratio, this also is applicable only to uh, the normal size disc because in a large disc, even a uh, 0.7 uh, cup disc ratio may be normal because uh, in the diagram below I have shown, a large disc generally has a large cup. And uh, this cup disc ratio uh, generally uh, uh, respects when the uh, cup, the, sorry, the disc is of normal size. And we all know that uh, small optic discs may, know, may not know changes in spite of, may, may not know a significant cup in, in spite of uh, significant glaucomatous uh, damage. Then looking at the vessels. Now uh, the vessels get displaced uh, with the enlargement of the cup 
due to the loss of neuroretinal rim and uh, you can see various changes the winds the vessels double bending bending and uh, moving to the periphery uh, then uh, another fact that uh, you can assess is the asymmetry of the optic cup uh, discs because now generally the uh, generally the cups are symmetrical you know that although glaucoma is a uh, bilateral disease sometimes it manifests in one eye first so that uh, you may note the cup in first in one eye so if there's a cup disc ratio difference more than 0.2 between the two eyes it may be a feature of glaucoma then there may be other optic neuropathies that mimic glaucoma but one thing you must remember is even when there is advanced uh, glaucomatous damage that neuroretinal rim shows vascularity whereas uh, in uh, optic disc pallor either due to anterior ischemic optic neuropathy or due to space occupying lesion the whole of the disc is pale and uh, this should not be uh, confused with glaucoma so i think i may have given you an idea about the uh, correct examination of the optic disc uh, to detect glaucoma to screen for glaucoma thank you for your kind attention thank you very much madam please remain on the stage i would like to invite mr dasanta fonseca to uh, deliver the token of appreciation to our chief guest, consultant eye surgeon, Dr. Mrs. Pradeepa K. Sirivardhana. Thank you all. Daniel Savin. Diana Nilukshi. Lahiru Udayanga. Sohan Sandakalu. Usha Yogaraj.
ಆತ್ಮೀಮನ ಕುಮಾರ್ಗೆ ಜಾಯಿನಿ ನಿರಾಶಾ ದುಲ್ಮಿನಿ ಎಂ ನಿ ನಿಶೇಖಾ ವಿಷಾನಿ ಪೆರೇರಾ ತಾರುಷಿ ಇಮಾಶಾ ಹತುರಸಿಂಗ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ವೆರಿ ಮಚ್ ಮೇಡಮ್ ಮೇಡಮ್ ಪ್ಲೀಸ್ ರಿಮೇನ್ ಆನ್ ದ ಸ್ಟೇಜ್ ಪ್ಲೀಸ್ ಆಕ್ಸೆಪ್ಟ್ ದಿಸ್ ಟೋಕನ್ ಆಫ್ ಅಪ್ರಿಸಿಯೇಷನ್ ಫಾರ್ ಯುವರ್ ವ್ಯಾಲ್ಯೂಬಲ್ ಪರ್ಸನ್ Thank you very much madam I would like to invite professor Vajra Dikshanaika to distribute the certificates cordially with the Mr Dasanda Fonseca and Mr Vidya Jaratna Certificates for audiometry batch 3 Dilan Rana Singh Ishara Anuradhi K Pranavan Sumali Sitara certificates for audiometry batch 4 amandi rasara karuna ratna priyanka raghavan
Dinuka Ilshan and Sureni Prabodhya. Nayoni Udayangani Certificates for Audiometry Batch 5 KAMT Tilini Isa Sabir Yomal Illisinghe KP Ishani Dilhara Gunatilaka Hashini Chamilka Samira Sandon Certificates for Audiometry Batch 6 G. Anisha Devi Kavilya Fernando, Heva Manage Sandunika Madushani Herat, K. Oshini Kavilya Mendis, Tarindu Rukshan. Thank you very much, Professor Bajiraji Now, I would like to invite Dr. Mrs. Pradipa K. Silvadana to distribute the certificates. Certificate for Ophthalmic Assistance, COA Batch 11, Sanduni Asha. Ashan Pramila Lakshika Devumi Devanarayana Nuvandara Nitsarani Dushan Dilka M. Mofit Umeshika Nipuni Gomis I would like to invite Professor Bajrishnana Prasad Fernando Ayomika Dimanti Kasun Madhusanka Pereira Sitara Nisanka Sachini Nirushima Mitum Dananjaya Malindu Bandara Lakmal Tushara Karuna Ratna Sumali Sitara Uttara Sammani Certificate for Audiometry Batch 4 Amandi Rashara Karana Dasun Taranga Priyankara Anavan Certificates for Ophthalmic Assistant Batch 12 Danushi Navodhya Harisha Madhushan Fernando Ayesha Hasini Lakshani
certificates for ophthalmic assistant batch 13 tiruni madara heva vitarana yomal illisina hm isurika udeshini Nimasha Fonseca Malki Kaushalya DM Sehan J. Disana Aika SLA Shashika Priyanka Leonarachi W. M. Dilumi Samadhi Vira Singha L. P. Kaviduni Madhushani Ushini Porambage W. Imashi Sanjana Pereira. Now I would like to invite Dr. Mrs. Paripa K. C. H. A. Ashan Chaturanga. M. G. Abindu Imarshana. Certificates for Ophthalmic Assistant, Batch 14. Netmi Sandeepani. Malisha Ranasuriya Jeevanta Hirushan Devapriya Hirushi Nirmani Pragit Srimal Udara Lakshan Pamod Madushan Kasunika Sevandi Hansika Sandali Yoga Chandran Suloja Pavani Rashmika Mitum Dananjaya Malindu Banda Semini Ruvandi Kavinda Disa Nayaka Sonali Vimansa Thank you very much, Madam. Kindly have your seat. Now, I would like to invite Professor Benita Stephen to distribute the certificates. Certific certificates for Diploma in Optometry Lateral Entry Batch 5. Piyumi Chaturangi Kandalama RM Geetika Tarangani Jeremy J. Sudhasan
Udari Dilushika Mohan Certificates for Diploma in Optometry Lateral Entry Batch 6 Mahesha Nishadi Certificates for Diploma in Optometry Lateral Entry Batch 7 Sanduni Asha Ashan Pramila Madhushankar Fatima Mufriza Salim Dushan Dilka Aloka Prematila Certificates for Diploma in Optometry Batch 1, Manisha Vitanavasa. Gafur Sarina. Tarindu Kanchana. Chamika Sandaruvan Erandika Lakshan Kalpana Kaushalya Thank you very much, madam. Please remain on the stage. Please remain on the stage, madam. There's a token of appreciation for your valuable presence. Please accept it from Mr. Dasanta Fonseca. Thank you very much. I would like to invite optometrist and orthoptist Mrs. Shanura Mahindapala onto the stage to deliver the oath for optometry practitioners. Also, certificate holders stand in front of the stage to pledge.
certificate for diploma in optometry batch 1 manisha vitanavasan gafur sarina sarindu kanchana Chamika Sandaruvan okay. Eranvika Lakshan Do you want to write hand? Okay. Please kindly rise for the oath. Kalpana Kaushalya Thank you very much, madam. Please remain on the stage. Please remain on the stage, madam. There's a token of appreciation for your valuable presence. Please accept it from Mr. Dasanta Fonseca. Oath for optometry practitioners. With full deliberation. Thank you very much. I freely and solemnly pledge that I will practice the art and science of optometry faithfully and conscientiously and to the fullest of my competence. I would like to invite optometrists and orthoptists, Mrs. Sandra I will uphold onto the stage and honorably promote by also certificate for example and action the, the highest standards ethics and ideals of the profession of optometry. I will provide professional care for those who seek my services with concern, with compassion, and with due regard for their human rights and dignity. I will place the treatment of those who seek my care above personal gain and strive to see that none shall lack for proper care. I will hold as privilege and inviolable all information entrusted to me in confidence by my patients. I will advise my patients fully and honestly of all which may serve to restore, maintain, or enhance their vision and general health. I will strive continuously to broaden my knowledge and skills so that my patients may benefit from all new and efficacious means to enhance the care of human vision. I will share information cordially and unselfishly with my fellow optometrists and other professionals for the benefit of patients and the advancement of human knowledge and welfare. I will do my utmost to serve my community my country, and mankind as a citizen, as well as an optometrist. I hereby commit myself to be steadfast in the performance of this solemn oath and obligation. Thank you.
Thank you, Mrs. Chanura. Please be seated. He obtained the MBBS from the University of Colombo and PhD from Nottingham University, the chair and the senior professor in the Department of Anatomy, Genetics and Biomedical Informatics, and the dean of the Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo, Sri Lanka. Pioneer in genetics, genomics, biomedical informatics, and bioethics, also a leading researcher in these fields in Sri Lanka. He has supervised 15 PhD students and 60 MSc students. He together with his students and colleagues have been the recipient of more than 40 awards for the research and innovation at university for both national and international levels. In recognition of his scientific achievements, he was elected a fellow of the National Academy of Sciences of Sri Lanka in 2013, a fellow of the International Academy of Health Sciences Informatics in 2020 and conferred the Sri Lanka National Titular Honor of Vidya Jyoti in 2019. He has held many leadership positions in the field of medicine. He was the president of the Sri Lanka Medical Association in 2012 and the president of the Commonwealth Medical Association from 2016 to 2019. His other leadership positions includes Honorary Secretary, Sri Lanka Medical Association, 2000 and 2005, Founder Secretary Health Informatics Society of Sri Lanka, 1998 to 2000, President Health Informatics Society of Sri Lanka, 2009 to 2019, President Asia Pacific Association for Medical Informatics, 2019 to 2020, Steering Committee Forum of Ethical Review Committees in Asia and the Western Pacific since 2010, Executive Board Member, Global Genomic Medicine Collaborative since June 2016. Chairperson and Partner Alliances since 2021. He is the current president of the Sri Lanka Medical Council. We are honored to invite our guest of honor, Professor Vajira Disanayaka, to deliver his speech.
Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for those kind words of introduction. Chief guest, Dr. Sirivaradana, my teachers, Professor Stephen and Dr. Mendes, my colleagues, uh, Professor uh, Disanayaka and uh, the other consultant uh, from the National High Hospital and other places, uh, Mr. Dasanta Fonseca, uh, Chairman of uh, Vision Care, Vindya, the um, uh, Chair of the Academy, uh, other colleagues, distinguished invitees, students, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to stand before you and say a few words this morning. The uh, reason I believe that I was uh, invited to talk to you this morning uh, was not only because I'm the president of the Sri Lanka Medical Council, but another title that I hold, which was not mentioned, that is Registrar of the Ceylon Medical College Council, which is the organization which is, I think, most relevant uh, to all of you. Let me um, go back a little and reflect on these roles that I play and how it affects you. I was appointed uh, the Registrar of the Ceylon Medical College Council about a year ago. And at that time, I was, uh, I, I came mm, to, uh, I, was kind of, I was put on a hot seat as it were. I had to learn on the go, N learn on the go not only about optometry and the field, but of 14 other fields that we regulate. So it was a tough task. I had to rely on a lot of people and uh, talk with a lot of people. So one of the people I relied on, uh, or two people that I relied on are here this morning. One was uh, my own colleague, Dr. Uh, Prof. Madhuanti Isanayaka, and I kind of talked with her and got a 101 of the field from her and what the different practitioners do and how we can probably go on to regulate them. And then, of course, I reached out to Mr. Dasanta Fonseca and I told him uh, to give me an update also. So Dasanta, I was sitting there just now and reading the email that you wrote to me on 1st of August last year. It was a long email uh, covering the entire field of optometry, what has happened uh, throughout the last maybe 75 years or longer, and how the field has evolved. That was a refresher of what you told me last year. But what we have done over the past year is we have looked at all the fields that come under the regulation of the Ceylon Medical College Council and the Sri Lanka Medical Council and looked at how we can update all the regulations in these fields and make them fit for purpose today because these regulations, the guidelines, have just stood there for the past, you know, three, four or five decades without being updated and regulated uh, in an appropriate manner. So, as a prelude to this, in addition to what I just mentioned, last year in the Sri Lanka Medical Council, we called for ideas from professionals in all fields on what we have to do to regulate these fields. Unfortunately, there were very few responses to the call for ideas or expressions of interest. Then, 
because of that lack of interest, we went on and decided to do something that the Sri Lanka Medical Council has not done for the past 100 years. That is, we had never re-registered practitioners in fields other than medicine and surgery, uh, medicine and uh, dentistry. So it's only the medical practitioners and the dental practitioners who get re-registered. The other practitioners don't. And in fact, that's a challenge to us. We do not know how many practitioners, registered practitioners are practicing in the country. And in your field, everyone is lumped together as ophthalmic auxiliaries, which is something that we need to change, and I'm committed to changing that. You will be amazed if I tell you that as of end of April this year, only 46 have re-registered. So only 46 practitioners in your field have re-registered with the Sri Lanka Medical Council. So that is that should actually ring alarm bells because the rest are not registered practitioners. In the field of medicine and healthcare, those practitioners, whoever they may be, should be registered and regulated. And if we cannot have unregulated practice going on. So we need all your help to quickly bring about change in all these regulations. So to facilitate that further, going back to the Ceylon Medical College Council and the you know, ideas that I got, what we did last year was we had a symposium where we brought in groups. Again, we advertised saying we are going to have a workshop, express your interest to come and share your ideas, and then we brought in groups of practitioners in all the 14 different areas that we regulate, including optometry. And we asked those groups to start working together to look at updating their guidelines on education, recognition of education, then and also practice. Some of those groups have worked very fast and on my table now we have completed regulations which we will be uh, approving through the councils and which we will now go to government to get them gasseted as gasseted regulations. At the same time, there are others who are lagging behind. We focused on areas that were most troublesome, like um, uh, so there are certain areas that were most troublesome, so we did that first. But now we have the opportunity to work with the less troublesome areas, such as optometry, uh, and we look forward to working with the leaders in the field who are present here this morning, as well as the others, so that we will bring about the appropriate change in the recognition process, the regulations, so that all of you can truly call yourself registered practitioners in the years to come. So these are some of the little things that are happening behind the scene. And I can tell you, as both the registrar of the Ceylon Medical College Council, as well as the um, president of the Sri Lanka Medical Council, I'm committed to bringing about these changes. And therefore, please always engage us Tell us what you would like to see. Tell us the changes that you want to see us bring about. So that that you know, engagement that you have with us would be the motivation for us to go forward. The motivation for us to bring about the changes that you desire. Because at the end of the day, we 
have to bring about the changes that are required in every field in our country so that young people like all of you who graduated today would want to love to wait in this country and bring about the development that we want and seek for this country. We would not, I personally would not like to see you having to seek greener pastures somewhere, leaving behind your parents and everybody else here because we haven't, the, those in leadership positions haven't bring about the changes that are required for you, that are, that, that are required to enable you to flourish in this country. So with those words, let me uh, congratulate uh, Vision Care and the Vision Care Academy for creating opportunities for young people. I was sitting there and uh, thinking over the past so many years, the, our university system has actually failed to create those opportunities that you have created for them because we just have only one optimetric program in the entire university system of Sri Lanka, which is, uh, you know, not, as, uh, not a good state of affairs at all. We in the Faculty of Medicine have always been committed to improving standards in the field. Professor Benita Stevens, uh, was with us, then Professor uh, uh, Madhuvanti Disanayaka is with us. We have now set up a center for IKEA in our new UCFM tower. We are collaborating with you, the Vision Care Academy, uh, in that I'm sure we can create more and more opportunities uh, through a formal collaboration, and I'm, sh I'm looking forward to having that discussion with you on how we can bring about a public-private partnership that would benefit uh, all of uh, you, the young people uh, in this audience, uh, and help you flourish in your profession in the years to come and serve the nation and the people so that we would take um, the field of um, ophthalmology and optometry uh, in our country uh, to the highest level possible because we all have to coexist and ensure that our country uh, attains some level of development state, uh, developed status in our lifetime. So with those words, I'd like to organize, uh, thank the organizing committee um, for inviting me this morning and I'd like to congratulate uh, those who graduated today and received awards um, uh, for a bright future. And I hope that uh, you, through the Ceylon Medical College Council and the Sri Lanka Medical Council, uh, we will be able to enable you to flourish uh, in your fields in the future. Thank you very much. On the stage. Please remain on the stage. There is a token for you, for your, a token of appreciation for your valuable presence and for the speech. Thank you very much. He is a senior consultant eye surgeon holding a diploma of ophthalmology from London and he is a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons in Edinburgh, England. Additionally, he is a fellow of the Royal College of Ophthalmologists. The, these qualifications reflect his dedication to continuous learning and professional development, ensuring that he remains at the forefront of advancements in eye surgery. He has played a pivotal role in National Eye Hospital Services, serving as a consultant eye surgeon for over two decades, from 1973 to 1998, and distinguished professional who serves as a director of the National Eye Hospital from an illustrious decade from 1988 to 1998. His invaluable expertise and commitment to his patients have earned him a stellar reputation within the medical community and among his peers. 
Currently, he offers his expertise as senior consultant eye surgeon at the Golden Key Eye and ENT Hospital. With his compassionate approach and meticulous surgical skills, he strives to provide a higher standard of care to his patients addressing a wide range of eye-related conditions. Beyond his clinical work, he has likely made contributions to the scientific and academic realms of ophthalmology. We are honored to invite consultant eye surgeon Dr. Upali Mendis to deliver his speech. Yeah, this is a uh, Pro Professor Vajra Senaratna, uh, Benita Stevens, Dr. Pradeepa Sirwadana, and Madhuanti, uh, and Dasanta and Kumari Fonseca. Thank you very much for your invitation to address this Optometric Association of Sri Lanka. I, I was delighted to accept this invitation because most of opt optometrists are not uh, familiar with the subject I'm going to deal with. Now, the my uh, title uh, of my presentation: Role of Prisms in Spectral Correction. not working on that. The prisms, they, they have a base and an apex. Do not contain any fo focusing power, cannot correct a refractive error. Uh, redirects light to the corresponding points in the retina when visual axes are misaligned. Every lens except plano, plano has a potential to become a prism. Prisms can be placed horizontally, vertically, and diagonally in one or both lenses. Light will be redirected around the base. Objects viewed shifted towards the apex. Universal sign is uh, prisms. Uh, prisms always come with an amount and direction to a prism base out. Optical centers placed in front of the visual axis, only the spectral refraction, no prismatic effect. Only prescription value of the lenses. Minus lens, optical centers are in the center. And the plus lenses, optical centers. MRP, major reference point. The minus lenses, uh, two prisms, apex to apex. Ima images mini five and diverge. The plus lenses, two prisms base to base. Images magnify and converge. Aligning at optical center at patient's visual axis. No deviation of light at the optical center. Equal prism. Moving the eyes in any direction induces a prismatic effect in each lens. If powers of lenses are the same, prismatic effect induced is the same. Say both eyes, the correction is uh, minus one spheres. Prismatic effect is the same, no usual imbalance. Lens power is different. Unequal prisms, persons may have to accommodate to achieve single focus. Now, the powers are two different minus three on one, one eye and the minus one. It suppresses one eye to avoid double vision. Tolerates, ho tolerates horizontal prisms better. Lens types and powers have different unequal prisms. Here, here one has uh, minus three uh, uh, diopters, and the other one plus one, the other eye plus one. The images are displaced to the right in both eyes, unequal in amount and size. Person has to employ accommodation or suppress an image to achieve single vision. Glasses are fabricated incorrectly, same powers. The, uh, the 
the visual axis is, al is uh, alignment with op the optical center, no prismatic effect. Here, there's a prismatic effect where, because the visual axes are not aligned with the optical centers. Based down prisms, viewing below the optical center, like in a minus lens, being here, viewing above the optical center in a plus lens. Base up prisms also same in the minus lens and in the plus lens. The Prentice rule, prisms induced when looking through any part of the lens other than the optical center. That is, if you are looking outside the optical center, there's a prismatic effect. Prentice rule determines the amount of prism induced when looking through the outside the optical center. Now, now the, how you uh, determine is the amount of prism created by displacement equals distance from the optical center in centimeters and the power of the lens. That is, how you calculate this is that uh, you ask the patient to wear the uh, spectacles and uh, with the pupillometer determine where the uh, visual axis is. And then uh, see whether that point corresponds with the optical center using the lens meter. So you can, you can see whether there's a difference and you de uh, determine the difference in centimeters. So that's, that's and I will come into later how you use the Prentice rule. Prisms are used in patients with diplopia to move the images to the eye that is naturally resting. Goal is binocular vision in primary gaze. Images are moved to the apex. Right eye, for right eye, you use a, a base of prism uh, in isotropia. In exotropia, you get a base in uh, prism. In uh, hypertropia, base down, and hypertropia, base up. The left eye, cha you change the direction of prism. History is key. Close one eye, then you can determine whether there is binocular diplopia or monocular diplopia. Binocular, you must find out the direction, duration, location, and associated symptoms. Monocular diplopia, you get with refractive error. Cornea, cornea uh, scars, uh, cataracts, or uh, retinal, even a bit of retinal detachment. These are abnormal head postures. These are, uh, sometimes you use this to do the uh, initial examination, like birth, poor loss test, Krimsky test, ducks and roses. Treating diplopia, rule out pathological non-surgical, occlusion, prisms, and then surgical. Occlusion, go goal is monocular vision to alleviate diplopia. Uh, patching can be ordered in different densities. Diplopia results in all positions of gaze, immediate relief, inexpensive, but it's poor cosmesis and lack of binocular vision. Prisms, goal is binocular vision in primary gaze. Apex of prison where the eye is resting, Ex exotropia base in, exotropia base out, hypertropia and... Indications for pr prison rules. Convergence insufficiency. Given that a my myotic spectacle corrects inherent base in prisms when converging, uh, in contrast, a hyperopic will experience more difficulty with convergence with spectacle use. Now that is because, now when you use a, a high hyperopic correction um, uh, for patients, say for read, reading glasses, they find it difficult to use it for a long time because of the uh, uh, prismatic effect. So you can correct patients, who, especially elderly patients, who have high correction, like all low visual aids with, uh, with uh, 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 with uh, incorporating a prismatic correction acquired before or following screen surgery. That is because if there is a traumatic 
like incompetent squint, and you correct it surgically, and then still if there's a residual squint, slight residual squint, you can correct it with prisms. You don't have to, uh, may not, he, patient may not be willing for the surgery. Then, uh, then anisometropia. Also, when a patient has, uh, there's anisometropia, say one, one eye is plano and the next eye is minus four or something like that. When they look to a side, they have double vision. So uh, you can correct that with, um, with a prison. Then congenital, especially Duane's, uh, like Duane's retraction syndrome, they, they have a head tilt. They, uh, they have head, head turn because they have diplopia on uh, lateral gaze. So you can correct that by in incorporating a uh, prison. A fresnel's prison. They are fitted, uh, fitted over front or back of a lens, used initially where the person can adapt to prisms, temporary, can be used when, uh, when uh, under investigation for etiology. That is when you are investigating, temp is, uh, uh, prisons can be used as a temporary measure. The advantage of that can be used immediately for relief, easy to change, lightweight, ideal for large deviations up to 40 percent diopters, inexpensive. Disadvantages visible, not ideal for long-term use, hard to correct both horizontal and vertical deviations simultaneously, used in one eye. Always placed in one eye, bilateral, very uncomfortable. Ground in prisons, advantages, prison built into glass uh, prescription, used when deviation is stable, not easily visible, corrects both horizontal and vertical deviations, can be split between the two lenses to make it more symmetric. Like uh, if you have uh, two powers, two different powers, you can correct in the left eye. Disadvantages can only be made up to 20% diopters. It may need multiple changes and expensive. Okay. I, uh, this presentation would not have uh, been possible if not for Hirudini and Sashikala who helped me with to make, uh, build, make these uh, slides for me. Thank you, Thank very, you much, very much, sir. Please remain on the stage. I would like to invite Mr. Dasinda Fonseca to deliver the token of appreciation for your valuable presence, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, let's have a break and enjoy your tea. Meanwhile, you all can download the abstract book and agenda, and you all can access the quiz competition through this QR code, which will be displayed on the screen. And it is also available in the entrance. Also, we have a organized photographic contest for the first time. Contest uh, photos will be displayed on the screen along with the break.
isn't the best place to find a lover, so the bar is where I go. Me and my friends at the table doing shots, drinking fast, and then we talk slow. Come over and start up a conversation with just me, and trust me, I give it a chance. Now I'll take my hand, stop with Venom Man on the jukebox, and then we start to dance. Now you sing alive. Girl, you know I want your love. Your love was handmade for somebody like me. Come on now, follow my lead. I might be crazy, don't mind me say. Boy, let's not talk too much. Grab on my waist and put that body on me. Come on now, follow my lead. Come, come on now, follow my lead. I'm in love with the shape of you. We push and pull like a magnet do. Although my heart is falling too. I'm in love with your body. Last night you were in my room. And now my bed sheets smell like you. Every day discovering something brand new. I'm in love with your body. Oh, I, oh, I, oh, I, oh, I. I'm in love with your body. Oh, I, oh, So go all you can eat, fill up your bag while I fill up a plate We talk for hours and hours about the sweet and the sour How your family is doing okay We even get in the taxi, kiss in the backseat Tell the driver, make the radio play, and I'm singing like Girl, you know I want your love Your love was handmade for somebody like me Come on now, follow my lead I might be crazy, don't mind me, say Boy, let's not talk too much The shape of you Push and pull like a magnet do Although my heart is falling too I'm in love with your body Last night you were in my room This chick, right? Like this chick This chick this chick this chick chick on this this chick Chick run this. This chick. I'm in love with your body. I'm in love with your body.
the dream that can be so we were right till we were build a home that was deeper mm, i didn't wanna leave i didn't wanna lie started to cry but then remembered i i can buy myself Don't give 
trying to be ease, tell me are you free, can you feel where the wind is, can you feel it through, all of the windows inside this room. Shit like a jacket. Presenters.
just want to get a good look at what you really see Maybe just to wake up with you Would be everything to me And this could be so different Tell me what you want to do How do I can treat you better Than he can And any girl like you deserves A gentleman Tell me why are we wasting time On all your wasted crime When you should be with me instead Come on, turn the radio on, it's Friday night and I won't be long Gotta do my hair, I put my makeup on, it's Friday night and I won't be long Till I hit the dance floor, hit the dance floor, I got all I need No, I ain't got cash, I ain't got cash, but I got you, baby, baby, I Presenters who are performing today can come to the stage and check the settings. Attention to all the presenters. Presenters who are performing today can come to the stage and check the settings.
Okay, let's go. Attention to the presenters. Presenters can come to the stage and uh, they can check the uh, screen and everything. Attention to the presenters. Baby, this is what you came for. Lightning strikes every time she moves. And everybody's watching her, but she's looking at me. Ladies and gentlemen, please have your seats. Now we are going to start the session again. Oh. 
Ladies and gentlemen, please have your seat by 10.25 a.m. We are about to start the session. Please have your seats. We are about to start the session now.
please be seated. He was born in Trincomalee and currently working as a consultant eye surgeon at the University Hospital, Kotalawala Defense University. He graduated from the University of Jaffna in 2007 and obtained MD Ophthalmology in 2015 at the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, University of Colombo. He completed his overseas training at the University Hospital of Wales, Cardiff, UK, before his post certification as a consultant eye surgeon in 2019. He was admitted as a member of a Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow, UK in 2021. He has done several researches and ophthalmology, and his main interest lies in the field of glaucoma. We are honored to invite consultant eye surgeon, Dr. Prema Anand, to deliver his speech. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for the inter introduction and invitation. So um, it's a wonderful arrangement, and I'm very much happy to be here. So I'm going to talk on what I expect from you. So what I expect as an ophthalmologist from you. So um, my expectations are very simple, very basic, and I always believe that we have to um, know the basics very well before we go into something uh, very advanced. So the very first thing, uh, whenever I see a patient, is um, I look at visual acuity. Most of the time it is done by you. So visual acuity is uh, very important. So it tells us the severity of the vision problem to us. So, um, but not always. It's not going to tell the vision problem always. So for example, if you see a patient with a cup disc ratio of 0.9 severe glaucoma, that patient might have a visual acuity of 6.6 or 6.9. That doesn't mean he doesn't have any problem. So if there is, if the visual acuity is normal, you have to be very careful and you have to examine the patient before you tell that he is normal. If there is abnormality, we are happy because we know that there is an abnormality and we are not going to look for it. But if the visual acuity is normal, then you have to examine the patient carefully to say this is normal. The second thing is refraction. So re refraction actually gives the refractive status of the eye. You, we all know that uh, after the refraction, we know whether it's hemetropia, hypermetropia, or myopia, and so on. But why we need refraction? So sometimes, you might wonder, the eye surgeons might ask for a refraction, even there is an obvious pathology. You might see a cataract, obvious cataract. We know that the visual acuity is less because of the cataract. Still, the eye surgeon might ask for refraction. Look at this. This is a patient with obvious cataract and uh, uh, non-corrected visual, uh, non non-corrected visual acuity is 660 in both eyes and pinhole is 624. The refraction right eye is minus five, so on, and uh, left eye is minus six. Why I need this refraction? If I go and do the cataract surgery in the right eye, I'm going to make the patient plano or emmetropia or near emmetropia in the right eye. So the, look at the other eye, it's minus six. So if I know the refraction, I will start my um, advice to the patient. I would say, yes, I'm going to do the cataract. Your go one eye is going to be uh, normal. So there are going to be a difference, a large difference between the two eyes, and you might feel intolerance, you might get headache and so on. So you may need to go for cataract surgery as early as possible to the other eye as well. So that education, that advice starts at that point. Look at this patient. This is again a cataract. Okay, the right eye is minus one and the left eye is minus seven. The patient comes and tells us, yeah, I have poor vision in the, in the left eye. Yes, of course, poor vision in the left eye. And I want to go for the cataract surgery. If I don't know this refraction, I will go for the cataract surgery. At the end of the surgery, patient might come and tell you, no, the vision is not improved. What's the problem? 
here the problem is actually this one. So there is a large difference between the two eyes. The patient might have an amblyopia in the left eye. So if I don't know this refraction, again, I will get into the trouble because at the end of the surgery, patient will come and tell me, yeah, vision is poor. After that, if I explain to him, he is not going to believe. Okay, we, we have to start that advice at the beginning. So that's why whenever possible, we need the refraction in hand before we go for surgery. Let's see, pinhole. It's another important thing. Pinhole is another important thing. So this diagram shows you that uh, parallel rays from the distance focused onto the fovea. So that is the focus it made in the foveal region that we call the blur circle. The smaller the blur circle clears the vision. So if, if the focus is very sharp, the vision is going to be very clear. Look at these pictures. So this is the first picture, is a myopic. So you can see the size of the blur circle here. So it may going to make the blur circle to this area and the blur circle is large. Here the size of the blur circle is like this. So the blur circle is large. So the larger the blur circle, the poorer the vision, right? So whatever the correction we do is to improve the size of the blur circle. Look at this, a pinhole. So when we put the pinhole, it actually reduces the size of the blur circle. So it blocks some of the rays. So if these rays get in, gets into the eye, the blur circle is this much. But if you put the pinhole, the blur circle is very small. So it improves the vision, provided the retina, optic nerve, and brain are OK. So if the pinhole improves, I'm very happy. If the pinhole is not improved, then I'm unhappy. So I will carefully look at the patients to see whether there is any problem in the retina, nerve, and the brain. So depending on the symptoms and the sign, I will decide what I have to do. But pinhole is one of the important thing when it comes to the clinical practice. Don't ever underestimate the pinhole because sometimes we get the patient without pinhole. So we are clueless. Right, so always, whenever possible, you check the pinhole. That is very, very important. Okay, actually pinhole differentiate the refractive media problem and retinal optic nerve problem. Actually, if, there is, if the pinhole is improving, then the problem may lies on the tear film, cornea, anterior chamber, lens, vitreous. If the pinhole is not improving, that tells us the problem is in retina, optic nerve, or somewhere in the brain or the nerve pathway. Yes, next thing, ocular motility. When we talk about ocular motility, there are two things we usually talk about. One is strabismus, there's a deviation in the eye. The other one is double vision. So when it comes to the, so when it comes to the double vision, yeah, double vision, we see two images. They are same images, one is clearer and other one is slightly blurred. Okay, so in double vision, one is monocular double vision, the other one is binocular double vision. So monocular double vision means when you close one of your eyes, still you see double vision, that is monocular double vision. And binocular double vision, when you close one of your eye, and if you don't see double vision, that is binocular double vision. The causes are totally different. If it's a monocular double vision, the problem lies in the globe of the eyeball, globe. But if it is a binocular double vision, the problem lies in the nerve or a muscle or tissues around the eye. It may be bone, it may be fat, the tissues around the eye. So the causes are totally different from monocular double vision and binocular double vision. The first thing you have to know is whether it is a monocular or binocular double vision. So we will move uh, further into it, right? So how we know there is a deviation in the eye? So I am very much into Hirschberg test. So that is a very simple test. We can do it in a baby also. Very simple. What you have to do is you just flash a pen torch from about 30 to 33 centimeters away and just look at the uh, corneal 
light reflects. Not the pupillary light reflects, it's a corneal light reflex. If the, if the light reflex falls in the center of the pupil, then you are happy, but you have to remain in your mind, you have to keep in your mind that a Hirschberg test is not going to pick up small tropias, minor tropias, and also phorias. It will only pick up the tropias, relatively large tropias. Right. So the, this is how we assess Hirschberg test. So what you, we have to do is we flash the torch. You can see um, these um, corneal light reflex falls in the center here. And here it actually falls in the margin of the pupil. Actually, fall, if that falls in the margin of the pupil, it gives a 15 diopter of deviation. And it is uh, actually falls in the temporal margin of the pupil, so it, the eye is move, moved towards the nasal side. And here the uh, reflex falls between the margin of the pupil and uh, the limbus, so it gives a diopteric value of 30. And at the limbus, it gives a diopteric value of 45. So this is the picture, so you just flash the torch. There are other tests to pick up four years and uh, there are other tests to pick up tropias also, but today I'm not going to talk about it because it is, uh, it is another big topic to talk. So these are the tests, cover test and cover uncover test. Uh, so these tests you have to learn and familiar, but start with Hirschberg test. Start with Hirschberg test, do it again and again, then it will come to your hands. So before I go into the double vision, I'll uh, tell you a small story. Double vision is sometimes very, very significant to certain people. So a 50-year-old gentleman came to me on a clinic day, and he was really worried. The worry is this. Actually, he gets up in the morning. He saw two bites. So his worry is, oh my god, I can't even tolerate one wife. So how can I see two wives? So that is the problem. So depending on the double vision, it's very significant. So what is double vision and how you see double vision? So these are the two eyes. One eye is deviated. You can see my intention is, uh, the patient in intention is to see that uh, red color square. So undeviated eye, it falls in the fovea. Actually, if I mark the fovea and yellow circle, and the other eye, it falls in the retinal, in the retina somewhere outside the fovea. So it is in the nasal side of the retina. Retina has a directional value. If something falls on the nasal retina, then the brain tells the image or the object is on the temporal side. And if something falls on the temporal retina, then the brain tells, yeah, the object is on the nasal side. Here, the image falls in the deviated eye, image falls on the nasal retina. So brain is going to tell, yeah, the object is on the temporal side. Now, you have two images. One image is clear because it falls on the fovea. The other image is not so clear because it falls outside fovea and the nasal retina. Now, it is a diplopia. So in children, actually, in young, younger children, actually the diplopia, they don't see diplopia even there is a deviation because their brain is so plastic, plasticity is so much, they can suppress the unwanted image. They can suppress the unwanted image. In an adult or older children, their brain is already developed, so they are unable to suppress that image, so they see double vision if there is a deviation suddenly happen. At the same time, you have to remember that the other fovea is going to receive an image from that side. But usually it is suppressed, but if the patient ta starts to see that image, then we call it a confu confusion. Right? The confusion is extremely rare. I haven't seen a single patient with confusion. So diplopia is an important thing to catch and you have to understand why diplopia is. This is a isotropia. Actually, this diagram shows an isotropia. So there is an uncrossed 
diplopia, we call it a unfrost diplopia. If there is a exotropia, then the diplopia is frost. Okay, the image will fall somewhere there if it's an exotropia, right? And this is an unfrost diplopia, and we might get frost diplopia if there is a exotropia. Go home and draw a picture and see. So, how do we know there's a problem in the nerve or muscle? The simple test we have to do is eye movement. It may be, you, may, you might think that is, this is simple, but it is difficult unless you practice it again and again. So usually we do the, we ask the patient to look at our finger and we move the finger in a particular way to check eye movements. And you have to remember that we check the obliques when the eye is moved towards the nasal side and we check the rectus when the eye is moved towards the lateral side or the temporal side. So there are reasons for that, but I am unable to explain everything in a single go. Yeah, so you have to um, familiarize yourself with these techniques, which is very, very important. Yes, I talked about deviation of the eye. So I want to tell about the red reflex as well. If a mother comes to you and tells you, um, yes, my um, two-year-old child has a deviation of the eye or squinting, sort of a deviation. So in that case, you have to check the eye movements and everything, but never ever forget to check the red reflex. Red reflex is one of the simple tests which can save a life. So this is, this uh, picture shows or photograph shows the red reflex. So you can see this is the red reflex. It's a normal reflex and this is a leukophoria white reflex. So if there is a white reflex and if you don't see the red reflex, then you have to refer the patient to ophthalmologist to examine thoroughly. How, how you check the red reflex? Just take a direct ophthalmoscope and see from a distance of an arm breadth. So just examine that uh, regularly when there is a deviation, especially in children. If you can examine that in everyone, that is helpful to find out cataracts and opacity of the media, uh, but always check that in children. So these are few things. We, these are few things we have to, we can identify with the red reflex. Retinoblastoma, a rare thing, but it is a very important thing to identify, otherwise the patient or the child might die. So if you see this, you have to refer. If you see the leukophoria, you have to refer, and that is a life-saving um, technique. Examination of the fundus. We all have to know how to examine the fundus with a direct ophthalmoscope and also with a slit lamp with a 90 diopter lens or one of the condensing lenses. So we all talk about uh, dioptic retinopathy, how to see uh, hemorrhages, uh, microanism, and so on, and uh, we talk about glaucoma. So this picture actually shows a normal disc. You can see the blood vessels and look at the margin of the disc, uh, which is very clear. So one of the other thing we had to talk about is papillae edema or disc edema. So you must be able to pick up papillae edema or disc edema. Papillae edema is by definition um, it is an increased intracranial pressure which leads to edema of the disc. So if one disc is edematous, then that is called a disc edema. So you must be able to pick up a papillae edema or a disc edema. Papillae edema, if you pick up, you might save a life again. It may be due to a tumor of the brain or it may be uh, intracranial pathology. So how we diagnose that? You can see the margin is not very clear compared to the previous one. So this margin is very clear. This margin is not that so clear. It's blurred. That is one of the important thing. So there are many other clinical features. The disc is elevated. There is a blurred margin, nerve fiber layer edema. So nerve fiber layer edema and obliterated cup. You don't see a cup. And there may be exudates, and I don't know whether you can see there's a hemorrhage, but it's not very clear. So they can get cotton wool spots, obscured vessels. You can see there's a vessel suddenly starts here. Actually, because of the edema, it, it is buried. 
okay. So, obscured vessels and uh, capillary dilatation, this picture is not very clear and vascular engorgement, usual si the size of the veins might go up and patterns line, there may be folds here but uh, you can't see in this picture. So, if the margin is blurred, if you think the margin of the disc is blurred, give that benefit to the patient. So send the patient for a, to an ophthalmologist to have a look and make sure whether it is normal or abnormal. So that is very important. So make sure that you have to learn how to examine the fundus and you have to learn how to uh, pick up these changes. And other important thing is intraocular pressure. You have to learn that as well. That is another basic thing you have to learn. So intraocular pressure is the only modifiable risk factor. So the average intraocular pressure is 15 to 21 millimeter. Keep in your mind that is an average intraocular pressure. It's not a normal intraocular pressure. So patients are there with uh, intraocular pressure of 21 and above. They are normal, no glaucoma. There are patients with the intraocular pressure of 15 and below, they might have glaucoma. So this is just an average intraocular pressure. If you take uh, all, all of your intraocular pressure and if you divide it by the number, then that gives the average. So this is just an average, nothing special. So there are various ways to uh, check the intraocular pressure, applanation, Goldman applanation, rebound, airpuff, and so many other ways to check, but learn applanation that is the accurate one so far. So how we check, this is the way we check and uh, you have to do it and see. So we have to um, create these two half circle mirrors and uh, the inner border of the half circles should touch. At that time, you have to take the measurements from the dial. So, so this is inaccurate, this is also inaccurate. If the mirrors are too thick, then it will give a low intraocular pressure. If it is too thin, then that might give you high intraocular pressure. So this is, you have to practice it again and again to familiarize yourself with the sizes also. Giving advice. Another important role of yours, as well as ours, you, have, you must be able to give advice to the patient. So one is uh, you can give advice regarding refractive errors and glasses, glaucoma, diaptic retinopathy, and squint. You have to give advice. At the same time, don't give a wrong information. If you don't know, say don't know. I'll check and I'll let you know. You don't give an, a wrong information. What is a wrong information? Okay, a 60-year-old patient, best corrected visual acuity is 66. Do, the patient is asking you, do I have cataract? Visual acuity is 66. If you say no, then that would be a problem. So, yeah, these are the gradings of cataract. This is grade four. Even with a grade four cataract, the patient might have a visual acuity of 66 or 69. So don't say no. You tell likely or unlikely, but you go and check with an ophthalmologist. If you say no, it is very difficult for us to convince that. The patient comes to us and if we say, no, no, you have cataract, then patient might think we are going to do the surgery to earn some money. So why it is important? Grade four cataract, visual acuity is 66. I would say go for cataract surgery. Why is that? Because grade four cataract is a sort of a hard cataract. If it is further mature, the, the solidity will go up and the cataract surgery is difficult, complication chances are more. Even the, cataract, even the best corrected visual acuity is 66, I will advise the patient to go for cataract surgery. If you say no, I'm going to be like this. Very difficult, very difficult to convince. So don't give wrong information. Another situation, IOP is 21, cup disc ratio is 0.8. Don't say you have glaucoma. These are few situations we came across. So you can see the nerve fibers are going through the optic nerve. There is a central gap where the nerve fibers are not there. That gap is the cup. That cup, gap, gap is the cup. So if there is a loss of nerve fibers, then the gap will increase. So the cup size will increase. The, is that mean anything? 
Let's see. This is the optic nerve. There are 24 nerve fibers. These black circles are nerve fibers, and this is the cup. There are 24 nerve fibers. Count it and see, 24. OK, imagine that uh, the optic nerve has only 24 nerve fibers. OK, the cup disc ratio is 0.2, OK. Similarly, this is a slightly larger disc. There is again 24 nerve fibers, count it and see, 24. And uh, the cup disc is about 0.8. So the larger the disc, have larger the cup, that doesn't mean that patient has glaucoma. Right? So don't tell when the cup disc ratio is high, don't tell you have glaucoma. Larger the disc, larger the size. We have different sizes of fingers. Similarly, patient also has different sizes of optic disc. Smaller the disc, if it is a small disc, even a slight enlargement of the disc size might damage many fibers. So don't think if the cup disc ratio is 0.4, then there is no glaucoma also. It depends on the size of the disc. So whenever you examine the patient, you look for the size. At last, it is a teamwork. I always believe that optician, optometrist, and ophthalmologists are three different kinds of doctors in this field. I always believe that optician and optometrist are sort of a general practitioners in the ophthalmology. We have a unique role. We, we should know our duty, and we get to know, we should get to know each other, and we have to refer each other appropriately. So in summary, check skin hole and uh, do refraction whenever possible. Improve your skills and knowledge in ocular motility. Red reflex may save a life and learn to measure the intraocular pressure and give advice appropriately. Remember, knowledge and skills are wealth. Do not forget the basics. Basics it has a rich knowledge. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Please remain on stage. I would like to invite Mr. Dasanta Fonseca to present this token of appreciation for your valuable presence. Thank you, sir. The presentations today will be judged by an esteemed panel of judges. Before we commence the first session, I respectfully invite our judges to take their seats. Dr. Dimuthu Gunasekara, Senior Registrar in Ophthalmology at National Eye Hospital. Dr. Gihan Tenuvara, Registrar in Ophthalmology at National Eye Hospital. Dr. Praveen Kumar, Consultant Optometrist at LV Prasad Eye Institute. Dr. Mrs. Vasantika Estudvage, Consultant ENT and Head and Neck Surgeon at University of Hospital, KDU. I also warmly welcome Vitriot Consultant, Vitriotinal Surgeon, Dr. Lalanta Gurusinga. And now, Dr. Dimuthu Gunasekara will explain the rules and regulations. Hello, everyone. A very good morning to everyone. Uh, uh, I would like to uh, give a small uh, introduction for the uh, presenters briefly. Uh, so uh, uh, actually, uh, uh, we are assessing your uh, uh, presentation. Basically, whether it is uh, first thing is whether it is uh, with your time management. So you have to confine to the 10 minutes which is given for your presentation. And uh, uh, then three uh, main criteria is there. So we are assessing the content of the research. Uh, in that, uh, 
we need to know whether your research uh, where area is clearly specified, then uh, your background information and the rationality of the research uh, and your clarity of the objectives. Uh, and we, to know, uh, we are specifically looking for your research methodology uh, and the technical terms that you use to introduce your methodologies and your statistical analysis. And uh, other thing is we are specifically looking for uh, the conclusions and whether the, uh, your research is uh, the scientific contribution of your research uh, for the field of ophthalmology. So all the very best for everyone who are present here today. So we may start the sessions now. Now we officially start in the first session, Diagnostic in Optometry. I cordially invite Pramod Satsarni presenting on OCT angiography parameters as a biomakers for pre-diabetic retinopathy. Kind reminder about the QR code which is present in the entrance and which also will be displayed on the screen. You all uh, can access to the quiz competition as well through that QR code. Good morning everyone. I am Pramodhya Satsarani, Head Office Diagnostic Unit. I am going to present my research study regarding OCT angiographic parameters as a biomarker for pre-diabetic retinopathy. Introduction, optical coherence tomography angiography is non-invasive imaging template which can be used to provide three dimension visualization of perfused vasculature of the retina and choroid. In contrast to STAN, structural op optical coherence tomography. Angiofix matrix allows clinicians to objectively assess the track progressive eye diseases such as diabetic retinopathy and glaucoma with quanti quantification tools such as vessel density, perfusion density, and foveal avascular zone for the macula and capillary flux index for the optic nerve head. Foveal avascular zone. The fovea is a region divided of retinal blood vessels known as the foveal avascular zone. The geometric center of the fast is often taken to be the center of the macula and thus the point of fixation. The avascular zone of the fovea acts as the responsible structural area of the retina for visual performances. And also the size of the foveal avascular zone differs from person to person. This image showed the foveal avascular zone. Perfusion density, angiometric software of the Cirrus HD OCT automatically calculates perfusion density from the superficial retinal layer, slab, and radial outer retina region cap peripatry capillaries. Vessel density, the vessel density was defined as the proportion of vessel area with blood flow over the total area measured. The purpose of the study is to determine the OCT angiographic parameters such as foveal avascular zone, perfusion density, and vessel density as a biomarker for pre-diabetic retinopathy. Justification, pre-diabetic retinopathy, the early stage of retinal vascular changes before the onset of clinical diabetic retinopathy represent a critical period of intervention and prevention of vision loss. Establishing Reliable biomarker for the early detection and monitoring of pre-diabetic retinopathy is crucial for timely intervention and target management. This study aims to provide reasons for considering OCT angiographic parameters as a potential biomarker for pre-diabetic retinopathy. Procedure. A prospective cross-sectional study according to convenient sampling was carried out at Vision Care Optical Services Private Limited Corporate Office, Colombo. During the period of 2023 April to 2023 May with 28 subjects with hyperglycemia without retinopathy and equal number of control group. In every patient, anterior and posterior segment was evaluated. 
Development of the four-wheel avascular zone for fusion and vessel density was measured by serial 6000 spectacle optical coherence tomography by Carl Sass Meditech with that white 6x6 angioflex scan for measurements. All the data were recorded in a Microsoft Excel sheet and analysis with SPSS software. Four-wheel avascular zone measured by serial 6000 spectacle domain optical coherence tomography with that white 6x6 angioflex scan. This is the report. Uh, that we measured a foveal avascular zone. And also here you can see the value of foveal avascular zone area. And also perfusion density measured by 6000 spectral domain optical coherence tomography with acquired 6x6 angiography scan. This is the report of value of perfusion density. This is vessel density report and also this is how can see the vessel density. Let's move to the results. Gender distribution is 1 to 1 and the mean age was 48.1 plus or minus 14.5. This graph shows the distribution of FAS in the study group. X indicate number of eyes and Y indicate FAS parameters. According to this analysis, diabetic group shows increased value of foveal avascular zone compared to healthy group, and the change is that statistically significant that p value is 0.0024. This graph shows the distribution of the perfusion density in the study group. X indicate number of eyes, and Y indicate perfusion density. Mean perfusion density of the healthy subjects was 22.48 and the sub diabetic subject it was 19.5 where it shows a reduction of perfusion density in the diabetic subjects and the change is significant at P is 0.0041. This graph shows the distribution of vessel density in the study group. X indicate number of eyes and Y indicate Vessel density. Mean vessel density of healthy subject was 9.98. Mean vessel density of diabetic subject was 8.37, where it shows the reduction of vessel density in the diabetic subjects. However, the change is not in a level of statistically significant. Conclusion. According to the finding, it is observed that there are significant changes present in the FAS and perfusion parameters of the diabetic patients compared to healthy individuals where the FAS is getting increased and the perfusion is getting decreased. These parameters can be obtained with OCT angiography can be used as an important biomarker for pre-diabetic retinopathy. Discussion. According to the knowledge of the authors, there is no any studies available in the literature regarding this topic. However, a study done in 2015, it was observed that the OCT angiography can clearly visualize microaneurysm and retinal non-perfusion areas and enables closer observation of each layer of the retinal capillaries. OCT angiography may be clinically useful to evaluate the microvascular status and therapeutic effect of treatments for diabetic retinopathy. Another study done in 2D angiography parameters can be used as a biomarker for pre-diabetic retinopathy. Here, there is a message for you. By incorporating of angiography into your routine assessments, you can identify early signs of retinal microvascular abnormalities, enabling the early detection of pre-diabetic retinopathy. These early indicators may serve as warning signs for the potential development of diabetic retinopathy in at-risk patients. These are my references and thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you. The judge panel. have the data of um, the same parameters which you measured for diabetic retinopathy is it clinically um, I mean seen in diabetic retinopathy because these patients were diabetic but do not have any clinical signs right yeah so do you have the same parameters for the diabetics who have the clinical signs mm -hmm. how, how were these values different from those patients 
I also collect the data. Okay. So do you have any idea whether the values are in between normal and diabetes or it is close to normal? Just to clarify the question, mm -hmm. we are asking whether uh, you have uh, data regarding uh, diabetic patients who are already having features of diabetic retinopathy in OCM today. They have diabetes but uh, they don't present the signs of, the, they don't didn't present the signs. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you, Pramodha. And our next presentation is on majority type of corneal ectasia at primary eye care center in Kandy by Tilakshana Chandramohan. Good morning everyone, I am Tilakshana, optometrist from the Vision Care Opticals. So today I am going to present my study regarding the majority type of corneal ectasia at the primary eye care center in Kandy. Introduction, corneal ectasia is a rare but very severe ocular condition. It occurs when the inner layers of the cornea becomes weak causing the cornea to change the shape, protrude forward, and distort vision. It is not a single entity. The most common is known as the keratoconus. Corneal ectasia versus keratoconus. Corneal ectasia refers to a group of non-inflammatory disorders of the eye that involve in the bilateral thinning of the central, paracentral, and periphery cornea. It is a specific, keratoconus, it is a specific type of corneal ectasia in which the cornea thins and weakens, leading to bulging and distortion. Keratoconus, a term which comes from a Greek word, keras means cornea, konos means cone. It is a bilateral disease which results in progressive thinning and steepening of the cornea, leading to an irregular astigmatism and decreased visual acuity. It normally develops in the second and third decades of the life and progresses until the fourth decade. Corneal topography is a primary diagnostic tool to detect it, but in addition to the corneal topography, corneal pathometry higher data order aberration is also needed. Then the treatment of the keratoconus, so it varies depending on the progression and the severity of the keratoconus. The mild cases are typically treated with the spectacles, moderate cases with contact lenses, and severe cases that cannot be managed with the scleral lenses may require corneal surgery. Mild to moderate cases of progressive keratoconus may also be treated with surgically, most commonly with cross-linking. Then the classification of the keratoconus. So it is the first step in approaching the disease because the severity of the disease and the stage at which the patient is diagnosed and treated affect treatment results. There are three major classifications of keratoconus. They are morphologic, tomographic, and crumage. Morphologic depends in evaluating the shape of the cone. Tomographic depends according to the elevation maps, to thickness maps, or to curvature map. Crumage, this depends on the K readings, on the anterior curvature, sagittal map, central thickness, the refractive error of the patient, and corneal transparency. According to the above classification, this research was done considering only the morphologic pattern of keratoconus. So 
So these are the morphological patterns of keratoconus. Nipple cone, it is a central cone of 5 millimeter or less in diameter, resulting a circular shape in paracentral region of the cornea. Oval cone have a corneal displacement of the apex below the midline, resulting a cone located mid peripherally with diameter greater than 5 millimeter. Uh, PMD, which is called as pellucid marginal degeneration. So it is characterized by the peripheral crescent band of thinning, usually in the inferior cornea. The ectatic zone, which is one to two millimeter from the limbus, lies above the point of maximum corneal thinning. And the last one is keratoglobus. So it is characterized extremely thinning of cornea and change to a globular shape than its normal gradual curve. Objective, the main of, aim of this study is to determine the majority morphological pattern of keratoconus in candy area. Justification, few researchers have re appeared in the past concerning the corneal ectasia related with refractive surgery cross-linking, and also the management of the corneal ectasia. There were some researchers that have done to show the majority type in that particular population, and also there were pa many patients in candy with different type of keratoconus. So this research was done to identify the majority morphological type of keratoconus in candy area. Procedure, it is an observational study which was done in Vision Care Optical Candy City Center, and the lifespan is from uh, November 2022 to May 2023. 121 patients participated in this study. So the patient came to the center with doctor's prescription. The patient uh, were tested with top cone autorefcatometer, and the eye was tested with uh, logma chart. Then the corneal topography and the CCT was taken. Inclusion criteria, the patient with high cylindrical power, the patient with scissor reflex in retinoscopy, and corneal topography. Exclusion criteria, the patient with severe keratoconus, in which the K readings is more than 50 diopters, and the patient with corneal ectasia due to the surgeries, stromos, and uh, scars are excluded. Data analysis, all the data was recorded in the MS Excel sheet. Moving to the result, the mean age of the study group was 22.5, and the ratio of the male is to female is 7 is to 8. Here we can see the distribution uh, of number of eyes with morphological pattern of keratoconus versus uh, keratoconus. Uh, X axis uh, is shows the type of keratoconus, and the Y axis shows the number of eyes. The distribution of the number of eyes with the keratoconus nipple cone is 33.57, oval cone is 16.78 percentage, uh, keratoconus, keratoglobus is 1.45 percentage, and the PMD is 48.17 percentage. Discussion. It is a keratoconus is the most common corneal ectasia. It usually appears in the second decade of the life and affects both genders and all ethnicities. There are some studies saying that there is a strong relationship between rubbing the eyes and the keratoconus. And some studies say that the genetic and the environmental factors also may affect the eyes and leads to keratoconus. Conclusion. According to the uh, results, the majority morphological pattern of keratoconus in candy area is pellucid marginal degeneration. Take home message, if the patient is having symptoms like itching, headache and tears, it is important to check the eyes either by going to an optical or an uh, ophthalmologist. And also if there are any family history related to keratoconus, Regular checkup is important. Even though when the patient is not complaining, it is better to check the vision. And if the patient is diagnosed with the keratoconus, 
It is important to guide the patient and go to an ophthalmologist and also give them the correct management. These are my references. Thank you. Dear judges, are there any questions to the presenter? Just uh, one question. I just need to uh, make uh, clarify your uh, topic. Uh, so majority, majority types of corneal ectasia at primary eye care uh, center in Kennedy. So, so by, but, but at the end, uh, you have discussed about uh, pelvic marginal degeneration and all that under keratoconus. So was it to uh, detect the ectasia, most common type of ectasia, or the most common type of keratoconus, appearance of keratoconus in, in your study? What is the uh, objective, clear objective of your study? Actually, it is uh, about the ectasia, and inside the ectasia, the common one is keratoconus. Right, OK, thank you. OK. Thank you thank very you. much, sir. Thank you, Dilakshana. And our third presentation is on multimodal tool in the diagnosis and management of vitreoretinal diseases by Samita Kangar. Samita Kangra, uh, clerk for RCD Hospital Candy Branch. Uh, today I'm going to present about a case series regarding optical coherence tomography and geography. My topic is a multimodal tool in the diagnosis and the management of vitreoretinal diseases. My introduction, optical coherence tomography and geography is a non-invasive imaging technique. The main advantage are the shorter equation time. Uh, it's provide a quantitative analysis of the retinal vessels. It can be used to provide three-dimensional visualization of perfuse vas vasculature of the retina without using fundus fluorescein angiography and endocyanin green angiography. We can use the optical coherence tomography angiography directly for the diagnosis of retinal choroidal diseases. It is very conven convenient for the patient as it is a non-invasive and has a less complication. My objective, this work reports a case series where optical coherence tomography and geography was used as a valuable tool in the diagnosis and management of the various retinochoroidal diseases. My case series methodology, a retrospective study of six patients attended on ophthalmological consultation of Dr. Sriharanadan's medical retina clinic, where optical coherence tomography and geography was taken at Vision Care, Asri Hospital, Branch Candy, was used as an additional tool for the diagnosis and treatment. Both male and female patient of 25 to 65 age group during the time period, period of 1st of January 2022 to 31st of December 2022 were recruited the study. All the patients underwent Carl Says Cirrus HD OCT 5000 and Vishukam 524. Case history, fundus photo, optical coherence tomography and optical coherence tomography and geography of each case was analyzed. This is my first case, uh, 44 years old male patient he was treated for the central serous chorioretinopathy uh, and his past medical history is unremarkable. Both eyes intravitreal injection given. Uh, his best corrected visual acuity, right eye plus 3 diopteric spherical 66 minus and near vision N5. Left eye plus 3.5 uh, diopteric spherical 624 minus and near vision N10. His IOP is normal. This is fundal photograph and autofluorescein image this patient. This report used the uh, this report used the OCT angiography image and this is the video section of the angiography report. 
In this, we can see there is a vertical blood flow in signal in indicate involved in retinal angiometer proliferation region in the OCT angiography. This is another case, uh, 73 years old male patient. Uh, his best corrected visual acuity right eye 6.9, near vision N6, left eye 6.18, near vision N10. Uh, he had two IVB injection and his left eye inferotemporal branch retinal vein occlusion. These are the fundus photograph and the optical coherence tomography angio, angio report uh, in this patient. Uh, more than more than the OCT, uh, in this angiography report, we, are, we can see a chemic area uh, where we don't need to do an FFA because in the angiography, ischemic area is very clear. Again, this is the same type of report. Uh, 70, so, sorry, 48 years female patient. Her best corrected visual acuity in left eye, 624, and near vision in 36. Um, we are in the OCT angiography report, which was the ischemic area. We don't need to do uh, FFP for this patient. If patient have uh, ischemic maculopathy like this, uh, poorly respond to the intravitreal injection. This is the another case of a 32 years old male patient uh, with fibrovascular pigment epithelial detachment which need intravitreal injection and here in the OCT angiography image it can stay fibrovascular proliferation very clearly rather than optical coherence tomography. This is a case of another 57 years old male patient. Uh, he had a problem in the central vision in his right eye for two months. Uh, right eye again, we can see an increased blood flow signal where it indicates a subretinal pigment epithelium and a choroidal neovascular membrane at the retina. Uh, this is another case of central serious chorioretinopathy, 38 years old uh, male patient. So in this we can see a neovascularization with subretinal fluid. So this is patient need an uh, anti uh, So this neovascularization with the subretinal fluid uh, can see with the increased blood flow signal in the break at the optical coherence tomography and geography image. This is my conclusion. Optical coherence tomography and geography provides a newly capturing non-invasive and non-dibase investigation where it can be used as a valuable tool in the diagnosis and management of uh, various retinochoroidal diseases. These are my references and thank you. Dear judge panel, are there any questions to the presenter? Yeah, uh, very good uh, case series. Uh, in your case series, have you uh, uh, assessed, uh, investigated about the shortcomings of OCT angiogram? What are the disadvantages of OCT angiogram or FFA in this kind of patients? Uh, you said the advantages of OCT angiogram in uh, uh, assessing patients, uh, so it is non invasive and all that. So, what are the disadvantages of OCT angiogram uh, instead of doing FFA? Uh, main advantage is the uh, it is non invasive, it is less complications. Uh, it's very uh, easy to do any patient. Uh, if you are doing FFA test for patient, uh, some patients has any. Uh, allergies or any other um, condition, patient maybe can allergy it. Yeah, what could be the disadvantage of OCT angiogram 
in your study, what have you came across? So what, what could be the disadvantage of uh, OCT angiogram instead of doing van der Rohe's in angiogram? So you can't see leaks and all that, no? So in FFA, you can see whether there is a leak, right? So, uh, so you have to see um, in both ways, uh, if you have assessed, it's better advantages and disadvantages both. Yeah, so very good case presentation. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. But yeah, I have one question. Thank Excuse you, me. Samita. Yeah. I have one question for you. Absolutely. Can you go back to the first case, please? First case. First case. patient, uh, so he has been treated for CSR, right. so uh, can you just say how long has been di diagnosed and uh, why uh, IVB has given to that patient? Have you inquired why IVB has given in a CSR? No. And why FFA has not been done? How long has been diagnosed? You didn't inquire about that? No? It's okay, fine. fine. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Samita. And our next presentation is on pilot study on use of serous OCT anterior segment to measure corneal thickness, sagittal depth, and scleral shape of keratoconus, eye to fit pre-made scleral contact lens trial set to compare to the traditional contact lens fitting by Jeremy J. Sudhasan. Jeremy from Tandy RC branch. Uh, uh, this is my topic, uh, fitting scleral contact lenses using OCT anterior segment. So, so we can fit contact lenses like uh, in traditional way, we use mostly with the slit lamp. So here I have used the OCT anterior segment because it's a scleral lens. Uh, it got a different dimension than the normal lenses. So scleral lenses, we have to uh, pour saline and wear on. Uh, so here are some bit of optics. Here, uh, like uh, not other than the other lenses, scleral lenses sit on the uh, limbal part of the cornea and here the cornea and it got a optics like a uh, tear lens power also. So we call it a uh, central cl clearance zone, and uh, this is a scleral lens. So it's eliminate all kind of uh, irregularity of the cornea. So, and other than the other lenses, this lens has got uh, different dimension, I mean. Uh, it got a sagittal depth, and it got, uh, we can adjust around the circle, like we can move up and down here, according to the corneal shape, and we can adjust the edge. Uh, this is the, it's a special ability of this. It's not dealing with the base curve, okay reading of the central part of the cornea of three millimeters. Uh, so for this study, uh, so actually uh, I have to make this study because uh, to reduce the chair time, to find out a simple way and it not affect to the patient's high, high health uh, and uh, mainly and uh, to, to compare the both, uh, both compare the both uh, slit lamp and the OCT examination. So st I got 20 eyes uh, with fitted with scleral lenses for the keratoconus size, and 10, 10 male and 10 female, uh, age up to 16 to 55, and the data was collected last year March to this year May, uh, and I have done. Collect these cases from two branches, Candy City Center, and one from the RCV. 
and the, all the follow-ups, uh, because the contact lens follow-up have to be made like every two, two, two weeks, three months. So here I have used Candy Asiri Hospital we are working, where I'm working. And uh, all the patients are referred from corneal, like sur corneal surgeon and uh, K reading more than 55 diopters and the average refractive error is uh, five diopters to three diopters. And uh, patient all are done with collagen cross-linking because uh, the lens take time to get, like it'll take three months gap. So it has not to change the uh, corneal shape. So the, because that's why co collagen cross-linking lens. And the patient who non-dropout means the, the patient who trialed on the first day, they use the same lens and they brought the lenses after the trial and uh, fully satisfied patient and who are cooperate for the study. Uh, here the machine. So uh, these are the two setups. Here I have used uh, slit lamp and the topography. Uh, with the topo I can understand the corneal shape and uh, with the slit lamp I can examine the fitting. So here I fully used uh, OCT uh, to understand the corneal shape and uh, for uh, the shape of the cornea and all and the measurement and the body dye, I use the uh, anterior segment. So <coughs> to select the first trial lens, I have used topography here and I use fluorescing. So this is a normal traditional way we are doing. So here we have to change several lenses to uh, identify the lens thickness, I mean, uh, lens where it get touch on the cornea. Uh, on this, uh, I got a, this, uh, this made by me, and I have measured the sagittal height of the lens, and we top here I have at 150 microns, and I draw two lines here, and I measured this, and I fix a lens, uh, according to the sagittal depth of the lens. And so sagittal light to sag sagittal depth. Uh, so here some, so here, uh, on slit lamp, we, we can act like, we can compare the corneal thickness and the fluorescein band thickness, like if the, it should be less than corneal thickness, then it, we won't be get any much higher power after the over-refraction. So, but in OCT, I can clearly find uh, like about 150 means it will be ideally okay. Uh, here too tight and here got needs to be increase increment. And here uh, the two bands. So I can measure that also. So this is too loose. So, and here uh, on the edge to identify the edge profile, you can see uh, with the slit lamp, the blood, blood flow is blocked here. Uh, on the OCT, we can see here also, and it got pressed, and we can uh, find out the uh, how much we have to increase the edge, and uh, here it's directly, so uh, we, we can identify whether we can improve the, I mean, diameter to be increased or not, and this got a perfect landing, and this should be get shallow, like that kind of an idea, uh, we can get with the OCT, I mean, then this. Uh, so other than that, uh, with the OCT method, because of the uh, accuracy and measurable amount, I can get a over refraction less than one diopter and it between un 150 to one. So I can, like we can correct it with the glasses also in after, after the lens delivery. So eyelid posture is not visible and the like, when when we converge, uh, we can easily uh, like you can easily see with the slit lamp. So slit lamp is totally with tower control, so we can move and see. But the OCT, the it quite difficult to see the eyelid posture and the demarcation marks like uh, on the two sides of the lens. Uh, so the those are like uh, and the chair time was uh, lesser thirty minutes lesser than the uh, traditional method. And the visual activity even got more improved because of the thickness of the TLN's power as less than the uh, traditional method. And the uh, central clearance also, it's kind of ideal of every fitting. So it got like 300 to 150 in between that. And uh, 
uh, lens feeling uh, totally subjected on the so we act we can the on the patient's reply and the uh, other measurement is the lens feeling and we can measure and we can assess with the fitting comfort with the lens uh, and the diameter it easily visible and uh, here we have to use some other techniques like pulling technique pushing so that's all here i got a like a perfectly fitted contact lens photograph so it's spherical with the plano and the carrying also plano because it's a trial over refraction of the trial lens so here it's all in uh, microns uh, <coughs> this after follow up i have got like uh, the graph comes like this uh, on the thickness of the clearance zone so with the clearal uh, lens which are fitted on the OCT uh, those are got lesser my uh, central I mean uh, central clearance zone thickness and the others are a bit uh, high uh, because we couldn't exactly measure the thickness so the edge profile I couldn't uh, increase uh, more than uh, 50 microns because with the with the split lamp because I couldn't exactly know but with the blood flow will assume like with the assumption only we can increase it but uh, in uh, OCT actually it's gone up to 100 150 but in an average it comes like 50 to 90 range of edge lifting uh, so as a conclusion uh, since there's no clearly defined method to fit a scleral contact lens so far so I recommend with like getting a sagittal height from the OCT and the topography uh, use of the topography and other measurement combined with both so here first we use the sagittal light and get the OCT measurement and fix the first lens then we, then it will be ideal than a topography or a K reading uh, so then we can reduce the time from that other than that uh, the both are similar way and the edge lifting also uh, better to use a OCT to find the edge lift to because we can see the blood flow and even with the subjective way uh, and with this combining these two can we can give a fully customized lens for the patient so these are my reference uh, here are my order numbers on the system and all the shapes, images, the videos, all are from internally, not from Intent. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Dear judges, are there any questions to the presenter? Yeah, uh, it's a really good study. Uh, so I just want to know, uh, you had 20 cases, right? Yes, yes sir. So uh, in that those 20 cases, ha have you um, divided them for a, uh, I mean, uh, the control and study group? Uh, yes, sir. It's yes. all, uh, all are centrally curved. It's, I mean, it's all like kind of a nipple cones. Uh, and no, uh, I'm asking uh, whether you have uh, uh, tested the uh, OCT method and uh, the slit lamp method. Yes, sir. For uh, two groups of patients. Yes. Uh, ten, ten, like ten, ten. And all the follow-ups are again tested, tested and measured on the OCT method. All right. Uh, you have crossed it, crossed, crossed it with ah, okay. the follow-up. Uh, then how did you uh, divide uh, the groups? Groups. How, how did you do the sampling, random sampling? Uh, actually, or? the first ten people are uh, from last year. Mm. They are from last year, so they all are fitted only with. Uh, slit lamp and the topography yeah. they how are not how did you allocate the patients for each group control and study group random sampling or what uh, actually random samples yeah. and which are uh, like we get the referrals from the doctor to do trial right, sure. contact lens trials okay. so on them only and all our collagen cross linking done that kind of yeah I have a question uh, did any one of those patients came across with contact lens intolerance while they're doing the study? Uh, they got, there are two. There were two. Okay. So because of, on the first method, actually, 
on the first method uh, because of the feeling of the edge, feeling of the edge and the leakage of the saline. The another one, leakage of the saline. Mm. So that's why I have tried this way also. It's made me to try to find what happened actually on the edges. So was it, was it helpful to identify uh, using uh, your method, I mean, the, with uh, the OCT, OCT and TDD segment parameters? Yes, was it it's, it's actually measurable. Why, 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 why did they came with uh, contact lens intolerance? Was it helpful? Did uh, you find out the cause? Yes, actually uh, I found out yes. the with the slit lamp method, I couldn't, uh, from the first time, I mean, the, from the starting, I couldn't get the exact circle of the edge. Yes. So it's like, it's come, or the lens comes like uh, only kind of a edge, all our circle kind. So, but the sclera is not like that. It's like a bit of a curve. So once I fix it, so I, I couldn't get the edge. So I, I depend on the subjective method on the first two cases. So. Uh, but uh, on that, so because of the circle shape, it got, uh, so spherical shape, it got leaked. So once, uh, once with the OCT, recorrected with the edge was like bit of curve here on the both sides. So uh, other ways to pull back. So on that method, it got sealed. So they ultimately tolerated? Yeah, with the they got tolerated, yes. With the modification? Uh, in after there are no complications. Yeah. There are some, so uh, they have needed like, there, there are some people say that because of the internal filling, internal filling of the saline, so there are no way to uh, move the debris. So it will be for all along the day. So some people get blurredness. Those are the easily degenerating eyes. Some means uh, one, actually I got only one on that kind of case. So uh, for them, uh, we recommend to remove the lens in every five hours. Others, they can wear it all day. Only for that patient only, I recommend that way. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, dear judges. Thank you, Jeremy. It's a suggestion actually, it's a great work um, because the both measurements, the fittings were done by you. Um, yeah, it may be good idea, it may be you have a mask uh, examiner who fits the traditional method and you can do the new method so that when you want to publish, uh, you know, take it forward, you will have a solid evidence because if you do the two measurements, uh, somebody would raise that, okay, you may be biased towards your own technique and then you may, you know, although it may not be true, but there is a benefit of doubt there. So, yeah, it's just a suggestion. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, sir. He is a consultant with Trio Retinal Surgeon at the Colombo South Teaching Hospital, Kalbovila, graduated MBBS from Faculty of Medical Sciences, University of Sri Jayavardhanapura, and MD Ophthalmology from University of Colombo. Obtained FRCAs from Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow, United Kingdom. Underwent ophthalmology training at the National Eye Hospital, Colombo, Sri Jayavardhanapura General Hospital, and University Hospital of Wales, Cardiff, UK. Currently, the Secretary of the Association of Vitrio Retina Specialist of Sri Lanka and was the Council Member of the College of Ophthalmologist of Sri Lanka. Previously served as a consultant Vitrio Retinal Surgeon at the Teaching Hospital of Jaffna and Ratnapura. He is a visiting lecturer to the Faculty of Medical Sciences, University of Sri Jayavardhanapura. We are honored to invite consultant Vitrio Retinal Surgeon, Dr. Lalanta Gurusingha, to deliver the speech. There's a OK, 
Okay, uh, good morning. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to deliver this talk. Uh, today I'm going to uh, discuss about uh, ocular complication of diabetes. How do you change the slides? Okay, uh, as you are aware, the diabetic is a chronic metabolic disease characterized by um, elevated blood glucose level. There are two types of diabetes, type 1 and type 2. Type 1, basically, the problem is you have uh, less or reduced secretion of insulin. It usually affects the young people. We call it juvenile diabetes. And type 2, uh, it's the most common type. It affects the elderly. The problem is at the level of the receptor. Even though you have insulin, it doesn't act at the level of receptor level. Uh, why I decided to give this talk today? If you look at the prevalence of diabetes, around uh, 463 million people had diabetes according to the 2019 statistics. That is roughly around 8.8% of the adult population. It's a big amount. And out of this 90%, uh, out of all these cases, 90% uh, are type 2 diabetes. And Prevalence is rapidly increasing in low and middle income countries like Sri Lanka, India, Bangladesh, Nepal. Um, if you look at the Sri Lankan figures, the adult prevalence of diabetes was 23% in 2019. So that is roughly about one in four person is having diabetes. So diabetes is a major cause of blindness, kidney failure, heart attacks, strokes, and limb amputation. Um, so eye is a very important structure. So diabetes affects various parts of this organ. So we'll see what are the diabetic-related eye problems. So it can vary from a simple refractive error to the blindness. Um, you can have refractive errors, cataract, diabetic retinopathy, that's association between the glaucoma and diabetes. Then you can have cranial nerve falsies or extraocular muscle falsies, and you can have ocular infections. Um, first thing, the refractive errors. Why do you get refractive errors in diabetic patients? That is due to the changes, the, the acute change in blood glucose level will affect the refractive index of the lens. If you have high blood glucose level, the glucose is entered into the lens and it was converted into a substance called sorbitol. So which is a kind of osmotically active substance which absorbs water and causing swelling of the lens, so it can change the refractive index. So refractive changes may be myopia or hyperopia. If you have a sudden external increase in blood glucose, lead to dehydration of the lens and you can get uh, hypermetropia. So, so when you do repression in patients with diabetes, always inquire about the blood glucose control because don't do the refraction in an uncontrolled patient because most of the time, they will come, after two weeks time, they will come and complain to you that you have spent this much of money, taken spare of glasses, now you can't see with that. So always make sure that the patient's blood glucose is controlled, not for one day, it has to be a reasonable time period. So we recommend you to have a, at least blood glucose level at least less than 130 milligram per deciliter for four weeks duration. Then cataract. The cataract is one of the leading cause of visual impairment in diabetes. Uh, the diabetic patients are reported to be five times more likely to have cat cataract than the normal patients. So why do you get cataracts? As I mentioned earlier, this substance called sorbitol leads to osmotic changes causing degeneration of lens fibers. Then there's an association between the glaucoma and diabetics. It's, it's said that roughly around five five times high risk of having uh, glaucoma in a diabetic person compared to a normal uh, individual. So why do you get glaucoma? Actually, the optic nerve head uh, uh, is more susceptible to the damage due to the uh, vascular uh, blood supply, impairment of the blood supply, and uh, there's a dysregulation of uh, blood supply, as well as it's affected the trabecular measure causing um, aqueous outflow. So you can get either type uh, open angle and the uh, angle closure type of glau uh, glaucoma in diabetic patients. Um, this is a, a patient with glaucoma. You can see the normal optic disc and the cup, and the uh, cup in is increased with age with compatible visual field changes. Then 
uh, diabetic patients are more prone to get infections, right? So they are more prone to get ocular infection as well as a systemic infection. If you consider the ocular infection, they are more prone to get keratitis or the bacterial infections or the fungal infections of the cornea. And even you can, like, this is a bacterial ulcer, this is a fungal ulcer, and even they are more prone to get uh, infection in the lid like sty, preceptal cellulitis, orbital cellulitis, as well as very rare, like, a fungal infection like mucomycosis. Then uh, cranial nerve falsies or extracular muscle falsies. Because this cranial nerve mononeuropathy, we call it mononeuritis multiflex, is a very well-documented complication in diabetes. Most commonly affected nerves are third, fourth, sixth, and the seventh nerve. They present with abrupt onset with, uh, of double vision without other neurological involvement. Like if you say, if you get a stroke, the might, patient might be having other symptoms like weakness, right? Or slurring of speech. But these patients come with sudden onset double vision um, they have the history of uh, diabetes or any other, other metabolic factors like hypertension and hypercholesteremia. The good thing is actually these things recover spontaneously within three to six months time. We don't need to do anything uh, uh, surgically or medically just to control their um, blood sugar and the blood pressure cholesterol. And if the patient is symptomatic, you can give some prism induced glasses until it recovers. Uh, if you look at the cranial nerve in involvement, the abducens nerve or the nerve which supplies the lateral rectus muscle is most frequently affected. That's about roughly around 50%. Then the second mostly affected is ocular motor nerve or the third nerve, and the least affected is the trochlear nerve, fourth cranial nerve. So diabetic retinopathy. So that is the most important and dreaded complication in diabetes. Um, so diabetic retinopathy is a progressive dysfunction of the retinal blood vessels caused by chronic hyperglycemia. Initially, it is asymptomatic. That's why most of the patients does not come for the doctors, right? So initially asymptomatic, if not treated, it will lead to blindness. So what are the risk factors for retinopathy? The, the first and most, uh, most important risk factor is the duration of diabetes. If you have a longer duration of diabetes, you have a higher chance of getting diabetic retinopathy. Then the second one is the glycemic control. So if you have a very good control, you have a less likely chance of getting retinopathy. But if you have a very bad control from the beginning, you will get a retinopathy at the early, very early stages of the diabetes. Then other parameters like hypertension, hyperlipidemia, anemia, pregnancy, and some genetic factors also linked to the development of diabetic retinopathy. So why do you get diabetic retinopathy? What is happening inside? We call it pathophysiology. How, how, what happened in the uh, diabetes? As I mentioned earlier, the diabetic retinopathy is a microvasculopathy. So it affects the tiny blood vessels within the retina. Uh, so it's it affects in two ways. First thing is it causes microvascular occlusion. It blocks these tiny blood vessels, right? It damages the vessel wall and causing occlusion of the lumen. And also, it damages this vessel wall, causing leakage. We call it microvascular leakage, right? So that is how you get the retinopathy. So if you have a microvascular occlusion, if you have an occlusion, so there is no blood supply, then what will happen? If there is no blood supply, we call it, there is no enough oxygen in the retina. We call it ischemia. If there's ischemia, what does the retina do? It tries to produce more blood vessels. So there are substances, we call it vascular endothelial growth factors. These, these substances are produced by the ischemic retinal cells, and uh, these, these chemicals will upregulate the blood vessels. So it, it induces new vessel formation. So we call it neovascularization. But the problem is th with these new vessels, they are not very stable vessels. They are very fragile, right? They involute into fibrous tissues. So if you have this new vessel, they can break, break and causing hemorrhages. It can bleed into the retina and the vitreous. We call it vitreous hemorrhage. And also these uh, blood vessels can involute into fibrovascular tissues and it can contract and pull the retina up causing fractional retinal detachments. And also this uh, vascular endothelial growth factor can leak from posterior segment of the eye to the anterior part and induce new vessel formation over the iris. We call it rubiosis iridis 
or new vessel formation over the trabecular meshwork and the iris causing neovascular glaucoma. So if you don't treat, if you don't detect and don't treat, the, the patient will end up with the painful blind eye. So when there's a microvascular leakage, what will happen? Yeah, when there's a leakage of fluid from the blood vessels, results in edema of the retina. If it's the edema occur in a peripheral part of the retina, it won't affect the vision. But if it's in all the center, it will affect the vision. And also, there are lipids, cholesterols in the plasma. So when there's a leakage, these substance will come and deposit over the retina. We call it hard exudates. And also, when there's a leak from, leaking from the blood vessel, you might get retinal hemorrhages. So that's what happened in diabetes. So this is a diagrammatic representation of how it affects the diabetes. The right-hand side, you can see the normal person, non-diabetic person. You can have a healthy microvasculation and, and healthy retina. But you can see this, the other side, you can see the vessel wall is thicken and lumen is narrowed and there are leak, the vessel is leaking, right? So this is how the diabetic affect. Um, how do you classify diabetic retinopathy? Classification is very important in the management and follow-up and the documentation. So diabetics is divided into three stages. The early stage is called background diabetic retinopathy. Background retinopathy, the retina is not ischemic. So in the background diabetic retinopathy st stage, you might see microaneurysm, tiny red dots like this. Then you might see dot and blot hemorrhages, right? You might see hemorrhages. Right, like this, and you might see these hard exudates. You can see these yellow deposits on the retina, especially in the macularia, these are called hard exudates. This is the background diabetic retinopathy. Then the next stage, now the retina is getting slowly ischemic. Now, next stage is called pre-proliferative retinopathy. So what happened here? Now, certain areas get ischemia. So you can see some cot whitish spots here, patches. These are called cotton wool spots. These are actually infarcted nerve fiber layers. Uh, in addition to that, you might see dark hemorrhages. Then you might see venous dilatations. And you might see some collaterals in pre-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Now the retina is ischemic. Now the retina produces a lot of vascular endothelial growth factor. Then it progresses to the next stage, proliferative diabetic retinopathy stage. Here the problem is this vascular endothelial growth factor induces new vessel formation from the optic disc. You can see this C-pan-like uh, vessel fronts uh, eliminating from the optic disc. You can see this angry looking vessels or from the peripheral arcades, right? So this is the proliferative diabetic retinopathy. I'll show you, I'll, uh, show you some pictures of uh, proliferative complication of proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So this one is actually called pre-retinal low subhyaloid hemorrhage. Here the bleeding is in between the retina and the vitreous. It does not uh, break, in, break into the vitreous, so it's between the trap between the retina and the vitreous gel. That's why you can visualize the inferior retina. The next picture is you can see this blood is um, breakthrough into the uh, vitreous gel. We call it vitreous hemorrhage. If you have a vitreous hemorrhage, you can't visualize the retina, All right? The next stage. Now these blood vessels involute into fibrous tissues and causing contraction and pull in the retina. You can see the retina is wrinkled and pulled up. This is called fractional retinal detachment. And this is a, again a late case of uh, proliferative diabetic retinopathy. You can see a lot of fibrovascular bands, but there's no fractional detachment in this case. This is, the most la uh, this is the later stage where you will see the blood vessels over the iris. In that case, patient will, will be having neovascular glaucoma. His intraocular pressure is very, very high. He will end up with a painful blind eye, right? So these are the stages we see in uh, proliferative retinopathy. This is uh, a patient with macular edema. This is actually the leading cause of uh, legal blindness in worldwide. Th this edema can be due to the fluid leakage from microaneurysm or maybe due to the diffuse capillary leakage. So this, because the edema is in the central area, macular area, it affects the vision. This is called diabetic macular edema. How do you evaluate a patient with uh, diabetes, right? There are several methods to evaluate a patient with diabetes when they come to our clinics or maybe to your place. And uh, the first thing we do is called biomicroscopy. Then you can have fundus photography. You can have fluorescein angiography. 
OCT, OCT angio, and ultrasound scan. These are the methods we use to evaluate a patient with diabetic retinopathy. What is biomicroscopy? That's what we do in the clinic. So we have a sit lamp, then we use 78, 90D lenses, and we examine. But the problem is you need expert people to do this, right? So, uh, so that is the problem. So we need a lot of people to do this. So basically we need trained eye doctors to do this screening. And then uh, the next method this is widely used in worldwide to take fundus photography. What they do actually in other countries like in UK, uh, there are mobile units, they come and take the photo, they go to the patient, they take the photographs and these photos are sent to the central processing unit where it is analyzed by experts or well, now they use the artificial intelligence to analyze these pictures and when they detect retinopathy, they refer to the local hospital. Right? So then uh, we take over the patient and uh, do the necessary management. So this is a very good method actually, to even we can, if we can adapt here in Sri Lanka, that will be a very good method because we can't see each and every patient. Now if you go to a clinic, um, there will be hundreds of patients with diabetes referring for the eye screening. So we have a huge uh, number of patients. As I mentioned, one, of, uh, one, of the, uh, one out of four person is having uh, diabetes. You can imagine the workload we are going to face in the future because we don't have retinal surgeons. Most of the people have left the country and we have very few people and we don't also have resources, right? So it's, it's, it's going to be a very difficult task in the future. The next fluorescent angiogram, we used a lot in the past, nowadays a bit little less, but it's a very good tool, right? What we do in the fluorescent angiography, we, we inject a dye, uh, sodium fluorescein, and after a while we take some photographs, there's a special camera, we take a photographs and we can assess the retinal perfusion uh, with that. So actually it's used to detect the, to differentiate focal macroedema versus diffuse. The focal means there's a single leakage and a diffuse means there's a widespread capillary leakage. So to differentiate these two, we use the fluorescein angiogram. And also, it's a very good tool to identify the area of non-perfusion. So we can see, you can see this, there are a lot of capillary dropout. This area is very dark. That means there's no blood supply, right? So this picture also you can see a lot of non-perfusion. Why do you want to detect this? When you plan laser, when you plan treatment, uh, you have to detect these areas because these are the area which produce a lot of vascular endothelial growth factor. When you uh, do lasering, you, can, you have to get rid of these areas. So you have to do laser to these ischemic areas. Then OCT, nowadays commonly used tool, right? We mostly depend on OCT. Why OCT is very important? It's provide an objective assessment of retinal thickening. It doesn't depend on the observer, right? So we can get a uh, qualitative and a good quantitative assessment of the retinal thickening. And also we can um, detect the retinal changes combined with the macular edema. And today we, we rely on OCT to decide the mode of treatment. So, so it, it's also very important. And also, uh, it's very important to assess whether the treatment is uh, effective or not. To assess the, uh, the treatment response and follow-up, also very important. Now, for example, if you have a patient with macular edema, you, before that, if better if you can have an OCT, then you can get an idea how bad is the edema, then you treat the patient, then uh, you can see after the cause treatment regime, you can do or repeat the OCT and see whether the treatment is effective or not. Then we can change the treatment modality if it's not effective. So OCT is a very good tool and a very important tool in the current management of diabetic macular edema. And also, the more importantly, it's a very important tool to assess the vitreomacular interface disorders. So that's why um, I think uh, it's better to have a OCT for each and every patient with diabetic macular edema. Right, there are different OCT patterns we see if you do a OCT in a patient with diabetic macular edema. Now this patient, we call, you can see the edema in the uh, just peripheral to the macula, center is not in all. So we call non-center involved macular edema. It's, it's important in the management because for the non-center involved ma diabetic macular edema, we usually offer the focal laser or grid laser, right? But now, uh, now we have anti vascular endothelial growth factor. If there's a center involved macular edema, the first choice of treatment is vascular endothelial growth factor. We inject the drug into the eye not the laser. If it's a non-center in all, we can offer laser, but center in all, we have to, the first choice is vascular endothelial growth, anti-vascular endothelial growth factor injections. 
Then there are other patterns. You can see sometimes large cystoid cavities. We call it cystoid macaledema. You can see this picture, cystoid macaledema with serous detachment. And this is another important picture. And now sometimes you see edema. If you don't do OCT, you won't det detect these problems. You can see here, retina is pulled up. The fovea is pulled up. Why? This is due to the vitreous. We call it vitreous macular traction. So vitreous is partially separated and it's pulling the fovea up, macula up. So it's called vitreous macular interface. Now, for this type of case, medical management is not going to work. So what we had to do, we had to surgically feel off this membrane. So then only the retina will come back to normal. If you don't do OCT, you won't detect this, right? So you give injection, you do laser, but patient is not responding, right? So it's important to detect this vitreomacular interface disorder. This is an epiretinal membrane. Again, you can see it's pulling the retina up and distorting the retina, fovea, and uh, this one also has to be corrected surgically. So OCT is a very good tool to detect these problems. Then OCT angiography, as uh, the first speaker mentioned, um, it's a very good tool. Nowadays, actually, we prefer OCT angiography compared to the uh, conventional fluorescent angiography because we don't need to inject a dye. It's a non-invasive technique. We can actually assess the uh, foveal avascular zone. It's in, it explains the visual activity. If in diabetic patient, mostly we see the disrupted foveal avascular zone. More importantly, we can detect the areas of retinal non-perfusions. Then uh, we use ultrasound scan or we call B scan in patients with uh, media opacity. For example, now patients has diabetes and a very dense cataract. You can assess the um, retina. In that case, we use ultrasound scan. So we can detect vitreous hemorrhages. We can detect retinal detachments by using B scan. So it's, a, it's also a very good tool. Still, we use that. But you won't get the fine details of the retina. Anyway, you can uh, get an idea about the retina, whether it's attached or detached. Right, how do you treat uh, patients with diabetic retinopathy? As I mentioned, diabetic maculoedema can be present in any stages of diabetes. It can be present in poly uh, background stage, pre-polyperative stage, or polyperative stage. If you have diabetic maculoedema, the, whether it's depend on, uh, whether it's a center involved or non-center involved, if it's a center involved, we, the first choice is antivascular endothelial growth factor. We inject those drugs into the eye. We inject into the vitreous cavity. You, we usually give monthly injection to up to three months. After that, we repeat the OCT and see whether the treatment is effective. If it's responding, completely settled, we can follow up. Otherwise, if it's responding, then we can give more injection. If there is no response, then we have to ch tre change the treatment modality. If it's a non-center involved, we can use either focal or grid macular laser. But if these two, are, two methods are not effective, then you can choose Steroid, we have uh, trimcinolone and there's a new uh, steroid implant, actually we call it dexamethasone implant, which like kind of a tablet, which when you inject into the eye, it retains in the eye for about three to four months. So it's a slow release tablet we inject into the eye. So, so that's how we control the diabetic macaledema. Uh, polyperative diabetic retinopathy with just hemorrhage, if you can visualize the retina, you can do laser, right? Uh, so laser is actually a technique um, we use to burn the retina. We, uh, um, uh, by using a laser, we burn the peripheral retina, the ischemic retina, right? When you burn the ischemic retina, it won't produce a vascular endothelial growth factor. When there's no reduced level of vascular endothelial growth factor, it, is, it will down regulation, regulate the new vessel formation. So uh, in, in polyperative retinopathy, we use fan retinal photocoagulation. Now, now, according to the recent studies, now nowadays there's a trend of injecting vascular endothelial growth factor for the diabetic retinopathy, but when you inject uh, vascular endothelial growth factor, you have to make sure there are, uh, there are you have to exclude the fractional detachment. If you inject uh, anti vascular endothelial growth factor into a patient with uh, fractional band, it will further contract and causing retinal detachment. If the patient have in fresh polyperative retinopathy with mild vitreous hemorrhage without tractional band, you can offer vascular endothelial growth factor, but most preferred method is doing laser. If the patient has fractional retinal detachment, then no other option, you have to intervene surgically. Uh, that's our job to uh, remove all these fractional membranes with the vitreous gel and make the retina flat and, 
uh, stabilize the retina. So that is how we manage our patients with diabetic retinopathy. Okay, so prevention is better than cure, right? So uh, most of the prospective controlled intervention studies have shown that strict control of blood sugar, blood pressure significantly reduces and delay the onset and the severity of diabetic retinopathy. So the control is very, very important. So the, if you don't have diabetes, you have to be very careful about the, your diet. And if you have diabetes, you have to be careful about your diet and you have to take proper medication and have a proper glycemic control, right? Otherwise, um, you will get most of the complications I mentioned earlier within a very short period. Uh, I think I have come to the end of this uh, lecture. Again, thank you very much, organizers, for inviting me to deliver this talk. And uh, take home message is, uh, whoever, pa uh, whatever the patient come to you, you have to educate them. If a patient, most of the time what we see, uh, we have late presenters today in our clinics because patients are not aware about the complications. So whenever patients come to you, you have to educate about the complications of diabetes so that they can come and get an eye screening done. If you intervene in early stages, we can preserve their vision. But most of the time, the patients come to us when they lose their vision. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Kindly remain on the stage. I would like to invite Mr. Dasla Fonseca to deliver the token of appreciation for your valuable presence, sir. A kind, small request to audience to uh, make the phones in silence since the uh, program is on live telecast. Thank you. And uh, we would like to start the second discussion of today's program. The theme is binocular vision and vision therapy. The first presenter is Mahesha Nishadi, a case study on effectiveness of revital vision in improvement of visual acuity in a patient with low vision. Good afternoon, all of you. Down the line somewhere, I suppose that you all know something about revital vision. With that expectations, we'll mount to the case study, which I'm going to be present today, the effectiveness of revital vision in visual acuity of a patient with low vision. First, we'll move on to the introduction. As we all know, visual acuity is the most commonly used and intuitive measure of the performance of the visual system. It can be impaired by uh, most of the common reasons like inherited and can be some because of the eye pathologies and maybe sometimes because of the anatomical abnormalities. Low vision is the loss of sight that is not correctable with the prescription glasses or the uh, eye glasses, contact lenses or the surgery. But there is still a sight which can be improved by the low vision aids. Let's have a look at what the previous research says about the low vision treatments and also nystagmus. Treatment option for the nystagmus involve pharmacological and surgical interventions. They are gabapentin and the mematine. And according to the research which was done by A. A. Almas et al., almost 30% of the low vision patients with amblyopia showed the improvement of the visual activity with low vision devices. And another research according to the uh, the mo uh, most common indications for the low vision aids among the children include albinism, retinopathy of prematurity, congenital malformation, and optic neuropathy. So let's have a look at what is this revital therapy program. It is a vision training software program clinically and scientifically proven to improve vision in adult amblyopia, eye diseases, low vision, and visual impairment. It, it has the FDA approval also. It trains the brain to best, better for process blurred images to sharper ones. And it is a non-invasive patient-specific treatment designed to improve vision by modifying certain primary areas of the uh, visual cortex. 
uh, in this uh, study, uh, revital therapy, GABA filters are used to stimulate the active receptive fields in the visual cortex in order to improve the visual acuity and the contrast sensitivity. In the next slide, you can see the picture of a GABA patch. And during the training sessions, a series of visual tasks and repetitive images train the brain and improve visual processing. Mm, it's time to go for the what preachers fair facts uh, to tell about the revital. According to the research which was done by C. Uh, C. Minkarali et al., it shows that the GABA patch treatment proves the best corrected visual acuity in Stargard patients. And another study which was done by uh, T. H. Donald et al. reports the efficacy and the safety of the Eurovision correction technology, a non-invasive perceptual learning compress program to enhance the uncorrected visual acuity and the uncorrected contrast sensitivity. According to the research, the main improvement of the revital vision was 2.1 line. And according to the study, which was done by W. Olaya et al., shows the improvement of the visual acuity and the contrast sensitivity following perceptual learning treatment patients with congenital nystagmus. Now it's time to go for the objective of my case study to investigate the effectiveness of revital vision in a patient with low vision accompanied with nystagmus and moderate alternate right exotropia. This is the method procedure of my case study. It is an interventional case study. 2019, December to 2022, June, a patient was 12 years low vision patient with nystagmus, and the right eye visual acuity was in the start 0.477 logma, and the left eye 0.50 logma, 0.02 logma, and she has the moderate alternate right exotropia with six diopter base in deviation. Uh, we'll move to the methods. This case study include one low vision patient with nystagmus. In the beginning, patient was underwent through the complete eye examination, orthoptic evaluation, and low vision assessment. After the initial assessment, patient was recommended for the revital therapy program. This short video clip shows how the patient is doing the therapy program. In this uh, space, you can see that GABA patch is coming and going. I'm sure you all can see. Okay, and after the first, uh, the first review was proceed after doing by 10 sessions to inspect the visual activity, and the next reviews were done by after each and every 10 sessions. There were 80 sessions included in the therapy program. After improving visual activity up to expected level, subjects was discharged from the therapy, and each and every six months, they had a review. Now we have moved on to the most valuable part of the study. We'll move on to the results. This is how the patient has get the improvement in the visual acuity in right eye. X-axis shows the number of reviews, and Y-axis shows, you can see the visual acuity in logma. Uh, the comparing first two sessions, there was no any improvement. The vision was stable as the previous. And uh, when we go up to eighth session, there was a statistical significant improvement in the low vision. The R value was 0 0.637, and the P value was 0 0.0021. Right eye total visual acuity improvement was 0 0.1. 157 logma. The next slide, you can see the chart of that one. You can see apart from those two sessions, the first two sessions, there's a significant improvement in the visual acuity in the other sessions. So we'll move on to the left eye visual acuity improvement, uh, the same as the previous. You can see first three sessions, there's no any improvement. The vision was stable. And when you go through this uh, blue color line, there's the vision improvement in the seventh session, and the vision is getting stable in the eighth session. And uh, the right eye value was 0 0.621, and the P value, value was uh, 0 0.02117. Left eye total visual acuity improvement was 0 0.1 logma. So this chart shows the first three sessions, the vision apart from the the first three sessions, there is a 0.025 improvement in the left eye visual activity. At the eighth session, that was getting stable. So this is the discussion. According to the previous research and guidance of the patient selection, patients should have less than eight diopter deviation. But in this case, the patient has, as I mentioned you before, 16 diopter deviation. However, there's a significant improvement was observed in the patient, suggesting that application of revital vision is an effective method of improving visual activity, patients with low vision, more than eight depth as well. 
And the conclusion is revital vision is an effective way to improve visual activity in low vision patients, particularly in low vision patients with nystagmus. Uh, there were some limitations in my study. Uh, according to the previous research, I have mentioned before, there should be a 2.5 line improvement logma in each and every patient, but in this case, overall visual acuity improvement was right eye 0 0.157 logma, and the uh, left eye was 0 0.1 logma, it's like less than one line improvement. Since the selection of this patient does not match the standard inclusion criteria of the vital vision, the improvement of the vision is less than expected. So the take home message is revital vision is considered to be an effective method for improving visual activity in low vision patients. This finding highlights the potential of this approach as a valuable tool in the field of the vision rehabilitation. These are the differences which I have used for this case study. Thank you. If you have any question, you can ask Dr. Again, it's a great talk and interesting case. So, um, do you have any other experience of the visual improvement in other cases? Like, this is one case with nystagmus. Yeah, this is only one case I have done. That is Targard patient, but he is still doing the test. And another one, uh, amblyopia. Uh, she was uh, 13 years and she fully improved. I have the only three low vision patients. This is the best case I have, but uh, she has the 60 to after basin deviation, although she has improved, not up to my expected level, but a little she can improve. I mean, she went uh, better than the low vision category. Okay, good. The other thing, like how, uh, like once the patient comes to you for the visual activity yeah. measurement, so how many times you will repeat the visual activity? Is it one measurement you will do and uh, record? So you mean the reviews so or? No, once the patient comes to you for the follow-up, you record yeah. the visual activity, right? After, after the, uh, you're asking the, the material, I mean, the uh, visual activity check, how I check? Yes. From the logma chart. So is it one measurement or you repeat it two times and yeah, take no, the average? After each and every 10 sessions, patient is coming from, uh, see the, the clinic. Yeah, so say, suppose the patient comes for first visit. Yeah, first visit and after 10, 10, each and every 10 visits, I have taken the results, visual activity. Yeah, so come to the first visit, you measure the visual activity, yeah. you record it, right? And do you do it once or do you do it two times and take the average and report the data? It's one. One, one measurement. One, yeah, okay. Thanks. Thank you. Excuse me. Excuse me. I have a question. This is just a one, one case study. Is it so just one case study, right? So somewhere around in the presentation you mentioned regarding uh, an exotropia. Did the patient have an exotropia associated nystagmus? Exotropia. So I would be much impressed if you have mentioned it in the topic. Yeah. Okay. So good. Okay. Yeah. Fine. Thank you, Nishadi. Our next presentation is effect of size of the suppressive scotoma on visual acuity and stereo acuity in anisometropic amblyopia by Nitmi Sandeepani. Hello everyone, thank you for everyone having me this opportunity today. I am Nitmi Sandeepani from Vision Care Head Office. Uh, today what I would like to present to you is effect of the suppressive scotoma size on visual acuity and stereo acuity in anisometropic amblyopia. So this is my introduction, amblyopia. Amblyopia is a type of vision impairment that typically affects only one eye but less frequently both. It occurs when there is a breakdown in the interaction between the brain and the eyes, and the brain is unable to recognize the sight that comes from only one eye. Let's see what's, what is anisometropic amblyopia, where there is a persistent blur on one retina due to both eyes' different focal points, anisometropic amblyopia develops. 
In general, more anisometropia is required for amblyopia to emerge. Uh, in clinically, we call this as usually lazy eyes. Uh, suppressive scotoma. By ignoring all or part of the image of one eye, the brain may avoid double vision. And the suppression part of a patient's visual field is referred to as the uh, suppression scotoma, which is a more general term for a partial change in the visual field. Usually, words for dot stretch will be used to measure the size of suppressive scotoma. Uh, then, what is visual acuity? The visual acuity is the ability of the eye to detect object shapes and the details at a specific distance is measured by visual acuity. Street acuity, the threshold measure of the sharpness of the, this depth perception called street acuity gives a person's level of perceptual binocularity and indication. This is my objective of uh, my study. The aim of the study is to identify the effect of the suppressive scotoma size on visual acuity and street acuity in anisometropic amblyopia. Methods. Uh, we did this test um, during period of 2022 October to 2023 April in Vision Therapy Center number 505 Vision Care Optical Services Union Place, Colombo to Sri Lanka. Uh, the age group was 15 to 30 years and visual acuity, stereo acuity and the size of the suppressive scotoma were measured in every subject with dioptic based visual prime software. Uh, these are my inclusion criteria. Patients with non strabismus and symmetropic amblyopia were included in this study, as well as those who with strabismus amblyopia or with eye pathology were excluded. Uh, these are the results of the study. The mean age of the samples uh, was 18 years and the male female ratio was 4 to 1. The mean visual acuity of the study group was uh, 20 by 100 and the mean mystery acuity was uh, 422.4 sec of arc and the mean value of the size of the suppressive scotoma in the study group was 8.6672. Uh, this is the uh, chart shows that mystery acuity versus scotoma size uh, while excise while x-axis indicates uh, the scotoma size, y-axis -ax, y represents the street acuity. It shows that there is a positive correlation between street acuity and scotoma size, where the R value is 0 0.4006 and the P value is 0 0.000369. Uh, that indicates when the street acuity uh, decreased and when the size of the scotoma uh, size is also decreased, the, it shows that the value of the stereo acuity also decreased and where it shows the improvement of the stere stereopsis. And this is the uh, chart of the relatedness between visual acuity and scotoma size. Uh, X-axis represent the scotoma size and Y-axis uh, y represent the visual acuity. Uh, it shows that there is a positive correlation uh, between visual acuity and scotoma size as well as uh, where the R value is 0 0.4732 and the P value is 0 0.00001811. And also there is a positive correlation between visual acuity and scotoma size also. Uh, discussion, both visual acuity and stereo acuity have a significant correlation with the size of the suppressive scotoma size. However, the correlation between the size of the suppressive scotoma and the stereo acuity shows a slightly higher correlation compared to visual acuity, suggesting that the effect of the suppressive scotoma is more on stereo acuity. Uh, this is my conclusion of the study. Both visual acuity and stereo acuity has a positive correlation with the size of the suppressive scotoma and the effect of the scotoma size was higher in stereo acuity than the visual acuity. Uh, take home message. According to the current practice, the visual acuity is considered as the end, end point of the success intervention of vision therapy and amblyopia treatment in terms of reduction of suppressive scotoma. 
However, according to the study, the correlation of the stereo acuity was more positive than the visual acuity, suggesting that the endpoint uh, improvement of the stereo acuity also have to be concerned in determination of the successful endpoint of the vision therapy and also the diagnosis of amblyopia. These are my references and thank you. Thank you, Netmi. Are there any questions from the judge panel to the presenter? Nice presentation. So, what was the magnitude of uh, anisometropia in these cases? Because these are all uh, anisometropic amblyopes, yes. right? So, what was the mean anisometropia? Uh, you mean the highest? Uh, yeah. So, what was the uh, highest? Highest gap. Six yeah. six diopters. Six diopters. So, if you think. Um, what, what type of scotoma was present? Because we only know the size of the scotoma, right? So because assuming that the anisometropes have a, a completely blurred vision, or even if you correct it, uh, it's kind of a relatively overall uh, suppression kind of a thing. So do you have any particular pattern you would see in this uh, anisometropic amblyopes versus strabismic amblyopes? No, only the measurements were uh, for the size of the scotoma, not the pattern. Okay, so if you see your uh, first graph where the stereo acuity and the scotoma size, there were few patients, even the scotoma size was small, but the stereo was around uh, 800, 900 seconds of arc. So do you, why do you think that discrepancy was there? Uh, maybe you can go back to the slide, uh, the figure. The graph. In the the first, the first, first graph. Figure. Yeah. That. Yeah. So if you see the x-axis, the the bunch of um, dots there for the scotoma size between zero to five are up to four hundred, but you see the three patients who had eight hundred. So why do you have any specific reason? Like, do they present different features in their clinical uh, findings? Did you look into it? Uh, no, I uh, measured them only in a, uh, one session. So this is only about to uh, measure what is the more correlated with the effect uh, for the scotoma size, which one more, uh, if stereo acuity or visual acuity. Okay, okay. Uh, and is it supposed to correlate positively or negatively? I mean, the way the terminology is... Uh, other way, you know? Yeah. So you, the scotoma size is less, you will have a better stereo. So the better stereo is yeah. lesser than number. Uh, yeah. yeah. Usually that's what you know. Yeah. Yeah. So question out of curiosity, what made you select such a topic? Sorry? Why, what made you select such a topic for your presentation? What is the purpose for selection uh, of this topic? Uh, what made you... I have to look uh, into this. Slide. In clinically, uh, we are only concerned about the visual acuity when we are testing patients. Uh, if we see a patient with uh, that he is an uh, amblyopic patient, we only see about his visual acuity only. So we have to concern about his stereo acuity as well as in our practice. So how did you select the cases with uh, anisometropic amblyopia? Uh, in the vision therapy center of our 5050. I couldn't remember the number of the subjects. Can you uh, mention the 26 number? 26 patients were included in 26. the study. So the duration of the study was? Uh, 22 October to 23 April. October to April. Right. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Netmi. Next presentation a case study in improvements of binocular function with vision therapy in IDXT young adult patient by Rashmi Avesena.
good morning, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rashmi Avesena, and I'm from Mission Kea uh, Kids Unit. Today, I'm here with my case study, Improvements of Binocular Functions with Vision Therapy in Young Adult IDXT Patient. Uh, Firstly, we will start with the introduction. Vision therapy is a specialized form of therapy designed to improve and enhance visual skills and abilities. It's a non-surgical, non-invasive approach that targets the underlying cause of vision problems rather than simply addressing the symptoms. The goal of vision therapy is to teach the brain and eyes to work together to correct the eye misalignment and thus achieve clear and comfortable vision. Intermittent distant exotropia, a kind of trabismus known as intermittent distant exotropia is characterized by intermittent outward deviation of one or both eyes when focused on distant objects. Exotropia is a term used to describe the misalignment of the eyes where one or both eyes turn towards rather than staying in the correct position. Uh, this is the objective of my case study, to find out the effectiveness of vision therapy in young adults with non-specific IDXD in attaining binocular functions. In this slide, you can see the methods. We have to do first basic eye examination, such as refraction, then the orthoptic assessment. Then we have to follow 25 VT assessment uh, sessions. After 25 VT sessions, we have to do review orthoptic assessment again, then finally follow up. Uh, he was visited a Vision Care 505 Kids Unit branch uh, at 2022, September 26. Summary of orthoptic assessment. Uh, he was complaining about the intermittent squint notice since at seven years and already done screen surgery at 2012 and no history of diplopia. Myopic glasses wearing for the last 12 years. With the glasses, he had uh, full vision for the both eyes, 6-6. Six, six. Uh, about the cover test, we got moderate exophoria with good recovery for the near. And for the distance, uh, we got moderate alternate exotrophia with good fixation. Binocular status for the near, it was four lights, and for the distance, it was alternate suppression. Stereo acuity for the near, it was 110 sec of arc, and for the distance, it was nil. Convergence was 10 centimeters, and about the deviation, we got 25 basin for the near, and 30 basin for the distance. Uh, orthoptists suggest to do refraction and change the glasses and explain 20-20-20 rule and suggest binocular therapy at clinic. The first clinic appointment took place on 2012, October 5th, and the patient had came three times per week, every week. Every th vision therapy session was conducted by the same vision therapist. During his A-level exam, he had to completely stop the clinic therapy. There was just 10 sessions completed, and master and ball and broxtrin were given as a home therapy. Uh, after three months, he was back at the uh, branch, 2023, February 14, and broxtrin and master and ball was not done properly, and complaining about the intermittent diplopia while reading, using digital devices more than 10 hours per day. And visual acuity was same as before, uh, we got cover test, uh, moderate alternate exotrophia for the distance and the near. And about the binocular status, for the 40 centimeter, it was five light. And about the stereo acuity for the near, it was 240 sec of arc, and distant, it was near. Convergence reduced to the 20 centimeters. Um, about the deviation, we got 40 diopter basin for the near, and for the distant, it was 35 typed a basin. Uh, orthoptic suggests to do the further in investigation, so he had done MRI scan and it was normal. Uh, and do the refraction and continue glasses, suggest VT in clinic and home therapy, review after 25 sessions. Uh, those are the materials are used for therapy procedures, VTS4, Vectogram, Aperture Ruler, Bernaloscope, Tranaglips, Broxtrin, Master and Ball, Hard chart, TV trainer, bar reading, accommodation flippers, and accommodation lenses. 
uh, this is the VT protocol I use. Uh, phase one, motility and monocular accommodative rock. Phase two, biocular motility and accommodation. Phase three, build fusional ranges at near point with stereo acuity targets. Phase four, build fusional ranges at near point. Phase five, build, it, build fusional ranges at intermediate distance for the work towards distance. An accommodative convergent flexibility was phase six. Uh, I used those therapy technique for uh, reach each of VT phases. Uh, let's look at the result. After 25 sessions, uh, we got covered as moderate exophoria with delayed recovery for the distance and the near. And the binocular status, it was uh, 40 cent, uh, binocular st status was 40 centimeter and 6 meter, it was 4 lights. About the stereo acuity, we got 80 sec of arc for the near, and for the distance, it was 57 sec of arc. Convergence was 10 centimeter, uh, and the deviation, uh, we got 20 basin for the distance and 25 basin for the near. Uh, after 25 VT management, uh, plan was continue glasses, continue VT in clinic, and the home therapy review after 25 sessions. After 15 sessions of VT, we got a slight exophoria with good recovery for the distance and near and binocular status was four light for the distance and near. Stereo acuity for uh, this near, it was 20 sec of arc, and the distance, it was 57 sec of arc. Convergence reached the normal range, six centimeters, and fission, prism fusion range was 25 base out and 18 base in. And about the deviation, we got 12 base in for the distance and six base in for the near. Uh, according to the patient, deviation of binocular function significantly improved with the VT. Uh, after uh, 15 VT uh, sessions, management plan was continue glasses, reduce VT uh, one day per week, and advise to continue home therapy exercise, review after 20 VT sessions. In here, uh, uh, this slide uh, shows you the deviation. Uh, blue color shows deviation at 40 centimeter and green color shows the deviation at six meters. You all can see at 40 centimeter deviation was 25 prism diopter and it increased up to 40 prism diopter because of the patient was stopped doing VT due to the exam as I mentioned before. Um, in the last two visits, he reduced the deviation up to 6 and 12. Uh, so it seems there was a significant improvement in deviation after doing continuous vision therapy. Uh, about prism, prism fusion range, there is also the uh, also increase about the prism fusion range. Uh, stereopsis, uh, at the first two visit uh, for the distance it was nil, and for last two visit it was increased. Uh, convergence reached the normal range, six centimeters. About my conclusion, the results of this case study shows that even at age 19 years, clinic-based therapy with home therapy resulted in IDXT patient having significant improvement in the distance control of exodeviation and the NEA exodeviation magnitude and improved binocular function. For that, the patient's and therapist's commitment is very important. Uh, my take home message is uh, this study demonstrates that clinic based vision therapy with home exercise significantly improves the distance and near control of extra deviation. When a patient with IDXT reaches out the age of 19, VT will help improve binocular function. Uh, there were some limitations in my case study. The therapy program must be carried out constantly to provide, produce the expected outcomes. In this case, patient was unable to continue therapy sessions regularly because of advanced level examination. Those are the references I use. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rashmi. Are there any questions from the judge panel? Thank you. Again, nice presentation. Just a general uh, question. So, uh, do you see any rebound effect of the treatment? So, if you stop the treatment, 
um, we have to tail off the uh, VT, we don't stop the VT. Yeah, so once you sl slowly taper it off, like, you know, reduce the number of hours and things, um, how many times the patients would come back with the same complaints? Is it... Uh, uh, he visited one day per week. Okay, no, in general. So if you stop the treatment, so will the patients um, get the symptoms back? Or is it like once you treat them for a long time and then slowly they will recover and be normal? Uh, we have to recover him and we have to monitor him and we do the follow-up. Okay. Thanks. Our next presentation is on effectiveness of active vision therapy in functional visual deficits by Ashka Jaisinghe. Good afternoon, all of you. I'm Ashka Jaisinga from Vision Care 505. Today I'm here to present you all about effectiveness of active vision therapy in functional visual deficits. First, we will move on to the background of this study. Vision therapy is designed to teach the patient how the brains control the eye to improve their visual skills and how to apply these new skills to improve reading, learning, concentration, and attention. It is fully customized and personalized treatment program. This study shows how to improve visual acuity and stereo acuity in functional visual deficits with vision therapy. What is visual deficit? Visual deficit or visual impairment means that a person's eyesight cannot be correct to a normal level. Amblyopia is also called lazy eye, is a disorder of sight in which the brain fails to process input from one eye and over time favors the other eye. It can be defined as visual acuity poorer than 2020 in the absence of underlying structural or pathological anomalies, but with at least one of its causes occurring before age six. This is my objective. Effectiveness of vision therapy patient with microtropia and anosmetropic amblyopia, bilateral refractive amblyopia, and strabismic amblyopia. This is the procedure of my research. It was designed with descriptive cross-sectional study according to convenient sampling. Study area was vision therapy unit at Vision Care Kids Unit. Time period was 2021 December to 2022 December. There were 60 patients, including the research, aged between 90 to 25. Exclusion criteria was patients who are with monocular visual acuity less than 0.1 logma, no other ocular pathology and diplopia conditions, no previous history of ocular surgery, no other neurological conditions, no previous history of amblyopia therapy. This is my methodology. The first one is primary eye examination and optimal lens prescription. Then after we do orthoptic assessment, then select patients according to diagnosis. Based on diagnosis, divided selected patient into three groups such as bilateral refractive amblyopia, strabismic amblyopia, and anisometropic amblyopia. Then start VT in clinic three times per week and also do home therapy. Then after do 30 sessions with VT, uh, we again do the orthoptic assessment and make a comparison of first visit findings and after 30 visit findings. Then analyze data and finally got improvements. This is the phases of amblyopia therapy. Phase one, application of optimal lens prescription. Phase two, adjunctive occlusion. Phase three, monocular therapy. Phase four, monocular training in binocular field, we called MFBF. Phase five, biocular therapy. Phase six, binocular therapy. And phase seven, intersensor integration. This slide shows the general therapy protocol we follow when performing therapies for amblyopic patients. First one, fixation. Second one, antisuppression. Third one, accommodation exercises. Fourth one, ocular motor therapy techniques. Fifth one, biocular therapy techniques. Sixth one, binocular therapy techniques. And last one, intersensory integration. First therapy protocol was fixation. 
for fixation, I have used macula integrity trainer and Sanat vision integrator and visual scope. The below pictures show the instruments. First figure, MIT. Second figure, SVI. And last figure shows visual scope. For second protocol, anti-suppression. Used instruments are anagific 3D trainer. You all can see in the figure four. And the all other figure shows you anaglyphic tracing. Third protocol was accommodation therapy techniques. There were six exercises including this therapy protocol. Figure six shows bullseye. Figure seven shows accommodative flippers and figure eight shows loose lens rock. Fourth therapy protocol was ocular motor therapy techniques. You can see Michigan letter tracking in figure nine and heart chart saccadic from figure 10. Biocular therapy technique was done using split vectorgram, vertical prism dissociation, and anaglyphic TV trainer. In the picture, you can see vectorgram. For binocular therapy techniques, these are the exercise. 12 figure shows drug screen, 13 figure shows Bernoulloscope, and from last you all can see VTS4 software. For the intersensory integration, I have followed balance board and walk-in rail. Let's have a look at about results. This is the general distribution of sample. It represents total number of patients. In the blue color part, you can see mitotropia with anisometropic amblyopia, red color shows trabismic amblyopia, and you can see bilateral refractive amblyopia from green color part. In the next slide, you can see improvement of visual acuity of refractive amblyopia group. First chart shows visual acuity of the right eye. Blue color line shows the visual acuity logma before VT and re red color shows after VT. You can see in the first chart there is a significant improvement of the visual acuity of right eye. And when we look in at left eye improvement there also you can see a significant improvement of a visual acuity in left eye in logma. In the next slide, represents about stereo acuity improvement in bilateral poor vision. Blue color line shows the improvement after following continuous VT session. Then we will move on to the results of anisometropic amblyopia group. X-axis shows number of patients and Y-axis shows visual acuity dogma. From the red line, you can see the improvements of visual acuity. In the next slide, represent about stereo acuity improvement in anisometropic amblyopia group. Blue color line shows the improvement after following continuous VT sessions. In the next slide, you all can see visual acuity improvement in strabismic amblyopia group. According to the result, there is also have a significant improvement in visual acuity. Then we will move on to the results of stereo acuity in strabismic amblyopia group. From the blue color line, you can see the improvement of stereo acuity. This is the summary of the results. Here you can see the prevision therapy in first visit, microtropia with anisometropic amblyopia 0.40 plus or minus 0.06 and post VT in after 30 sessions 0.10 plus or minus 0.08 and P value was 0.002. Strabismic amblyopia was 0.82 plus or minus 0.03 for pre-VT and 0.62 plus or minus 0.06 in post-VT and p-value was 0.003. Bilateral refractive amblyopia was 0.34 plus or minus 0.06 for pre-VT and 0.11 plus or minus 0.2 was post-VT and p-value was 0.003. And also stereo acuity for microtropia with anisometropic amblyopia was 67.00 plus or minus 16.25 for pre-VT and 26.6 plus or minus 12.12 for post-VT and p-value was 0.002. In strabismic amblyopia in the pre-VT, stereo acuity was not available due to the manifest conditions and post-VT was 196.66 plus or minus 16.25 and p-value was unremarkable. In the bilateral refractive amblyopia was pre-VT 33.33 plus or minus 14.22 
and post VT in 21.66 plus or minus 12.2 and p-value was 0.001. Discussion was vision therapy is more than just simple eye exercises. It improves brain-eye communication and the effective operation of the visual system. This study shows successful improvement in anisometropic amblyopia, strabismic amblyopia, and bilateral poor vision according to the result. The same protocol was followed in all three categories, but sometimes some changes were in strabismic amblyops and bilateral poor vision patients due to various findings. Accommodation and fixation techniques were more effective parts of this study because when we do accommodation therapy and make accommodation strong, we can simply improve their visual acuity. According to my conclusion, vision therapy is an effective way to improve visual acuity and stereoacuity in patients with bilateral refractive amblyopia, magnetropia with anisometropic amblyopia, and strabismic amblyopia. My take home message is young adult patient with bilateral refractive amblyopia, microtropia with anisometropic amblyopia, and strabismic amblyopia improve with vision therapy. There were some limitations in my research. There were 80 patients in this research. Out of 80 patients, only 60 patients had their regular vision therapy follow up. I was unable to gather expected data because there was less follow up due to the economical crisis and less affordability. These are my references. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ashka. Are there any questions from the judge panel? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was a quite uh, well presented, uh, the technique of uh, vis visual therapy and uh, your methodology was uh, uh, acceptable, very good. Uh, I, I would, I, a small suggestion, you had uh, 60 uh, samples, yeah. uh, a number of 60 patients. So that's a very good sample size also as well. Uh, so in those 60 patients, all 60 patients received uh, vision therapy, uh, yeah. Yeah, vision therapy regime. No? So, and you have assessed the uh, improvement and it was st statistically significant, the yeah. p-value was significant. Uh, how did you uh, calculate the p-value? Sorry? Was there any software that have you, you have used to calculate the p-value? How p did you? We yeah. use software. Uh, I uh, my guidance, my uh, in charge guide me. Uh, yeah. Have you used the software yeah. to calculate the p-value? No. Uh, my in charge is guide okay. me for SPSC calculating software. values. Okay. Uh, then um, uh, another suggestion: it's better if you can, if you can, uh, if you would have uh, used the conventional occlusion therapy alone for a control group and see whether there's any statistically significant difference yeah. between vision therapy and uh, uh, this uh, vision therapy and occlusion alone. So that would be uh, an advan uh, a further uh, 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 add-on to the, your research, but it was very good, uh, so good. Thank you. Yeah, just one question, please just say. Uh, was this patient undergone only vision therapy or uh, just uh, any other therapy has been given for this, like as an example, for the strabismic amblyopic patients? So Were they given spectacles? Yeah, we are given spectacles. Given spectacles, right. Yeah. It would have been better if you have mentioned that, but it's a good presentation, right? Okay. Thank you. Our next presenter is Dinumi Chamatri, a case report on effectiveness of vision therapy for man management of diplomia with convergence insufficiency in an adult patient. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Dinamit Shamatri from Vision Care Kids Unit. 
I am here to present you all about my case study, Effectiveness of Vision Therapy Patients with Convergence Insufficiency with Cross Diplopia. Let's we move on introduction. Vision therapy is defined as an attempt to develop or improve visual skills and abilities, improve visual comfort, as and how well the eyes work, and change visual processing or understanding visual information. Convergence insufficiency is characterized by a decreased ability to converge the eyes and maintain binocular fusion while focusing on a near target. This is my objective. The objective of my study is to find out the effectiveness of vision therapy in adult patients with diplopia and convergence insufficiency. This is the procedure of my study. Design case study, study area, vision care kids unit, VT department. Time period December 2021 to December 2022, age 59 years. Case convergence weakness type exoporia with cross diplopia. Here is the case history of here is the case history of my patient. Age 59 years old female has been complaining of double vision and severe discomfort when looking at near objects. No previous history of squint or trauma. Neurological examinations were normal and ophthalmic examinations were also normal. Uh, this is the first orthoptic assessment findings. Visual acuity, both right and, right and left eye, 6, 9, and cover test is normal. Binocular status, for near, 5 lights, and for distance, 4 lights. A stereo acuity, 40 centimeters, uh, poor responses, and 6 meters also poor responses. Uh, convergence with RF ruler, 40 centimeters. Prism fusion range uh, for near and distance, zero. Ocular movements, no, no limitations or non nystagmus Deviation uh, for near, uh, 12 adapter base in, and for distance, 2 adapter base in. According to the orthoptic assessment, the diagnosis was decompensated convergence weakness type exophoria with cross diplopia. Here is the refraction, the first refraction. Uh, the right and left, both right and left eye, the best corrected visual acuity was 6-9. Here is the method of my study. First, we do orthoptic assessment and refraction. After that, uh, we did vision therapy in clinics four times per week and home therapy exercises also given. After 30 sessions, do an assessment, follow up after three months, follow up after one year, and comparison of first visit findings to final visit findings. Through that, get the improvements. Uh, this is the general VT protocol uh, for a convergence insufficiency patient. Uh, here are four phases. First one is accommodative and peripheral stereo enhancement. Second one, central stereo and binocular skills enhancement. Third phase, flat fusion and anti-suppression. And the fourth one, accommodation convergence flexibility. Uh, this is the... Uh, this is the general VT protocol for uh, convergence insufficiency patient. But uh, in my study, uh, I used a press biopic patient. Uh, according to that, uh, their uh, press biopic patient's accommodation ability is very poor because I use this protocol. This is my followed protocol. Uh, there are four phases. First one is ocular mobility and peripheral stereo enhancement. Second one, central stereo and binocular skills enhancement. Third one, flat fusion and anti-suppression. Fourth one is convergence and divergence flexibility. Uh, in here, I mainly focused uh, strength and binocular, uh, strength and eye muscles and uh, improve binocular functions. First vision therapy visit in clinic. 
at the first visit, uh, my purpose was uh, strengthen eye muscles and find out how far the patient has double vision. Therapy techniques I used, Kraskin and Sico, Marsden Ball, VTS4. At the first visit, uh, patient feedback was headache, eye strain, and double vision. At the first visit, uh, I saw poor eye movements of the patient and double image become at single, 15 adapter base in with VTS4. Uh, this figure one shows the uh, perform VTS4 exercise, and figure two shows perform Marsden Ball exercise, and the figure three shows Kraskin and Suko exercise. Fifth visit, uh, at the fifth visit also, I continued the uh, previous therapy techniques. Uh, pa th patients' feedback at the fifth visit, uh, headache, eye stra headache and eye strain are less than before. Horizontal intermittent diplopia is still present. After fifth, at the fifth visit, uh, I saw eye movements are proper than before, and binocular double image becomes single at 10 dive to base in with VTS4. At the 10th visit, I started exercises for central stereo and binocular skills enhancement, therapy techniques, vectogram, block string, VTS4, multiple choice versions, road dress, and RDS. Uh, at the 10th visit, patient's feedback was sometimes getting headache, and diplopia is very rare. Uh, at the 10th, 10th visit, I saw well-maintained eye movements of the patient and can see double image at zero adapter base out and base in with VTS4 and gross stereopsis also present. Uh, figure four shows road race activity of VTS4 and figure five shows vectogram with tranaglyphs exercise. 20th visit, at the 20th visit, I started exercises for fusion range enhancement and anti-suppression. Uh, here, I used therapy techniques were red-green heart chart with red-green glasses, aperture rule, burnless cough. At the 20th, 20th visit, patients' feedback was not getting headache or eye fatigue most of the time. Uh, I saw binocular skills are proper than before at the 20th visit. Uh, here are the figures. Uh, figure 6 shows red-green heart chart with red-green glasses, and figure 7 shows burnless cough exercise, and figure 8 shows aperture rule. Home therapy exercises. Uh, while maintaining clinic therapy, uh, I gave home therapy exercises also. Here, uh, master and ball exercise, block string, and cat stereogram I gave as home therapy exercises. Figure 9 shows cat stereogram, and figure 10 shows block string exercise. Uh, this is follow-up after 30 sessions of orthoptic assessment findings. Uh, visual acuity, both right and left eye, was 6-6, six, six, uh, and cover text is normal. Binocular status, uh, for distance and near, four lights. Stereo acuity, for near, 30 sec of arc, and uh, for distance, 203 sec of R. Convergence with RF ruler, 6 centimeters. Prism fusion range uh, for near, 20 dive to base out and 16 dive to base in. Uh, ocular movements full and free. Deviation for near, 2 dive to base in. And for distance, no additional, de uh, no abnormal deviation. Diagnosis after 30 VT sessions, diagnosis was orthophoria. Uh, 30th vision therapy visit in the clinic. At the 30th visit, I started exercises to convergence and divergence flexibility to maintain uh, binocular single vision, intersensory integration therapy. Therapy techniques were vectogram, tranaglyphs with flippers, VTS for jump reduction, aperture rule with flippers. Uh, patients' feedback at the 30th visit, very comfortable with vision therapy. Uh, I, uh, I advise at the 30th, 30th visit uh, to do clinic therapy once a week and it reduce once every two weeks, once a month, and once every two months. Uh, this is the comparison of uh, before and after VT. Here, visual acuity, uh, both right and left eye was 6-9 before VT and after v before VT. After VT, it improves to 6-6. And cover test is normal. 
before vision therapy, uh, worth, worth for dot, uh, for near, five lights, and uh, for distance, four lights. After vision therapy, it improves up to four lights. Stereo acuity before vision therapy was poor responses for distance and near. After vision therapy, it improves up to uh, 30 sec of arc for near and 203 sec of arc for distance. Convergence before VT, uh, 38 centimeters. After VT, it improves up to six centimeters. Prism fusion range for distance and near zero. After vision therapy, it improves up to 20 adapter base out and 16 adapter base in. Uh, for near, for distance, 12 adapter base out and 8 adapter base in. Ocular movements full and free. Deviation uh, for near, 10 adapter base in and for distance, 2 adapter base in after vision, I mean, before vision therapy. After vision therapy, it improves up to 2 adapter base in and for distance, no abnormal deviation. Diagnosis was before vision therapy, decompensated convergence weakness type exophoria with binocular diplopia. After vision therapy, it improves up to orthophoria. This is the latest refraction. Right, both right and left eye, best corrected visual acuity was 6.6. Six. Uh, this is the improvements in binocular function, prism fusion range. Uh, this, this chart shows uh, improvements in uh, fusion range. The blue color, uh, blue color shows the base out range and the red color shows base in range. First two bars shows first orthoptic, uh, orthoptic assessment findings and the second two bars shows follow up after 30 sessions. And third two bars shows the follow up after one year. Here we can see the fusion range enhancement after the VT, after vision therapy. Uh, this chart shows the progression of convergence. The blue color shows the progression of convergence, first visit to the last visit, and uh, red color shows normal range of convergence. Uh, here we can see the progression of stereo acuity. Uh, Blue color shows the stereo acuity for near and red color shows the stereo acuity for distance. Uh, discussion and conclusion. Uh, my conclusion of this study is according to the case study, the results shows vision therapy is an effective method in the management of diplopia with convergence insufficiency and it is very successful for both children and adults. Discussion. Uh, clinic therapy should not be stopped as soon as the patient improves. It should be reduced gradually. After one year follow-up shows, improvements have not been reversed even through the clinic therapy has been stopped. Also, according to, according to the case study, it can be seen binocular functions can be improved even, vision, uh, even if person's accommodation is poor. My take-home message if someone complains symptoms of binocular convergence insufficiency, uh, especially if someone com uh, if presbyopic patient complains symptoms of convergence insufficiency without any pathological anomaly, uh, definitely suggest uh, orthoptic assessment because we can make the patient comfortable with vision therapy. And also, age does not affect vision therapy results in the patients with coordination issues. Uh, here are my limitations. Accommodation, and accommodation is an important therapy protocol in vision therapy, but in this case study, I was unable to perform accommodation therapy because the patient was at age 59 years. Through vision therapy is an effective way to improve these types of cases, around 20 vision therapy sessions. Uh, this patient underwent 35 sessions for improvements due to presbyopic conditions. Here are my references, and thank you. Thank you, Dinumi. Are there any questions from the judge panel? What thank were you. the limitations that you were facing during this study, the limitations of the study? Uh, my limitation of the study, 
uh, the accommodation ability is very poor uh, for presbyopic patients because I this, this didn't is, do. Yeah, this is for a single patient, right? One case study. Yeah. So what what were the problems you were facing during the study? You were following up this patient for one year, if I'm correct, right? Yeah. yeah. So what were the problems you were facing? Well, was he compliant with the therapy all the time? Uh, yeah. Uh, after one year also, uh, we didn't follow up. Uh, after the follow up also, uh, her uh, results results were not reversed. Okay. Thank you. Our last presenter is Ravindi Yakupitiya, a case report in novel te techniques of adult acquired vision loss management with vision therapy. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ravindi Akupiti from Vision Therapy Unit. So today my topic is a case study about novel techniques of adult acquired vision loss management with vision therapy. According to Lena J. Press, vision therapy is an effective and recognized treatment modality for ameliorating ocular motor dysfunctions, versions, anomalies, accommodative or convergence problems with visual perceptual deficits. Acquired vision loss is a loss of vision resulting from an acquired brain injury or impairment in coordination of the eyes and difficulties with visual perception. So my objective is to evaluate the effectiveness of novel techniques of vision therapy for patients with sudden acquired vision loss. My design of the procedure was a case study. She was a 44-year-old foreign lady who came to vision care with a sudden acquired vision loss after the brain surgery, and she has completed treatments and investigations done by the neurologist. She was um, bed resting for three months, but her visual acuity didn't improve within the time period. Then the neurologist referred to vision stimulation to improve her vision and quality of life. These are her orthoptic findings before and after surgery. Her uh, visual acuity before surgery, it was zero logma, and after surgery, it was HM. Stereo acuity before surgery, it was 55 sec of arc. Be after surgery, it was nil. Binocular convergence before surgery, it was six centimeters. After surgery, it was nil. Worth lights before surgery, it was four lights, but after surgery, it was right suppression. Covert is, there was no any deviation before surgery, but after surgery, there was light exophoria with good recovery. Um, color vision in her, from her right eye, she could identify 38 plates from before surgery, but after surgery, she couldn't identify any plates out of 38 plates from right eye. Her ocular deviation for uh, distance and near, uh, before surgery, it was two adapter base in, but after surgery, it was 12 adapter base in and 8 adapter base in. This is a um, summary of the refraction from in the first visit. These are my methods I followed. This study includes one tumor patient with sudden acquired vision loss after the brain tumor removal. In the beginning, the patient underwent a complete eye examination, orthoptic evaluation, visual field test, and the color vision test. After the initial assessment, patient was recommended for vision therapy exercises every day per week. Patient was given a special quality of life form before starting clinic-based vision therapy from visual functions and subjective quality of life compared subjects in acquired vision loss by Adverse Journal. First review was proceed by after 25 sessions to inspect the visual acuity. Next reviews were done after each and every 20 sessions. Above tests and therapy sessions were done by the same clinician and the same vision therapist. My goal of this study is to enhance the vision and to improve quality of life. 
This is a regular sequence we follow when performing therapies for amblyopic patients, but I couldn't follow the exact sequence because the patient was 44 year press biopic. In the first therapy session, I did light stimulation and fixation therapy as therapy techniques. In the first session, the patient feedback was very poor. She gets tired soon and get headaches and she couldn't see or feel the light. As the therapist's feedback, the pupil reaction was absent and very poor responses for hand movements. This is a small video clip that I, how I performed vision stimulation and how she reacted. As you can see, the technique was performed in fully dark room and the patient reaction for the light. In the 15th vision therapy session, I started fixation exercises along vision stimulation exercises. The new therapy technique I used here was SANAT vision integrator. Still patient feedback was very poor and there was a plus point that she could feel the light. According to the therapist's feedback, the pupil reaction was present and still poor responses for hand movements. These are some clips while she's doing SVI, one with poor responses and one with good responses. This is the first orthoptic review done after 25 VT sessions. After 25 VT sessions, her visual acuity was 0 0.6 logma in right eye, Stereo acuity was gross, binocular convergence was nil, worth lights, right suppression with worth for dot test, cover test, slight exophoria with good recovery. In color vision, she couldn't identify any plate out of 38 plates from the right eye. Her ocular deviation for near hand distance was 12 adapter basin and 8 adapter basin. This is the orthoptic review after uh, 45 VT sessions. Her visual acuity was 0 0.3 logma, stereo acuity was 600 sec of arc, binocular convergence was 40 centimeters, worth lights, five lights, cover test, slight exophoria with good recovery, color vision, she could identify the three plates out of 38 plates from the right eye, ocular deviation was for 40 centimeters and six meters, eight adapter base in and six adapter base in. After the 45th review, I started anti-suppression therapy along vision, vision stimulation. The new therapy technique I used here along SVI was anaglyphic TV trainer. This is a small video clip of anaglyphic TV trainer. This is a review after 65 sessions of VT. After 65 sessions, her visual acuity was 0 0.17 logma in right eye. Stereo acuity was 300 sec of arc. Binocular convergence was 25 centimeters. Worth lights, four lights. Cover test, slight exophoria with good recovery. Color vision, five lights out of 38 plates. Five plates out of 38 plates uh, from right eye. Her ocular, ocular deviation for distance and near, it was six adapter basin. After 65th review, I started binocular therapy and gradually removed anti-suppression therapy. The new therapy technique I used was VTS4 for distance suppression and red-green heart chart. Here patient's feedback was little better than the previous feedback, like less eye pain, less headache. The therapist's feedback was also good because she was responding faster than the previous reactions. These are some pictures of VTS4 software and red-green heart chart. And here's a review of after, 20, after 80 VT sessions. Her visual acuity in right eye was improved up to 0 0.17 logma. Stereo acuity 110 sec of arc with a frisbee test. Binocular convergence 12 centimeters. Worth lights, four lights, cover test, slight exophoria with good recovery. Color vision, she could identify 28 plates out of 38 plates from the right eye. Her ocular deviation for near and distance with four adapter basin. 
after 80th uh, after 80th vision therapy session i started i started um, new therapy techniques like uh, intersensory integration therapy uh, therapy techniques i used here was um, burnless scope mast and ball exercises and walking rail activities patient feedback was no headaches no eye pains and therapy's feedback was uh, less complaints for eye pains and headaches and fast reactions than previous therapy tech here are the here are some uh, videos and pictures of intersensory integration therapy this is a summary of the refraction her visual acuity in right eye has been improved up to 69 and near vision was n5 the orthoptist suggested her to continue vision therapy in clinic until the binocular functions get stable here is the comparison of results before and after vision therapy before starting vision therapy um, her vision visual acuity was hm but after doing vision therapy it was 69 plus stereo acuity uh, before vision therapy it was nil but after vision therapy it was 110 sec of arc binocular convergence also it was nil and after vision therapy uh, it was 12 cm worth lights um, before vision therapy it was right suppression and after vision therapy it was four lights color vision before vision therapy it was uh, zero plates out of 80, 38 plates but after vision therapy it was 28 out of 38 plates from right eye so my conclusion is this case study proves that it is possible to improve vision enhancement and quality of life of the patients with sudden acquired vision loss with active vision therapy even at the age of 44 for that the patient commitment is very important my take home message is vision therapy could greatly improve visual and binocular functions in acquired vision loss as well as enhance binocular functions even at the age of 44 i had some limitations during the patient follow up we had done visual field test also but comparing to the beginning with the last report there was no any significant improvement so i i was not considered about the field of vision in the beginning of the therapy sessions it was really difficult to maintain attention of the patient for the therapy because sometimes she was getting aggressive and mentally down due to her medical conditions unable to complete regular follow up because the patient went abroad after 80th vision therapy session thank you thank you ravindi are there any questions from the judge panel yes uh, good presentation i have to ask to what was the surgery that she has undergone um she has undergone a tu brain tumor surgery anterior clenoid process the tumor tumor was in the anterior clenoid process yes so can you mention what is the type of surgery that she underwent sorry sir do you have the details what kind of surgery she underwent she underwent a craniotomy or a uh, transvenous you know, nasal approach or what kind of surgery do you have the details i'm just asking no i just no. have the name no. of the tumor no. sir do you have the visual fields uh, before yeah. the surgery and after surgery yes i have yeah it's good if you have included that in the presentation right it would have been much better and uh, if you have mentioned the surgery what kind of a surgery that she underwent yeah. and when did you started the visual therapy immediately after the surgery or no uh, i have mentioned it here after 3 months after 3 after the surgery Thank you. Thank you all for your patience and attention. I'm sure I'm sure you are I'm sure you are all fa famished. Ladies and gentlemen, let's break for lunch. Please be on your seats after 45 minutes. Also we have organized a photographic con contest for the first time the contour, uh, contest photos will be displayed on the screen along with the break thank you
kind reminder that you all can access the abstract book agenda and for the quiz competition through the QR code. If you have any doubts, you can ask from us. And uh, please enjoy your lunch. Be sure you have a seat after 45 minutes.
I get the sense that you might really love her. The text will be evidence. The sex is evidence. I try to rush you with you, no mercy, no common passion. But damn, you was out of reach. You was at the farmer's market with your perfect peach. Now I'm in amazement, playing on my patience. Now you laying face down, got me singing over a beat. I'm so mature. I'm so mature. I'm so mature. Got me a therapist to tell me there's a gun and I don't want none. I just want you to chill. If I can have you, no one will. I change who I was to put you both first but now I give up go easy on me baby I was still a child didn't get the chance to
The club isn't the best place to find a lover, so the bar is where I go. Me and my friends at the table doing shots, drinking fast, and then we talk slow. Come over and start up a conversation with just me, and trust me, I give it a chance. Now I'll take my hand, stop with Venom Man on the jukebox, and then we start to dance. Now you sing it like, Girl, you know I want your love. Your love was handmade for somebody like me. Come on now, follow my lead. I might be crazy, don't mind me say. Boy, let's not talk too much. Grab on my waist and put that body on me. Come on now, follow my lead. Come, come on now, follow my lead. I'm in love with the shape of you We push and pull like a magnet do Although my heart is falling too I'm in love with your body Last night you were in my room And now my bed sheets smell like you Every day discovering something brand new I'm in love with your body I oh I oh I oh I I'm in love with your body I oh So go all you can eat, fill up your bag while I fill up a plate We talk for hours and hours about the sweet and the sour How your family is doing okay Leaving, get in the taxi, kiss in the backseat Tell the driver, make the radio play And I'm singing like Girl, you know I want your love Your love was handmade for somebody like me Come on now, follow my lead I might be crazy, don't mind me, say Boy, let's not talk too much With the shape of you, we push and pull like a magnet do. Although my heart is falling too, I'm in love with your body. Last night you were in my room, and now my bed sheets smell like you. Every day discovering something brand new. I'm in love with your body. I oh I oh I oh I. I'm in love with your body. I oh I oh I oh I. I'm in love with your body. My baby, come on, come on, be 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 my baby, come on. I'm in love with the shape of you, push and pull like a magnet do. Although my heart is falling too, I'm in love with your body. Last night you were in my room, and now my bed sheets smell like you. Discovering something brand new. I'm in love with your body. I oh, I oh, I oh, I. I'm in love with your body. I oh, I oh, I oh, I. I'm in love with your body.
Say me cut a small one Ask me I wake up Now she did my mind Like a jacket
is just not right for you. And you can tell me if I'm off, but I see it on your face when you tell me he's the one that you want. And then you're spending all your time in this wrong situation. Every time you want it to stop, how do I can treat you? I just wanna give you the love and let you listen Maybe just to wake up with you Would be everything I need And this could be so different Tell me what you want to do How do I can treat you better Than he can And any girl like you deserves a gentleman Tell me why I'll be wasting time On all your wasted crime When you should be with me instead I won't let you down Just know that you don't have to do this alone Promise I'll never let you down How do I can treat you better than he can And any girl like you deserves a gentleman Tell me why I'll be wasting time on all your wasted crime when you should be with me instead. Come on, turn the radio on It's Friday night and I won't be long Gotta do my hair, I put my makeup on It's Friday night and I won't be long Till I hit the dance floor, hit the dance floor I got all I need No, I ain't got cash, I ain't got cash But I got you, baby, baby
Talking in my sleep at night, making myself crazy. Wrote it down and read it out, hoping it would save me. Don't pick up the phone, you know he's only calling cause he's drunk and alone Two, don't let him in, you have to kick him out again Three, don't be his friend, you know you're gonna wake up in his bed in the morning And if you're under him, you ain't getting over him I got no rules, I count him Forwards, but he keeps pulling me backwards no way to turn. No way to turn. No. Now I'm standing back from it I finally see the pattern I've never he doesn't love me So I tell myself I tell myself I do, I do, I do One, don't pick up the phone You know he's only calling Cause he's drunk and alone Baby, this is what you came for Lightning strikes every time she moves And everybody's watching her But she's looking at i 
Like this, no, it's not about the better than the summer of 2002. We are all in love, but acting like grown ups, like you are in the present. Drinking from plastic cups, seeing love is forever and never. Like, yes, that was true. I'm still on the wood in the middle of a rose And I know I must stay Well, we say So sweet, I will let you Friends And you will like this Say, oh, I got And you're not promising me bye-bye-bye I'm 
up, let me sing you bye-bye. Hold up. If you wanna go and take a lap with me, better hear me, baby, one more time. Oh. Paint a picture for you and me on the dance floor where we are. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to start the session in five minutes. Attention please, we are going to start the session in five minutes. Please kindly be on your seats. I've been trying to call I've been on my own for long enough Maybe you could show me how to love Maybe I'm going through a drought You don't even have to do too much You can turn me on with just a touch Baby I look around and since it is cold and empty No one's around to judge me I can't see clearly when you're gone I said, ooh, I'm blinded by the light No, I can't sleep until I feel your touch I said, ooh, I'm drowning in the night Oh, when I'm like this, you're the one I trust How did I Nothing at all, nothing at all 
What is the point of my lips if they don't make noise? Oh, what is the point of doing nothing at all? Watching it fall, the flicker burning. You know the time is running, running out. Only I see all the diamonds, diamonds breaking down. I won't stay quiet, I won't stay quiet. Cause stay in silence, the same as dying. I won't stay quiet, the flicker's burning low. This is not a swan, swan song. Ladies and gentlemen, kind reminder, two minutes left for the session, kindly be on your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, one minute left for this session. Kindly have your seats.
Welcome back to the Vision Care Optometry Day and 30th Annual Scientific Session. He is a postdoctoral researcher at Enthalmic LTD, Sydney, and visiting teaching faculty at the University of Hyderabad, India. He has completed his Bachelor in Optometry in the year of 2012 from Bosch and Lohm School of Optometry and worked as a consultant optometrist in LV Prasad Eye Institute, India for five years, where he was involved in research, clinical care and teaching. He went on to pursue his PhD in vision science from the University of New South Wales, Sydney, Australia. His research experience over the past 10 years focused on the optics of the eye and the effects of irregular optics and vis visual functions. He has developed a software programs and tools for vision, visual functions such as anisocornia and fixation disparity. His work was published in peer-reviewed international journals as presented at national and international conferences. He is a member of the Association for Research in Vision and Ophthalmology, ARVO, and the Society of Optica. He is also a voluntary reviewer for various peer-reviewed interna international journals. We are honored to invite Dr. Praveen Kumar on the stage to deliver the keynote speech. Uh, very good afternoon all and uh, thanks for the kind introduction. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Vision Care and Academy for giving me the opportunity to present my work and having me here. Uh, today I am going to talk for the next 20 minutes or so is about a title called a symbiotic connection. Uh, how clinics drive research and research enhanced clinics. So this is the title of the talk, so we'll go through it. So before I make the connection between the clinics and research, I want to um, just make a point here that exactly 15 years back, nearly exactly 15 years back, uh, someone from Sri Lanka visited Hyderabad uh, to have their uh, bachelor's of optometry education uh, at Elvi Prasad Eye Institute. Uh, we met that time and this guy was as always uh, been smart and among all the crowd of uh, Indian students he grabbed the uh, Mr. Fresher award and also been uh, very famous in the uh, LV Prasad and the Bashanam School of Optometry community. Um, of course I am sure that you remember and recognize this fellow Vidya and that's how we know each other and then uh, the friendship and the collaboration continued since then. So the outline of my talk is about the importance of clinics and research connection because we are so much into the clinical care, we are uh, focused on the patient care and we need to understand there is a bit of a research we need to, um, you want me to, uh, yeah, thanks. So why should we integrate research into clinical care and how? That's the first part. And uh, not going to the theory part, but I would like to show some examples how um, this interaction between the clinics and research helped. So this is from my personal experience, um, how the clinical questions turned into a research questions and how that were uh, developed. So although there are uh, various types of research, uh, kind of a basic research and uh, clinical research and translational research, I would be focusing more on the uh, translational research. 
So the, this is a pyramid which shows the levels of advantages uh, of the importance of clinics and research uh, connection. So I'm not going to go into the detail, but when we go to the cases, then we will understand how a clinical case or a particular clinical scenario would be useful to make uh, some impact in the patient care. So, of course, when we do the research, it enhances our medical knowledge because we are constantly asking questions because in the morning we had so many nice presentations which were uh, based on the clinical cases and the observations and the prevalence of disease. So it continuously, if you are uh, working on the research and the clinical care, it enhances our medical knowledge. And we can always translate these research findings into clinical practice so that we can have a better patient care. So, and the other advantage is we can uh, develop a personalized medicine, especially in terms of the genetics. Um, uh, we can, uh, the genetic disorders, we can use the knowledge which we gain from the research and then develop the personalized medicine. And of course, um, this, is, this will enhance the continuous uh, learning, will improve the professional development because um, we always ask questions and then improve ourselves. And the last but not the least, I guess, the collaboration of the, uh, with different stakeholders. So you can collaborate with the clinicians, researchers, and the policy makers, and also the uh, marketing companies. So this is the, these are the list of advantages, uh, what we can achieve by interacting the both clinics and research connections. So let me go through three simple cases which were uh, observed when, were, when I was in uh, internship and after uh, doing some practice in, at LV, uh, LV Prasad Eye Institute. So we know that the corneal diseases are you know, mostly common in terms of uh, the, the corneal blindness. So we often see unilateral disease, uh, corneal diseases due to injuries and infections, uh, genetic disorders, generally binocular, but um, you often see these cases. And what we do is if the disease is minimal or a mild form of a disease, we generally correct them with the spectacles or the normal optical correction. But if the disease is a very severe form, then uh, maybe the surgical intervention is the option. So the one option is to have the uh, penetrating keratoplasty, uh, that is a full thickness corneal transplantation, or the other option is lamellar transplantation. Now the question is, one eye is normal. So if you see in this case, the other eye, the fellow eye being 20-20 vision, and the affected eye, if you transplant, maybe the clear graft is achieved. So the question what we asked was, we know that to perceive the world in a three-dimensional view, so both eyes need to have the similar image in terms of the contrast and color. So once the both eyes receive the two images, the brain fuses and then we perceive the world in three-dimensional view. Okay, so, but the case is slightly different here. Although the anatomically we achieve the clear graft, would the vision of this eye match the fellow eye vision? So the countries, like in you know, developing countries, we are running lack of, you know, the donor corneas. What is the benefit we are doing to this patient uh, transplanting the cornea uh, in a unilateral condition? So that's the question what we asked. So does the operated eye get the maximum vision similar to the fellow eye? That's the first question. And the, what is the binocular vision uh, achieved in these patients? Or is it only limited to the monocular improvement? And can we improve the visual functions in these patients? So the question, because we always measure the vision monocularly. So once the patient comes, you close the left eye, and then you measure the visual activity in this eye, the vision will be 20, 30, but, but the viewing is always binocular. So once the patient sees binocularly, whether we do not really know whether the patient is actually using this eye or the eye is being suppressed. So that's the question we ask. So, these are the results. So if you look at this uh, data of the higher order aberrations, the first left panel is the HORMS, that is the higher order roots mean, uh, root mean square aberration values, the transplanted eye and the fellow eye. So as you can see here in the transplanted eye, the aberrations are significantly higher than the fellow eye. Okay, so these are the cases, uh, around 24 patients of uh, unilateral corneal transplantation. And the, this, the, the blue, um, box and whisker plots are the age-matched normals. So 
Of course, uh, because we expect the aberrations to be minimal in these cases uh, in controls, so this is normal. So the other important point what we need to understand is the interocular difference. That means the difference between the normal eye and the operated eye. The aberrations are quite largely different in the cases, whereas the controls have very minimal difference because we expect the normals to have similar aberrations in these cases. So this important point, because once there is a dissimilarity in the image quality or the dissimilarity in the refraction or the aberrations, the visual system is going to suppress that particular eye. So although anatomically we may have the clear cornea, but visual function wise it's not going to be helpful much. So, so this is the data of the visual acuity. Again, the transplanted eye, if you look at the data with the best spectacle correction around 2030, is the median visual acuity. That's a fairly good vision for a corneal transplanted patient. And the fellow eye, of course, has a, a 2020 or even better vision. And binocularly, this vision is um, 2020. So now, if you look at the data, uh, this data uh, clearly, although the operated eye has a poor vision, binocularly, the vision is 2020. So there is a possibility that the eye may be suppressed uh, when viewing binocularly. So the data again further supports with the stereo acuity data with the cases, uh, very poor stereo around 500 seconds of hour and controls have around the 30 and 40 seconds of hour. So what we found was although there is a clear anatomically clear cornea, the visual function improvement is very suboptimal uh, in these cases, the unilateral corneal transplanted patients. So the reason could be because the aberrations are increased and there is a greater interlocular difference in the image quality. So that's why the patients are not really uh, getting benefited with this uh, transplanted transplantation. So what we did was we know the reason why the, uh, the visual functions were f poor. So we corrected uh, the higher order aberrations instead of using the routine spectacle uh, correction, we prescribed them with the uh, RGP contact lenses. Now, once we put the RGP contact lenses, the stereo of the higher order aberrations reduced significantly and the stereo acuity improved significantly. Okay, so now the question was if you have a unilateral dissimilar diseases, it's always key point to match the images or the refraction or the aberration similar. So unless we prescribe this RGP contact lenses, the benefit of the corneal transplantation is not met if you only prescribe the spectacle correction. So that's the learning. So you, we had a question, what is the maximum benefit they get with glasses? Only visual acuity improvement monocularly. But if you prescribe the contact lenses, then only the maximum benefit of the corneal transplantation is achieved. So this is the uh, first case. So basically these are the points which we, uh, which I discussed. The second clinical scenario is keratoconus. I think uh, morning we had a couple of talks um, on keratoconus. So this is a corneal irregular, um, irregularity condition where the higher order aberrations are more and also presents with the very high irregular astigmatism. So there are various options to correct keratoconus, uh, at least at the refraction wise, the spectacles, soft contact lenses, RGP lenses, and uh, scleral lenses. Now the question is, once the patient comes to clinic, uh, it's the patient and the examiners or the clinician's responsibility to choose one of these options. Okay, so of course there is a, uh, there are several factors we will include, but what is the best choice you would choose? Um, rather than if you ask the patient, patient will always say that, okay, you are the doctor, you advise one for me. So what is the best way? So how do we select the, uh, what is the rationale for uh, choosing a lens over another? Because uh, we have to understand what is the visual benefit the patient is getting uh, among all these lenses. So what we did was we measured the high contrast visual acuity, stereo acuity, and these uh, parameters with different lenses and we compared which lens is providing the best visual function and we compared it with the cost because each of these lenses have their own limitations in, in terms of the cost. So if you look at this, may be a busy graph but uh, try to follow it from the top. So the first one is the Lagmar visual acuity of uh, 27 keratoconic patients and the black circle is spectacles and the pink one is the, um, the scleral lens. So if you look at the visual acuity, the, all the black circles are on top, that means the visual acuity with the spectacles is poor, 
and uh, as with the rose k2 lens and the rgp lenses the acuity is better so that's what we expect in general and the contrast sensitivity function the higher the value the better the performance uh, again as you can see the spectacles always had a poorer contrast sensitivity function and the whereas the scleral lens and the um, the rose k rgp had a better contrast sensitivity function and a similar result with stereo acuity uh, lesser the value the better the performance so it, as you can see here all the red green and the pink ones are in the bottom so that means with the rose k2 rgp the stereo is better than spectacle so this is what uh, is one would expect now the important point is given that all of them will produce so if you look at this table uh, uh, simply here these are the different options of keratoconus correction unaided spectacles and uh, the various types of scleral lens uh, contact lenses and these are the various parameters what we measured and we also compared the ease of lens fitting wearing comfort and cost so the darker the um, color that is very suboptimal the lighter or the shade lighter color is the better one so if you can see here the visual functions are almost same for rose k2 rgp and scleral lens there is no difference so if you get a patient of a keratoconus mild to moderate case uh, this is for mild to moderate case you can choose one of these lenses because it there is no significant difference between these three lenses but the only key is the cost wise the rgp lenses are cheaper than rose k2 and scleral lens so if the patient is concerned about the cost and visual functions are, uh, are you know in a routine manner then maybe the rgp is the best option if he doesn't worry about the cost maybe then the rose k2 or the scleral lens would be the option so this is one of the advantage of this work and the similar analysis was done for advanced keratoconus here where these uh, stereo acuity wavefront aberrations were pretty much normal in uh, rose k2 rgp and scleral lens so this analysis again showed that cost wise the rgp is the cheapest one uh, whereas the scleral lens improved the uh, fitting and the comfort because this is a uh, um, advanced keratoconus cases so the take home point is when we have this uh, discrepancy or the confusion in choosing one over the other maybe uh, doing some kind of a data analysis and get the data and then you can make some conclusions which will improve the patient care and also reduce the chair time of the examiner and also the patient so moving forward this is that those two are very really uh, clinical case scenarios um, this one is about the diagnostic test so this little instrument here is called uh, a plus optics power refractor so what it does is um, it's basically a screening tool uh, for refractive error especially designed for the infants and uh, you know uh, very younger children so th the advantage is this is a non invasive procedure so all the patient or the kid has to do is um, there is a little stand which is attached to this one the patient has to look straight and it will capture the uh, the pupil light reflex and based on the power profile the brightness of the reflex it will calculate the refractive error so it's a very quick and uh, easy tool to use uh, especially for the screening for refractive errors and other abnormalities in the children but the problem is these uh, instruments are calibrated it needs to be calibrated so we what we generally do is uh, we use trial lenses in front of the patient's eye uh, to get some uh, data so that we can uh, always correct it so this graph shows here the effect of vortex distance and the back vortex power because while we use this uh, the trial lenses of different power the placement of the lens and the power of the lens has an effect on the magnification so as you can see here as the power of the lens increasing both uh, negative and positive side uh, the magnification is also changing so at the zero power there is a zero magnification and as you increase the minus power there is a minification and as you increase the plus power there is a magnification so basically if you change the vortex distance and the uh, back vortex power there is a change in the magnification so what we did we measured the magnification we use the size lenses which only ch change the shape factor or only changes the magnification without uh, without changing the power and as you can see here with 
in emetropia there is no difference but for low moderate high myopia there is a significant error in the output of that uh, instrument so instead of reporting as zero diopter the instrument was outputting as uh, you know the giving the output of 1.5 diopters so there is a significant change in the output so this this is uh, the eye without size lenses so although we may uh, the companies or the you know papers would say each instrument is valid uh, it is important to validate our own uh, instrument and our own population because these uh, especially the photo refractor is based on the fundus reflex and the fundus reflex is uh, you know variable in different ethnicities so it's always good to have that uh, hook in terms of which instruments need to be validated and how often needs to be validated so that's why uh, that's how you will get a more uh, uh, realistic data so the the conclusion from the last part is the calibration of instrument is very uh, important and uh, the induced lenses will result in error so whenever you alter the uh, re uh, recommended protocol you should be always careful in terms of the inducing errors and also once we calculate the calibration factor we can always modify the output so once we know that how much overestimation or the underestimation the machine is doing we can always compensate for that one so in summary so so the examples what i gave was we had a clinical case we had some research questions and then we did some research to complete that loop so it's always important to have that so that we can uh, provide better patient care and we can also customize the clinical practice uh, based on the each case okay so useful for diagnostic evaluation and standardization which is very important and uh, again as i mentioned it is uh, useful for promoting the healthcare and policy making so with that i will stop here and i would like to thank uh, vision care uh, and uh, vidya especially for uh, having me uh, invited here and this is our team at enthalmic uh, please feel free to visit us uh, we do a lot of uh, r and d work in terms of vision science uh, if you have time please uh, go and visit the website uh, and any questions i'm happy to answer thank you thank you i would Sir, kindly re remain on the stage, please. I would like to invite Dr. Mr. Vadasanta Fonseca to deliver the token of appreciation for your valuable presence. I warmly welcome uh, consultant ENT and head and neck eye surgeon, uh, head and neck surgeon, Dr. Vasantika S. Tuduvage for this event. Let's move on to the next discussion is on clinical optometry. The first presenter, Mr. Dinesh Silva, regarding the impact of reading only glasses on hypermetropic progression in presbyopia. Good afternoon all, I am Dinesh Silva. Uh, today my topic is the impact of reading only glasses on hypermetropic progression in presbyopia. Uh, my introduction, hypermetropia is a refractive condition that causes blurry vision in both near and distance vision objects. In, uh, in this condition, the light rays focus behind the retina instead of on it. The several factors such as shortened axial length and corneal flattening contribute to the development of hypermetropia. In summary, hypermetropia affects both near and distance vision causing blurriness due to the improper focus of light on the retina. The presbyopia 
Presbyopia is a global problem affecting over a billion people worldwide. The prevalence of unmanaged presbyopia is a high as 50% of those over 50 years of age in developing world population. Presbyopia is due to result of the loss or insufficiency of the eyes, ability to focus on nearby objects that occurs when the pres uh, physiologically normal age related reduction in the focusing range reaches a point. It is characterized by the inability to focus near object onto the retina. Uh, reading glasses. Reading glasses are a popular treatment for presbyopia. They are limited to near vision correction and may not be suitable for managing intermediate, intermediate or distance vision. My objective is the study aims to investigate the progression of hypermetropia in individuals who use reading only glasses during presbyopic stage of life. My justification, hypermetropic development with reading only glasses is presby in presbyopic age of life have not been investigated so far with the reading only glasses. Due to the unrecognized role of the reading only glasses for development of hypermetropia in presbyopic age of life, the study was set to evaluate the impact of reading only glasses on hypermetropic progression in presbyopia. My ma materials and method, uh, the prospective observational study was carried out at primary optometric center, Vision Care Optical Services Private Limited, at Vision Care Head Office, uh, Monitor Case on and Mathura outlets. 100 patients were observed and age group is 40 to 50 years. All patients are emetrope and they are haven't any systemic or ocular diseases. Visual acuity is measured by standard four meter logma chart in, uh, in two consecutive visits. In every subject, distance which refractive state was corrected by objective and subjective refraction with two consecutive visits after six months to one year of time. Uh, the glycemic level variation was observed by using FBS test, resulting again two consecutive visits. Uh, OCT and ophthalmoscopy examination was done to identify any significant changes in the retina in two consecutive visits. All my all data was recorded in the Excel sheets and analysis was done with the social science statistics software. My result, uh, first of all, the gender distribution in my study, uh, in 100 subject, male 70% uh, and female 30%. The mean deviation of the age is 44.15 plus or minus two. These are my results. The first one, analysis of visual acuity outcome following first and second visit. The x-axis will indicate the patient's count and y-axis will indicate the uh, variation of visual acuity in logma. The study result indicate that there was a significant reduction in visual acuity after wearing reading only spe spectacles for near. The mean value of reduction of visual acuity is 0.105815 logma. The percentage of the reduction of visual acuity is 49.8942% in cons two consecutive visits. The p-value is less than 0.001 and the result is significant at p less than 0.05. The second one, analysis of spherical power change changes following first and second visit. Again, x-axis was indicate the patient count and the y-axis was indicate the spherical power variation. The results indicate that there was significant increase of the hypermetropic correction after wearing reading only spectacles for near. The mean value of the increase of hypermetropic correction is 0.1086274.5 diopters. The p-value is less than 0.001. The result is significant at p less than 0.05. In my discussion, presbyopia is a condition that where the total power of the eye decreased for near distance vision, necessitating to uh, use the use of additional plus power to improve the near visual acuity. The reading-only glasses have a single focal point uh, designed specifically for close reading task. 
However, individuals using reading-only glasses uh, often attempt to manage intermediate and distance vision as well, relying on sing the single focal point of their glasses. Consequently, these individuals may experience myopia at near intermediate and uh, distance distances while using reading-only glasses with the plus power. In my discussion, Again, reading-only glasses, which have a plus power, cause the ciliary muscles of the eye to relax, as they do not need to exert as much as effect to focus. The combination of myopia and relaxation of the ciliary muscles can persist more than six months. As a result of the eye required additional plus power for far and intermediate distances, but this power is lower than the reading addition power. This shift is the eye's refractive state is known as becoming hypermetropic. In my limitation, uh, normal age, aging leads to an increase in crystalline le lens density, which can affect the refractive power of the eye. Uh, the refractive index of the crystalline lens also undergoes change with the age, which can impact vision. The hypermetropic correction provides is not based on a psychophysic refraction, a technique that temporarily relaxes the ciliary muscles for a more accurate assessment of refractive error. And not all patients undergo biometric immersion technique to, or a scan to accurate measure lens thickness in relation to age, which can influence the, pres bio, uh, the prescription for hypermetropic correction. In my conclusion, there is significant reduction in distance visual acuity and a significant and increasement of hypermetropic correction after wearing reading only spectacles for near. With, the, with that research and the result, I developed another hypothesis to continue this research. This one is, is there any relationship with the relaxation of ciliary muscles with the additional plus power and development of hypermetropia for distance and intermediate distances? These are my references, and thank you. Thank you, Dinesh. Are there any questions from the judge panel? presentation so what was the logic that uh, what was the logic that if you prescribe single vision glasses um, is it not audible? Yeah. what was the logic to select that if you prescribe single vision near glasses the hypermetropia would increase why do you think that happens uh, I think with the reading only glasses uh, the patients not only see the reading distance, I mean 40 centimeters or 50, but be because they need some uh, intermediate distances managed with the reading glasses. So that's why I uh, try to do that research. So what was the time gap between the first visit and the... Uh, More than uh, six months and one year time. So in one year, don't you think that the normal aging would uh, create the difference yes. so how do you differentiate between the normal aging uh, changes uh, with the normal aging uh, the lens density and the hypermetropic progression uh, i mean uh, 0.0025 that uh, i couldn't remember the accept value but that kind of value will increase in each and every year but uh, that one is not effective for the uh, more than less more, more than uh, zero point five diopters. So okay. So uh, theoretically, if the patient is using uh, near only glasses, uh, the, so while when the patient is uh, looking uh, intermediate distance and distant uh, no intermediate dist uh, or, uh, distant objects with near reading glasses, uh, his ciliary body relaxes, no? Uh, so that causes increased power. That causes increased power of the lens, no? 
so that is so that patient becomes more towards myopic no, theoretically but in your study patients hypermetropic hypermetropic progression was increased no because with the re, with the plus power the light rays focus in front of the retina mm. but they renew it they become emetro but ah. continuously that will happen uh, and i i try to may, i try to explain this is with my report with the reading glasses uh, after some times they need uh, the kind of plus power in hypermetropic power for distance vision mm. right okay okay thank you dinesh our next presentation is the effectiveness of using motion sickness preventing glasses by aloka premathilaka Good evening, everyone. I'm Aloka Premathilaka from Vision Care Panadhira branch. Have you ever felt queasy or dizzy when you're traveling on a car, bus, boat, or plane? If so, you may have experienced motion sickness, a common condition that affects millions of people worldwide. However, with the recent advancement of technology, there is a solution for motion sickness. So today I am going to present to you the effectiveness of using motion sickness preventing glasses. Motion sickness is a common problem that affects many people when traveling. It is a motion related illness that occurs when inner ear, eyes and other sensory organs send confusing signals to the brain. Causes of motion sickness. Imagine you are sitting on the back seat of a car and reading a book. The car starts moving and your body feels car's movement. But your eyes see pages of the book staying still. This sends confusing signal to the brain which cannot make sense of what's happening. As a result of this, as a result of this, you start feeling nauseous and dizziness, which are the typical symptoms of motion sickness, and also vomiting in some cases, lightheadedness, sweating, dizziness, and blurred vision. Control and prevention. Pharmacological management, including antihistamines, scapolamine, and calcium channel blockers. You have to take these medicines before 30 to 60 minutes and these drugs are not appropriate for everyone. Also one common side effect of these drugs is drowsiness, so must avoid driving and using dangerous tool after taking. Prevention of motion sickness is like keeping a delicate balance with your body. So, have you ever heard of motion sickness preventing glasses? These gla eyeglasses are framed with four circular rims with two in front and one rim on each side. The rims are tubular and filled with brightly colored liquid, either blue or red, with nose pads, which are ensured that glasses will not fell off and comfortable for all head sizes and shapes. Action of these glasses, these glasses work by using a small fluid field rim inside the frame that moves with the wearer head. These fluid field rings produce an artificial horizon. It balances the emotion that brain received and help to eliminate sensory mismatch, the stress response, and symptom of motion sickness. 
user should put them on the first sign of motion sickness and wear them until the symptoms are revealed. It's about 10 minutes. This video shows the action of fluid filled rim. It makes an artificial horizon and helps to reduce mismatch of signals. Purpose of this study, objective of this study is find the effectiveness and convenience of preventing motion sickness through the motion sickness preventing glasses. Methods. The study was conducted on 60 females and males with the age range of 25 to 45 years who experienced the motion sickness with the time period of 1st of May 2022 to 31st of January 2023 at Vision Care Panadura branch. All subjects underwent the eye examination including uncorrected visual acuity, subjective and objective refraction, best corrected visual acuity, using Shinnipo Nakura FK900 and Snellen chart. Included criteria consist of patient suffering from motion sickness selected with questionnaire. Exclusion criteria included patient with epilepsy, migraine, glaucoma, and pregnancy. Data recorded for each subject using questionnaire which include information such as age, sex, general health, ocular health, and symptoms of motion sickness. After selecting patients, motion sickness preventing glasses given to them for a week of time to use during the traveling, and after that, a questionnaire was given to find the convenience and effectiveness before and after using these glasses. Examination data recorded and analysis using Microsoft Excel. Questionnaire form analysis and graded according to the answers. Results. The average age of participants, 46.10 plus or minus 7.48 years. The average spherical equivalent refractive power was plus 0 0.68 plus or minus 0 0.43 diopters. The average traveling distance was 57.33 plus or minus 9.66 kilometers. This chart shows the feeling dizziness. According to the questionnaire, there was significant change in feeling, feeling dizziness before and after using these glasses. 50% are free of dizziness after wearing these glasses. After wearing uh, motion sickness preventing glasses, 58% could focus, 58% uh, could focus on the road, and 31% uh, who showed the severe symptoms reduced 6.6. According to the questionnaire, there was significant change in headaches before and after using this. 70% free of headaches after using. Salivation. 71% of group free from salivation after wearing these glasses. 78% three had good concentration after wearing these glasses. Severely defective, 25% reduced to the zero. Uh, this shows the overall symptoms of motion sickness with and without these glasses. Uh, without 50% of uh, moderate symptoms, it reduced to 10%. Uh, and also, uh, with motion sickness glasses, there is a 39% of group, they, are, they haven't any symptoms of motion sickness. Conclusion. Motion sickness preventing glasses are an effective and invasive solution for motion sickness symptoms. 
they offer significant improvement in decreasing dizziness, headache, salivation, and poor concentration without known side effects. Discussion. Furthermore, researchers may be needed to determine long-term effectiveness by the potential benefits make the promises option for these who suffer from motion sickness. And I think Introducing motion sickness preventing glasses for the Sri Lankan market will hold great potential due to the country's reliance on the tourism and common use related motion sickness. These are my references. Thank you. Thank you, Aloka. Are there any questions from the judge panel? Are these uh, glasses available in Sri Lanka at the moment? Uh, no. No. Do you have the, any idea about the cost? Couldn't get, sir. Could you check? Uh, what is the cost of uh, these glasses, roughly? I uh, brought from abroad. Mm. It's around 2,000 rupees. 2,000 rupees per glass? Yes. So what were the limitations that you came across when you were doing this research? Uh, the limitations, the obstacles you faced. Couldn't get it. Sir. So, uh, when you are you, when you are you doing the research, mm -hmm. what were the limitations that you faced? Uh, so, uh, problems. As an example, problems. as an example, if you take me and my colleague here, we are both are using glasses. Yes. So, can we write over the glass or? Yes, sir. Huh? Possible. Uh, the, they, these have uh, only rim without lenses. So the rim can be uh, inco incorporated into the already wearing glass? Uh, if you want to make it with uh, correction power. Hmm. So how long do we have to wear it when we are traveling? Uh, Throughout the travel sign period? of symptoms and uh, about 10 minutes until the symptoms are revealed. Did you use a control group or just a, mm. just a, that, the same group as the, uh, for the study? Just same group. You didn't use a control group? No. Uh, I selected participant with the questionnaire form. Okay. Uh, they all have motion sickness mm. every time with the traveling. Mm. Uh, so how did you, uh, see the significance? How did you compare the significance? Significant, uh, compare with uh, same questionnaire before and after, same person. Thank you. Thank you. Our next presentation is an evaluation of the most effective method of tentative prospiopic addition methods by Sanduni Asha. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Sanduni Asha from Vision Care Nowlook branch. Uh, today, my research topic is an evaluation of the most effective method of tentative presbyopic addition methods. Um, first of all, the presbyopia is uh, reduce the near point of accommodation with the age. It happens because of the lens it stops fo uh, focusing ability to correct on the retina. Um, there are several tentative methods for determining addition power for presbyopia. Four of them are uh, age-based method. The age of the fashion is guardian factor in the addition determination. The accommodative amplitude itself age-dependent. Hofstra age table I showed in the slide and gives good guidance for addition consideration for patients who read at 40 centimeter. And second method uh, was amplitude of accommodation based method that measured amplitude of accommodation from RF ruler. Uh, so the tentative addition value was calculated as uh, 2.5 diopter uh, deduct from half of amplitude of accommodation. When amplitude of accommodation is the mean amplitude of accommodation between both eyes. And other method is balancing positive or negative relative accommodation. This procedure measures uh, 
assumes that the prescription of addition is to place the dioptric midpoint of the range of clear vision at the patient's customary near working distance. This was determined with the patient's distance, refraction, and the near point test card at 40 cm by adding plus power lenses binocularly until the subject was no longer able to read the fine print on the test card and vice versa, adding the minus power. So the tentative addition value was calculated use uh, following arithmetic medial of these values. And other method, dynamic retinoscope power. This uh, case uh, objective is compare the outcome of the different tentative addition method with the final addition determination power. The justification, the optometry uses several methods to determine tentative addition for press biops. No study conduct to compare the outcome of these methods. Uh, study set in at the uh, Navaloka Vision Care branch and study design was a cross-sectional observation study and random sampling. Uh, sample size was 100 patients and study instrument I used, trial box, near chart, near accommodative target, retinoscope, Royal Air Force ruler, and Jackson cross cylinder. The inclusion criteria was, uh, that could be male or female, age in between 40 to 60, spherical refractive error uh, in between minus 6 diopter to plus 5 diopter and had astigmatism up to minus 1.5 diopter, required addition mainly, and corrected monocular visual acuity greater than or equal 6.9 plus at distance and near, anisometropia less than 1.5 diopter. The exclusion criteria was uh, without a patient who haven't binocular problem, any history of refractive surgery, strabismic or amblyopia, as well as ocular pathology, systemic disease that could not affect accommodation, fusional versions, and or ocular mortality, as well as medical uh, medication likely to have side effect on accommodation and on fusional versions. Methodology, first, uh, first of all, collected demographic data and comprehensive ophthalmic examination done, uh, subjective refraction done. After that, determine tentative addition power using four tentative methods, such as age-based one, balancing negative and uh, positive accommodation power, and amplitude of accommodation and dynamic retinoscope power. After the collected data, analyze and final uh, results get. The result was, uh, this diopter is showing uh, different in between amplitude of accommodation, tentative addition, and final addition with fi uh, final addition. The x-axis shown uh, amplitude, of amplitude of accommodation, final ad addition, and y-axis uh, show difference in between tentative addition and final addition. Same as like that, the, uh, this uh, graph uh, shows age-dependent one, with, uh, final addition V is different in between tentative addition and final addition. This is the one, uh, balancing negative and positive accommodation power shows one, and x-axis shows uh, BRA final addition, and y-axis shows difference in between tentative addition and final addition. This is the one, dynamic retinoscope method, result graph. The finally, the co uh, coefficients of variation tentative near addition were higher than the final addition for every procedure except for the age expected addition method. These bias were small in clinical terms with the exceptional of the amplitude of accommodation proce procedure. Uh, balancing negative and uh, positive accommodation power and age tentative method is the most effective tentative addition than other two methods. Less bias in uh, balancing in between positive and negative relative accommodation and age tentative addition method than amplitude of accommodation and dynamic retinoscope. This is, this is the summary of uh, results. The, my result discussion was press wipe addition uh, crucial for 35 to 40 patients adjusting result based on uh, preferences. Study assess agreement between tentative addition and final addition aiming for shorter refinement stage. The results show low mean differences between tentative and final addition for all tests with agreement interval ranging from 
0.5 diopter to 0.75 diopter. The dynamic retinoscopy methods tentative addition could be 1.02 diopter higher or lower than the final ad addition prescribed. The dynamic retinoscopy method is somewhat subjective in that it relieves on both the examiners and the patient's corporations to keep the test image clear. It produces highly variable result across subject, reducing the tentative addition's reliability. Conclusion is, mean tentative addition of each method not equal to each other. According to this study, most effective the nearest tentative method is age-based tentative method for prospective final addition determination. Uh, I had uh, more limitations. Uh, some of them, sample size is limited according to the populations and addition power requirement would be different patient to patient. Most of people who include in this age range, they are fulfilled exclusion uh, characteristics such as systemic dis disease, vascular disease, muscular weakness, as well as there can be response bias because of all the tests performed in manually and subjectively. Thank you all of you. Thank you, Asha. Are there any questions from yeah, the judge uh, panel? Yeah, thanks. It's a great talk. Although you mentioned, so do you have any data on the visual acuity or the other subject to parameters with these different? Yes, sir, I had. Oh, which one was the best? So these, uh, the data which you presented based on the addition power. Yes, sir. Uh, subjectively, which one was most preferred by the patients? I didn't get it, sir. Which patient, uh, like patients preferred which type of method? Yeah, patients are most likely age-based methods, sir. So they were comfortable with Yes, that that's the comfortable one. Okay. Thanks. Thank you so much. The next presenter is Kavindya Silva regarding the effectiveness of awareness program of common eye-related diseases in two eye care providing centers, Gaul, Sri Lanka. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Kavindya Silva from Karapitiya branch. Today, I am going to present result of my research of the topic of effectiveness of awareness program on common ocular conditions in two eye care centers, Gaul, Sri Lanka. There are the ocular conditions are common within the general public. Among them, refractive errors, cataract, diabetic retinopathy, and glaucoma are common in Sri Lanka. According to the previous research and clinical experience, the awareness on such conditions is considerably low. Let's take one by one. Refractive errors. Refractive errors are a type of vision problem that makes it hard to see clearly. They happen when the shape of eye keeps light from the focusing correctly on retina. The risk factors are have a family history of refractive errors, people over age 40 years, and also anyone can get refractive errors. The symptoms, blurred, double and hazy vision, see a glare or halos around bright lights, squinting, headache, eye straining, and trouble focusing. Treatments are wear eyeglasses or contact lenses and surgeries. Cataract. A cataract is a cloudy area in the lens of eye. The risk factors are have a serotonin health problem like diabetes, smoke and drink too much alcohol, have a family history of cataract and have a spend a lot of time in the sun. At the first, you may not notice that you have a cataract. After, you can get blurry, hazy, or less colorful vision. The treatment is IOL surgery. Diabetic retinopathy. Diabetic retinopathy is an eye condition that can cause vision loss and blindness in the people who have diabetes. 
it affects blood vessels in the retina the risk factors are anyone with any kind of diabetes can get diabetic retinopathy and women with diabetes who become pregnant at the first you may not notice that you have a diabetic retinopathy and after blurry vision floating spot in your vision and blindness the treatments are prp laser treatment and eye surgery finally it's glaucoma glaucoma is a group of eye disease that can cause vision loss and blindness by damaging optic nerve risk factors are have a family history of glaucoma people over age 60 and people who have high eye pressure as well as well cataract and diabetic retinopathy at the first you may not notice that you have a glaucoma slowly low vision loss vision usually starting with side visions treatments are anti glaucoma medicine and pi laser treatment the main objective of this study to evaluate the awareness level of common ocular conditions and effectiveness of awareness program my specific objectives are to describe awareness level of symptoms risk factors and prevention of selected ocular conditions method my sample size 100 OPD patients time period 1st of April to 31st of May 2023 my locations are Vision Care Optical Private Limited Gold Branch and Ruhun Hospital Karapitiya age group 22 to 87 years both male and female a questionnaire on ocular condition was given to OPD patient who visit Vision Care Optical Private Limited Gold Branch and Ruhun Hospital Karapitiya. After they fill it, we conduct an awareness program. After one week, we call the participants and refill the same questionnaire. Questionnaire form analyzed and graded according to the answers. Examination data recorded and analyzed by using Google form. This is my questionnaire. Now let's look at the results of study. Average age 51.09 years. 45% of population were male. This is the education level of population. 41% of population had any kind of vision problem. Uh, the blue color bar shows the awareness level before conducting the awareness program and the red color bar shows the awareness level after conducting program yet this is the blue color bar shows the knowledge level before conducting awareness program and the red bar shows the knowledge of after conducting program Again, the blue color bar shows the awareness on treatment before conducting awareness program. And the red color bar shows the awareness on treatment after conducting awareness program. Before the program, 25% know the first symptom of cataract, 12% know the glaucoma, and only 3% know about the diabetic retinopathy. After the program, 95% know the first symptom of cataract, 82% know glaucoma, and 75% know about the diabetic retinopathy. Awareness on the importance of eye exam has been increased 100% after conducting the awareness program. This is the answer distribution for the question at what age do you think pair of glasses should be worn? Before the conducting program, only 13% know the correct answer. And after the program, it's 79%. This is the awareness distribution. Sorry. This is the main source of information about ocular condition. 
We can suggest awareness program is best method to raise the awareness about ocular conditions. Discussion. Comparing the South Indian study of knowledge, awareness and pre perception of common eye diseases and eye donation among people seeking health care in hospital South India done by Ishwa and Jerby in year 2022. The knowledge on cataract and glaucoma, sorry, cataract and refractive errors is higher and the knowledge on glaucoma and diabetic retinopathy is considerably low within both populations. Therefore, we would recommend that conduct the awareness program on ocular condition to raise the awareness. Conclusion. Although loss of vision was reported as a major medical concern, there is a little understanding of the risk factors for different ocular conditions. Out of selected ocular condition, majority of the population are aware about refractive errors and cataract. And the awareness on diabetic retinopathy and glaucoma is considerably low. After conducting the program, the awareness participants has been increased significantly. My recommendation, I suggest that innovative multilingual awareness program in primary and secondary schools are needed to improve knowledge, attitude, and practice about ocular condition. I suggest that to increase the knowledge about ocular condition by conducting awareness program on the most prevalent ocular conditions and distributing leaflets to the patient who visit ophthalmologist. Finally, I suggest that display posters about ocular conditions in patient's waiting area. These are my references. Thank you. Thank you, Kavindya. Are there any questions from the judge panel? Well, it's a good study. And uh, I would suggest uh, if you could have increased the uh, population, you could have 100, yeah. 100, 100 participants, right? Yes, sir. So these, these are very common conditions. So you could have easily increased the population, study population, so where you can generalize your results, right? So you could have easily generalized your results to the, I mean, generalization. The, the purpose of doing a research or a study is to do, finally, generalize your results, right? Mm. So, 100 participants, I suggest, it would have been much better yeah. if you could have part, uh, recruited about 500 participants because these are very common conditions, glaucoma, yeah. diabetic retinopathy, easily you could have caught uh, 500 participants. So, I suggest that. So, it's a good topic, good topic. Uh, and uh, another thing, you gave a one week gap with yes, the sir. questionnaire. Yeah. And how did you manage to get the 100 participants to participate again and uh, get the same feedback? Uh, the first day, the awareness program, I get their contact numbers. Mm -hmm. And after one week, uh, I, I will call them and contact him. So uh, you asked them to come back and. Uh, no, sir. Uh, within the phone call, I fill the, refill the questionnaire form. So by yourself. Initially, it was a uh, subject-based questionnaire, and it was then, then at the second time it was a uh, research, research based. Administer based. Yeah, administer based. At the second time, the second time the questionnaire was filled by yourself. Yes. At the first instant, it was by the patient. Yes. Sir. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Kavindya. The next presenter is Pyumika Mihirani, a pilot study of behavior of the myopic correction during the presbyopic years. Good evening to you all. Uh, I am Pyumika Mihirani uh, from K Gold Branch. Uh, 
uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, a small part of one of the uh, most discussed, uh, studied and research topics, myopia. Uh, to add a little more to this vast topic, uh, let me share my study with you all. A pilot study of behavior of the myopic correction during the presbyopic years. So, uh, as an introduction, uh, we, as we all know, myopia has become a growing public health concern, especially in Asian countries. While the changes in myopic correction during the childhood and adolescence are well documented, a little is known um, about the behavior of the myopic correction during the presbyopic years, despite the fact that ocular refraction can prog uh, progress throughout the life. Uh, previous studies have produced uh, trajectory results with some showing a hyperopic shift during the age of presbyopia, and the others uh, demonstrating a myopic shift. Thus, the further research is uh, needed to understand the behavior of the myopic correction during the presbyopic years. As we all know, myopia, or uh, the, in other words, nearsightedness, as it is medically terms, is a visual uh, vision condition in which people can see the close objects uh, clearly, but the object farther away appeared blurred. Uh, myopia occurs if the eyeball is too long or the cornea is too curved. As a result, the light entering the eye isn't focused correctly and distant objects looks blurred. While the exact cause of myopia is unknown, the, there is a significant evidence that many people inherit myopia or at least the tendency to develop myopia. Uh, presbyopia is defined as the gradual inability of, uh, to focus near objects on the retina due to insufficient accommodative ability following the increasing age and the loss of elasticity in the crystalline lens. A variety of factors are involved in including hardening of the lens, changes in the elasticity of the lens capsule, lens dimension, geometrically of sonial attachments and ciliary muscle contraction. However, it is unknown how much each factor is responsible for, the, for this loss of accommodative ability. Due to the growing aging population, most of our population will spend roughly half of uh, their lives as presbyope. The onset of presbyope is therefore which is generally considered to take place somewhere between 38 to 45 years of age, depending on the factors such as patient distance, refractory error, and amount of near work, while trauma, systemic diseases, and drug side defects are other common modifiable risk factors for premature presbyopia. So uh, objective of my study was uh, is to investigate the behavior of the myopic correction during the presbyopic years between 39 to 40 year, 48 years in healthy individuals in myopia. Justification. Previous studies have produced contradictory results with some showing a hyperopic shift during the age of presbyopia and others demonstrating a myopic shift. Thus, the further research is needed to understand the behavior of myopic correction during the presbyopic years. Uh, procedure. Uh, my study design was cross-sectional cross study. We, uh, it was carried out at Vision Care Optical uh, Private Limited, Main Street, Kegol. Uh, time span was May 22 to March 22 to 23. Uh, participant was 50 healthy Sri Lankan adults between the age of 39 to 48 years. Uh, the preliminary examination was conducted by using the dry refraction uh, and the auto refractor. Uh, data analyzed, uh, all the data was recorded and analyzed in MS Excel. The spherical equivalent of each participant previous and current prescription was recorded and refractive error differences were documented in dioptric values. Refractive data were collected using the electromedical records uh, in Vision Care uh, toll pit system. Uh, it should be noted that all the participants had normal posterior segments with no recorded ocular or systemic diseases. Uh, my result. Result, a mean age of the study group was 43 years. Uh, gender distribution was female to male, third, uh, 3 into 2. 43% uh, of participants showed no change of myopic refractive error at the, uh, during the uh, age of presbyopia. 20% showed reduction of myopic refraction error, refractive error. Z value was minus 3.9199 and the P value uh, was 0 0.0008. Uh, and uh, whereas 37 uh, percent uh, showed increase of myopic refractive error, Z value was minus 5.3028 and P value was 0 0.0001. Uh, 
in this diagram it shows the uh, refractor refraction uh, are prescription changes uh, it means hyperopic shift uh, means that uh, at the age of the pest myopia how the myopic correction was reduced uh, x-axis shows the number of myopic eyes examined and the y-axis shows spherical equivalent in diopters so uh, red uh, green sorry and a uh, blue color shows the uh, previous uh, spherical equivalent and the red color uh, shows the uh, present uh, uh, present uh, prescriptions uh, spherical equivalent we are as the this is how the myopia uh, myopic correction uh, increased the, at the edge of the press myopia uh, same like before uh, x, x axis shows numbers of number of myopic eyes and the y axis shows spherical equivalent in diopters uh, this is the my end result uh, the present, first uh, column says the percentage of hyper of shift shift uh, second one 30 percent of uh, percentage of myopic shift and 43 point uh, showed percentage of no change so my conclusion is uh, during the occurrence of press biopia in myops majority of, uh, of the population showed no change in the study group uh, significant changes was noted in both reduction and increasing of myopic refractive error however the increasing of myopic refractive error was strongly significant uh, discussion the st study says that there is a hyperopic shift during the presbyopic years but according to my study there is a significant myopic shift during the presbyopic years uh, this is my reference thank you all for your kind attention thank you Piyumika are there any questions from the judge panel yes. any any confounding factors you found during this study Sorry? Any confounding factors you found during the study? I don't get you. <laughs> any, 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 any other significant factors affecting the myopic or hyperopic shift? Uh, yeah, the, the, because that uh, some, sometimes the, the party seven words, uh, I mean, we are sometimes uh, they came with, uh, they have already, they have refractive error, I mean, myopic correction, but sometimes they have not wearing glasses properly. Uh, when we when when they come to us so at that time that some uh, results uh, showed that uh, uh, vision, vision especially in the vision uh, some uh, amblyopic uh, eyes uh, I, I was uh, i found uh, uh, due to that not wearing constantly the previous glasses did you consider the presence of cataract or not uh, no sir uh, i it, that was the uh, excluding criteria criteria uh, I uh, so assumed and I uh, assumed that uh, posterior segment was okay in every uh, participant no, and no, then no. That's did, <laughs> did, did, you. Did, did you consider the presence of nuclear sclerosis or cataract in these patients or did you just exclude the patients who had cataract no uh, I just examination uh, the, because uh, in the in prime we are primary I can so I, I I didn't have a sit lamp to examine the posterior segment I used the uh, ophthalmoscope and retinoscope to just to analyze the posterior chamber chamber so uh, I found there are no any significant cataract or like other uh, retinal uh, diseases Our last presentation of this session is a comparison of stereoacuity in patients with anisometropia, isometropia, and emetropia by Udani Fernando. Good evening everyone, I am Udani Fernando. Today I am going to present about the comparison of stereoacuity in patients with anisometropia, isometropia and emetropia. Emetropia. Emetropia is simply considered to be the normal refractive state of the eye with no corrective lenses such as glasses. Emetropia is the state of the eye where income in the light is precisely focus when the retina, when is, eye is at rest. Anisometropia. Anisometropia is a condition 
which the refractive error or the degree of nearsightedness, farsightedness or astigmatism in one eye is significantly different from the other. This can cause the two eyes to focus the light differently. Isometropia. Isometropia is condition in which both eyes have the same refractive error or degree of farsightedness, nearsightedness or astigmatism. Stereopsis. Stereopsis, also known as the depth perception or binocular depth perception, refers to the ability of the human visual system to perceive the distance between the object in three-dimensional spaces. It relies on the fact that each eye sees a slightly different image of the same scene due to the distance between the two eyes. The brain processes the, these two slightly different images and combines them to a create single three-dimensional perception of the scene. This allows humans to accurate the judge relative to the distance of objects. Depth perception is provided by means of the binocular disparity of the images in the two eyes. Objective of this uh, objective of this study is comparison of the stereoacuity in patients with anisometropia, isometropia, and emetropia. Method: The study was conducted on 150 males and females within the age group 5 to 30 years between the time period of 1st of January 2023 to 30th of April 2023 at Vision Care Panadur. Individuals with anisometropia more than one diopter, isometropia and emetropia with clear media were included in the study. Anisometropia was considered as an interocular difference of more than one diopter in spherical equivalent. Patients with media opacities having ocular deviation, non-centric fixation were excluded from the study. Procedure. The study was carried out, 150 subjects were selected according to convenience sampling, examination performs, uncorrected visual acuity, subjective and objective refraction, best corrected visual acuity using Shinnipon Accurate FK900, Snellen chart and the near reading chart. Stereoacuity was assessed using the Frisbee stereo test. Patients were asked to wear their best refractive correction before the test and the test was done before the pupillary dilation. Considering the best stereoacuity as 40 sec of arc and the worst stereoacuity as 600 sec of arc. Results. The average age group of participants was 19.5 plus or minus 0.94 years. There were males 48.1% and 51.9% females in the study. First chart shows the participation variation in anisometropic group according to their refractive error. 29% in myopia, 34% in myopic astigmatism, 20% in hyperopia, 17% in hyperopic astigmatism. The second chart shows the participation variation in anisometropic group according to the degree of anisometropia, 44% mild, less than 3 diopters, 36% moderate between the 3 diopters and 6, six diopters, 20% severe, more than six diopters. As you can see, the average stereoacuity in emetropic group was 47.5 plus or minus 1.1 sec of arc, represented in blue, the best level of stereoacuity. The average stereoacuity in isometropic group was 117.5 plus or minus 9.6 sec of arc represent in red color, mid-range of stereoacuity. Average stereoacuity in anisometropic group was 342.5 plus or minus 108.3 sec of arc represent in the green. 
worst radioactivity than the other categories. The average stereoacuity according to the refractive condition of the anisometropic group was as follows. 583.12 sec of arc in myops, 476.08 sec of arc in myopic astigmatism, 318.21 sec of arc in hyperopic astigmatism, 178.05 sec of arc in hyperopes. As you can see, this shows the stereoacuity comparison with the degree of anisometropia. Orange color represents the severe degree of anisometropia, more than 6 diopter. It has the severe re reduction in stereoacuity. Purple color represents the moderate degree of anisometropia, 3 diopters to 6 diopters. It has mid-range of stereoacuity. Red color represents the mild anisometropic group, less than 3 diopters. It has better range of stereoacuity than the other categories. This shows the stereoacuity comparison among amblyops and non amblyops As you can see the graph, stereoacuity was in amblyops as non amblyops Conclusion, the level of stereoacuity was worst in anisometropia as compared to isometropia and emetropia. Among the anisometropia, it was, it was found to be the poorest in myopia followed by myopic astigmatism, hyperopic astigmatism, and hyperopia. Stereoacuity decreases as the degree of anisometropia increases. Amblyops has a great reduction in stereoacuity than non amblyops These are my references. Thank you. Thank you, Udani. Dear judges, are there any questions to the presenter? Good, uh, thanks, Th uh, good presentation. A uh, quick question. Uh, how many of those uh, subjects were amblyops? 30% average. 30% 30 of 30 them were amblyops. So, because especially for that severe uh, anisometropia, as per your definition, yes, were they corrected with contact lenses or spectacles? Some of them are contact lenses, but uh, some patients were uh, corrected uh, since the childhood, so they they can tolerate the spectacle correction also. Okay, thanks. Thank you, sir. After graduating at University of Sri Jayawardenepura as an MBBS graduate. Completed her basic surgical and medical training at Sri Jayawardenepura General Hospital. Then she obtained her MD in Otorhinolaryngology from Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, Colombo, and continued in a higher surgical training in ENT, Otorhinolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery at Newcastle upon Teen, UK during this period. She has obtained higher surgical skills in bone anchored hearing implant and also completed DOHNS postgraduate ENT exam. She was appointed to the consultant staff at the Ministry of Health in 2014 and worked as a consultant ENT and head and neck surgeon at General Hospital Vaunia for a period of two years. Outside of clinical practice, she has a passion for medical education. She is a senior lecturer at the Faculty of Medicine, General Sir John Kotalawal Defence University, and at the moment, working as the consultant ENT and head and neck surgeon at University Hospital KDU. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to invite Dr. Mrs. Vasantika Estudurge to deliver the keynote speech. Okay. 
Right. Good afternoon, everybody. I think you all can hear me. Yes. So why did I ask you? That means uh, you can hear me means you have been privileged with good hearing, near or near normal hearing. So in the world, even though you and me can hear this, there are a portion of people who cannot hear a single word from birth or later on as a progressive disease. So as healthcare workers, you and me are involved in treating these patients in different ways, as a doctor and maybe as uh, you all as optometrist or uh, sometimes in diff different ways, you all are helping. But are we happy? Have we achieved our targets? Is that our patients are happy? Are they happy with our outcome, as an outcome, what we are supplying? So this is a little question for us to think. So I'm going to discuss a little bit about the new modalities of he treating hearing loss. So ear actually is a cosmetic thing. I think we all are happy with whatever most of the time with our appearance, especially ladies. Uh, that's why we are wearing earrings. That's why we are wearing extra piercing. So ear has a cosmetic benefit as well. At the same time, ear is an organ which gives us the hearing. So actually, ear has three parts. What are they? They have the outer ear, middle ear, and ear, inner ear. So all these parts are very important for us to hear this. So today we are a little bit more concentrating about the inner ear. So inner ear has two parts. Actually, it's a bony part and the membranous part. So this inner ear, on top of that, has different parts for hearing and balance. So that's why I think one of the research they were talking about vertigo. I think that is also related to this. So this vestibular part or balance part looked after the balance of our body. But the cochlea is the area which is responsible for our hearing. So cochlea actually is a spiral shaped fluid filled structure which is normally about 2.5 to 2.75 turns around the sin, which has a central pyramid, which is called the modulus. So if you can see in this picture, that's a cochlea we are going to talk or concentrate today more about. Right, I told you it's a tube. This tube has been divided into three parts. You can see this is a cross-section of the cochlea, which has been turning around inside our ear, which has been divided into three parts. What are they? They are called scala vestibuli, scala media, and scala tympani. You can see it's like something going around in the central midline portion, which is called modulus. So if we look into this cochlea a little bit more, you can see, uh, I told you, tube has been divided into three parts. So in these three parts, you can see scala vestibuli in the topmost part, and scala tympani, the most lowest part, those are filled with fluids. So midline is actually called the scala media, so M is standing for media, which has the hearing organ. So this is a more magnified view where what we are talking about. You can see the scala vestibuli, you can see the scala tympani at the lower part, and you can see the scala media in the middle. So that's the part where our hearing organ is there. So the organ of hearing is called organ of corti. So that actually is located in the cochlea, as I told you. The receptors or the, the 
the area where the sounds are being going into is called receptors are the hair cells. I think some of you might have heard about, but for somebody else, maybe it's a new thing. So these are called hair cells, just like our hair. There are cells with tiny hairs on it. And there's a gel-like membrane that is called tectorial membrane. So that is the one of the other important area on our organ of coating. So cochlear nerve, which is the area, which is the one which is transmitting our hearing, is, co is attached to these hair cells. I think you all are clear with what I'm talking about. And these cochlear nerves finally goes into the temporal bone, that is the final destination of our impulses, that is from where you process the talk that I'm doing today. So your temporal lobe area may be very active, hopefully at the moment. So this is a very magnified view of the organ of to, uh, Corti, which I told you. You can see the hair cells with the tiny hairs on top of that. You can see the cochlear nerve or the auditory nerve fibers are starting from these hair cells. And you can see the bacillar membrane where the hair cells are sitting on. You can see the tectorial membrane where I talked to you before. Is that the area of uh, gel-like membrane. So how are we going to hear, how are we hearing all these things? How, how these impulses, now I'm talking here, but you are hearing in your brain and mind. So how this happens? This sound waves comes to your external ear and then from there it goes to the tympanic membrane. From there it goes to the tiny small bones in the inner ear, uh, sorry, middle ear. And the vibration of these small bones transmit sound waves into the inner ear. This is the process of external part. So I have seen, shown in that picture, you can see the last bone of the middle ear is called the stapes. When it is vibrating inside the middle ear, I told you the scala vestibuli has fluid on it. So that fluid layer vibrates. So it's the sound wave vibrating your, your inner ear fluid. From there, the organ of corti, the tectorial membrane also vibrates. So this tectorial membrane actually end, you have the hair cells. So th when they are, it is migrate, my, uh, moving, the hair cells get the impulses or distortion. So that's how the sound transmit. So during this transmission of the sound, we have the mechanical conduction where the conductive apparatus like our pinna, ear canal, and the middle ear evaluates. And then you have the transduction of mechanical energy to the electrical energy. So this mechanical energy, where I, which is coming out from my mouth, should go into your brain. It cannot be grown into the e brain as a mechanical energy. So that need to be transmitted into electric energy, which is the action of the cochlear system. So once this is energy being transmitted into electrical impulses, the neural pathway will carry it into your brain and brain will evaluate the impulses and that's how my voice comes into your brain. So this is again a summarization of what we have been talking. You can see the step is foot plate movements, it comes to the oval window, and from there it goes to the perilymp or the fluid in the scala vestibuli. From there the bacillar membrane on moves and the organ of corti moves. And then you get the tectorial membrane and hair cell movements. So the distortion of the hair cells will produce cochlear microphones which transmit into the nerve impulses. So this is from where onwards, which I'm not going to discuss further, but it looks very complicated and it is complicated too. And that's from the auditory nerve up to the brain. So as I told you, millions of people are suffering hearing loss in the world. 
So there are two types mainly, that's the conductive hearing loss and the sensory neural hearing loss. So the conductive hearing loss means there is pathway of conduction of sound from mechanical way has got some disability, which is out of our talk today. The sensory neural hearing is where the peripheral nerve pathway or very rarely central nerve pathway has got affected. Mainly the hair cell problem is the majority of the patients are having. So, what are we going to do with these patients? If it is a sensory neural hearing loss of moderate or severe disability, we all are prescribing hearing aids. So that's the solution we have got. There are different types of hearing aids. Obviously, I think you all are better, knowing better than me. So we prescribe them and patients are benefited most of the time. But if it is profound hearing loss, cochlear implant is the solution at the moment. But if you go through the literature, most of the people agreed with us. Now, for individuals with profound sensory neural hearing loss, a cochlear implant is the sole option for hearing rehabilitation. While the development of the cochlear implant has been remarkable, the pro prognosis of these individuals received an implant plant is still variable, and even with the best outcome, normal hearing is not restored. This is everybody agreed at the moment. So therefore, patients with severe sensory hearing loss world will, would alternative strategies to overcome their problem. So, few of the facts we are knowing. So, most of the sensory neural hearing loss, the primary pathology is the loss of mechanical sensory hearing hair cells located within the organ of corti. I discussed with you all organ of corti and hair cells. So, most of our patients are suffering from loss of hair cells in organ of corti. Mammals' hair cells are only generated during the relatively brief period of embryogenesis. This is one of the problems we are facing. Once in mammals, once they are born, there won't be any neural tissue regeneration. So that's one of the problems we are facing at the moment. And birds and other vertebrates have been shown to add O regenerate their hair cells and auditory function throughout their lives. So if I've been a bird, this problem shouldn't have been there. Additional experiments demonstrate that these regenerated hair cells arise from population of stem or progenitor cells that reside within the sensory epithelium. So this is the important fact. So these regenerated hair cells are being regenerated from stem cells. So this is the hitting point, so where they have looked into the regeneration of hair cells by stem cell replant. So what are these stem cells? Actually, stem cells have two main characteristics. They are self-renewal and ability to differentiate into tissue-specific cell types. So these are the important facts for cell transplant. So these stem cells have the ability to regenerate and, and re differentiate into different cell types. So actually blastocytes in our embryo are totipotent, that means they have the possibility of differentiating into different cells. They are origin from the same cell, but in line they are differentiating into different organs. So our brain, our heart, our liver, kidney, all are being differentiated by a one cell, actually two cells, which comes from mother and father, and divide, combine into make a one cell. From this cell, all these organs are being produced. So, this totipotent is lost, or the ability to differentiate is being lost in first few cell divisions and continue to divide to give rise to additional cells that will become progressively restricted ultimately into specific cells. So when they are dividing into li in lines at one point, they, dis they, they, they 
they lost their ability to differentiate into different cell lines. So this cell line will go into lungs, this cell line will go into heart, and this cell line will go into our ear. This is how we are being made. Once these cells are fully differentiated, they are no longer considered stem cells, and they cannot be differentiated into different types. So one important thing they have realized is adult tissue-specific stem cells are small cell populations that reside in somatic tissue. So we talked about the embryo. Now an adult like you and me, there are some cells which we can make into different cell types in regeneration. So they are called adult tissue-specific stem cells. So one example is our bone marrow has hemopoietic stem cells. I think some of you might have heard hemopoietic stem cells which we can use and generate different blood cells right, throughout our life. So that is why I think the bone transplantation has gone so far in the early stages. Tissue-specific stem cells have been identified in brain, lung, and liver tissue with highly variable regenerative ability. So these are the areas which have gone through so far. So one of the interesting, uh, important research finding was expression of only one, only four genes, which is mentioned here, is sufficient to induce pluripotency in many different adult cell types. I, I assume you can understand what I'm talking about. So these, in our body, there are cell types which can be differentiated into different cell types even though we are adult. So they actually, on some of the research have found, by expression, by inducing expression of these four genes, we can make these cell types into differentiated cell types. So that is the rationale of our stem cell transplant. So these induced pluripotent stem cells can technically be created from any individual. So you and me all are having these cells which can be induced to make different cell lines. These cells the, from those induced pluripotent cell cells can be transplanted back into the same patient, person. So that is interesting because our main problem of transplantation is immunological reaction. So if we can use the same person cells, so immunological reaction will be absent. So these IPCs provide the potential to use fibroblast from any individual. So fibroblasts are actually stem cells, which we all are carrying. So what they say is these fibroblasts can be used as induced pluripotent stem cells to replace cell types that could be transplanted back into the same person. So these stem cells, what is being created outside in the research area, will be introduced into the ear via the tympanic membrane or transmembrane method to the ear inside. So here we have shown now it will be now at the moment all this research, all these things are at research level. So there are a lot to do, but at, what I wanted was to introduce you the basics or what is the rationale of this stem cell therapy, which is going to come to us in future. So these can be used to regenerate functional hair cells. Some, some of the research articles are there. Uh, and to develop spiral ganglion cells also. Now what they have shown in research articles are we can develop these functional hair cells, but the functionality is still a question. So we can, and these hair, hair cells will be developed but whether they are going to function as our normal ear and whether they are going to restore our hearing back is a question yet. So although there is still much work to be done, we believe that the future of the stem, stem cell therapy is bright. So I assume in near future, you and me will be a 
will be in the same health professional care giving this type of treatments to our patients, hopefully, maybe down the line, I don't know how many years, but we are awaiting for that. Thank you very much. Madam, kindly remain on the stage to accept this token of appreciation from our chairman, Mr. Dasanta Fonseca. Before starting the session, I kindly request Dr. Mrs. Vasantika Estudoge to be seated on the judge panel. Our first pres presentation is on association between gender and the degree of daily life fatigue by Samir Sandun. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Samira Sarachandra. I am an audiometrician in Vision Care, Valavata. Uh, my research topic is association between gender and the degree of daily life fatigue. Daily life fatigue. Uh, these are the contents. Introduction. Ministry of Health shows that 90% 19% of the total population of Sri Lanka suffer from some sort of hearing disorder. Fatigue is regularly described as a comorbid within the population of hearing impairment. Fatigue can be de uh, derived to extreme tiredness resulting from mental and physical ex exertion or illness. When hearing loss is present, the brain has comp compensated for the loss and work harder than before the process to same information causing stress on the brain and finally fatigue. Justification. Though hearing impairment is linked to increased fatigue, yet little is known about the real world impact of this fatigue. Studies consistently find gender the differences in curtain measurement of health such as uh, an anxiety, depression, and some physical illnesses. So it is uh, vital to find out the relationship between listening, fatigue, and gender. Identify the individual scores for the listening fatigue can help to direct for early inventions. Ob my object objective. My objective to identify the association between gender and the degree of the daily life fatigue and among individuals with hearing loss. Methodology. An analytical cross-sectional study in corrupted uh, 14 patients like 20 females and 20 males reporting the hearing loss who visit the Vision Care Hearing Solution, Colombo District, includes as the study population. Study instrument. Short, shortened version of Vanderbilt fatigue scales, adult questionnaire used as the study instrument. This questionnaire helped to understand how communication with others and just listening can be physically, mentally, and emotionally tiring. Uh, this is the Vanderbilt fat fatigue scale adult version, 10 items. These are my questionnaires. Uh, inclusion criteria. Adult patient age between 40 
to eight years. Uh, parents, patients reports it in moderate to severe sensory neural hearing loss, not using hearing aids yet. Exclusion criteria, pediatric and young patients, patient reporting to minimal to mild hearing losses. Analysis. Single factor ANOVA analysis using SPSS software used to analyze the data. These are the result. Uh, results. Out of 40 marks of scores, male participations scored an average of 24.5. 3 while females scored 28.75 respectively. It's indicated that females perceive more fatigue in listening relative to males. According to the single factor ANOVA analysis, there is a significant difference between the gender and the scores of the Vanderbilt structure with AP value of 0 0.00718. Conclusion. The result of a study shows that listening related fatigue can be significant the burden for the adult with hearing loss in both genders. As a scores obtains greater than 50% of the scale which means the they become fatigued more often. So both the male and females with hearing loss requires solution to overcome their daily life challenges in listening situation. However, females perceive more listening fatigue than males so that we needed to give more attention toward females in order to refer for early inventions. Intuitive approach to the management of fatigue is the use of applications devices. Study by Honsabi 2013 provided evidence to suggest that hearing aid use may reduce susceptibility to fatigue resulting from sustained listening demand in the adult. Problem is in problems in listening Fatigue many further minimized for through the use of special hearing technologies such as a binaural fitting, directional microphones, and use the hearing assistant technology system. These are my references. Any questions? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. If I ask you to give a chance to improve your research, anything you can think of, how are you going to improve? Sorry? If you want, if I ask, I will give you a chance to improve your research, anything you can do further. Uh. Was there any, now, this is what, like a cross section, right? Yeah. And have you evaluate pre and post or? No, ma'am, it's a post. If I uh, give you a chance, uh, is, isn't that a good suggestion? Uh, suggestion means it's a, uh, I'm uh, using this to uh, using this topic, it's actually it's not, this topic it's not uh, talk, uh, research, it's research is less. That's why I uh, suggest to do that. And the other thing is, uh, I'm using uh, the uh, collecting samples in our Kalambu district. I want to uh, improve the in uh, uh, our whole country. Yes, at the same time, think about now, uh, you, are, you are going to probably do interventions of hearing aids or something, no? Yeah, ma'am. If you can evaluate the same sample after intervening, whether there is any improvement of your fatigability. So that will be much better, I suppose. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Samira.
and our next presentation is on comparing the social hearing handicap experience between hearing aid candidates and hearing aid users at Vision Care Hearing Solutions by Isa Sabir. Good evening everybody, I am Isa Sabir from MOD Administration from Mission Care. Today I would like to present my uh, research on comparing the social hearing handicap experiences between hearing aid candidates and hearing aid users at Vision Care Hearing Aid Hearing Solutions. Please allow me to move on with my introduction. Hearing aid fitting is one of the first essential stages in process of auditory rehabilitation which concentrates on many other aspects such as learning of communication strategies and adaptation to the acoustical environment. Numerous senior citizens visit our vision care hearing solutions each day to have their hearing sensitivity evaluated. This study compares the improvement of hearing aid users' quality of life using the social hearing handicap index. Let's move on to my objectives. My general objective is to compare the social hearing handi handicap experiences between hearing aid candidates and hearing aid users. Hearing aid candidates who have been recommended to use hearing aids but still have not complied and the hearing aid users who are using the hearing aids using the social hearing handicaps index. My specific objective is to compare the hearing aid candidates and the hearing aid users social handicap hearing experiences. Let's have a look at my methodology. This study is a descriptive cross-sectional study done in Vision Care he uh, branches in Colombo area. I used a purposive sampling method with 100 clients between ages 40 and 60 years of age. I used the social hearing handicap index and my uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria are the inclusion criteria. Unilateral uh, hearing aid users, meaning the hearing aid users, are still at the moment using hearing aids only for one of the years. And also, they, all my participants have sensory neuron hearing, hearing loss with either mild degree, moderate degree, or moderately severe degree. My exclusion criteria is my participants have no medically uh, uh, surgically treatable ear disease or retrocochlear pathology and fluctuating or progressive hearing loss. The hearing aid users have, uh, they have to uh, pay participants who have less than uh, three months of experience have been excluded from this uh, research. And the participants have only hearing handicap and no other handicaps. I used a self-administrative questionnaire and I used the SPSS24 version software for the data analysis. I would like to share with you the social hearing handicap index used for the research. These are the 20 questions with the standard five record scale to score the results of the uh, participants. Let's move on to the results. First, I would like to show the demographic details of the participants based on their age. I have 19 participants in the age of 40 to 45 years of age, 32 participants between 46, 50 years of age, 24 participants between 51 and 55 years of age, 25 participants between 56 and 60 years of age. I would also like to share with you the participants based on the agenda. I have 54 male participants and 46 female participants. So let's focus on figure one. The mean comparison of hearing handicap between hearing aid candidates who have been recommended to use hearing aids and still have not complied and the hearing aid users. According to the figure one, the candidates have a higher handicap mean score compared to the hearing aid users. Moving on to figure two, the mean comparison of hearing aid handicap with the duration of hearing loss. According to figure two, there is no significant mean difference based on the duration of the hearing loss and the hearing handicap. Let us move on to figure three. The mean comparison of hearing handicap with the duration of the hearing aid usage. So here we can see the client, the, my clients who have been using hearing aids for more than 12 months have a lower handicap level than my clients who have been using hearing aids for less than 12 months. So in this point, we only compared up to 12 months and above all in one category. But if, of course, if the, uh, the duration, if they use it for even longer, they will have a significant benefit as well as if they can uh, then using for less period and as long as they're consistent with their usage of the hearing aids. 
Moving on to table to comparing the social hearing handicap between the hearing aid candidates and the hearing aid users. According to the above table, p-value is less than 0.05. Therefore, there is a statistically significant difference between the hearing aid users and the hearing aid candidates in a 95% confidence interval. This study found that the social hearing handicap statistically significantly more in hearing aid candidates who are not using the hearing aid compared to the hearing aid users. Moving on to the discussion. One study in 1973 discovered a significant connection, 90% between the social hearing handicap index and the degree of hearing handicap. This study also found a strong relationship between the hearing aid candidates and the hearing aid users regarding the social hearing handicap. However, the social hearing handicap index has changed since, and uh, some studies use this to determine the social handicap level associated, associated with hearing loss. Finally, let us move to the conclusion of my research. The researcher was able to examine the social hearing handicap association between the hearing aid candidates and the hearing aid users using this outcome of this investigation. Hearing aid candidates experienced uh, sev several obstacles in their lives as a result of hearing impairment. Nevertheless, the hearing aid users may overcome these situations and enhance their quality of life by using hearing aids. Hearing care specialists will be able to detect common facts and adapt our trial methods for hearing aids for hearing, for, uh, hearing aids uh, using this knowledge as well as addressing hearing aid users' issues and propose technological, technologically varied solutions. Finally, it will be feasible to show how hearing solution, hearing loss affects a person's lifestyle and how an amplification device might improve it. These are my references. Thank you very much. Thank you, Isa Sabir. Are there any questions from the judge uh, panel? Yes. It was a self-administered questionnaire, right? Yes, doctor. Uh, so it was in English. Did you translate it into native? Yes, language? Yeah, I translated it to the customers. If they were unable, I, of course, I aided them with uh, filling the questionnaire. Yeah, I would suggest if you are using that type of questionnaire, you have to pre-translate it and validate into two languages, single and Tamil in Sri Lanka, obviously. So then you can use it uh, in the questionnaire. Otherwise, you have to make it into an administrator or the, yourself, you have to build the questionnaire if it is in English. Okay, thank, thank you. you Good much, presentation. Thank you. thank you very much, Doctor. And our next presentation is on effect of directional strategy on audibility of sounds in the environment for varying hearing loss CVAT, a study of hearing solution Colombo district by Lakshita Veera Kodi. Good evening, everyone. Okay, nowadays we are using a mobile phones. Everyone engaged with the social media marketing. So social media is not a media, is that a key to listen, engage, and the build the relationship. This is my topic, influence of social media marketing, increasing the hearing solutions brand awareness in Colombo district. The study based on uh, Vision Care Audiology Division. Uh, I'm Veera Kodi Lakshita, located in a Vision Care head office. Okay, let's move on to the, my slides. When I talk about the background of the research problem, uh, actually, after the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the health crisis has prompted uh, illness and the isolations. So that changed people's behavior. In fact, in on their feeling, social relationship as well. So, and that time, digital technology has been played a main role to uh, decrease their stress and they more engage with the social media marketing, such as FB, Twitter, YouTube, and other social media platforms have grown rapidly in this, uh, that few decades, few uh, years. Creating brand awareness, managing to keep customers willing to engage and the attracting so much attention to the companies is quite difficult task to that days. Uh, according to the whole week, 
and 2019, the, they have proven the section of the people on social media opens up the new avenue for the company to achieve its goal. And also the, my main target is to elaborate the main expectation of my studies in which gives the influence of social media marketing, how we can increase the hearing solutions brand awareness. In here, as a brand awareness, I would like to say, we are providing the hearing testing, hearing aids, hearing related accessories, uh, as well as the every accessory which is related to the ear which we are providing. We'll move on to the, my uh, research problem. Centric research problem uh, which allocate the, toward the open-ended statement, statement as to the direct reflection of the key uh, research problem, providing the open-ended space to investigate on the conceptual logic in the provided research epidemic by the research. As the research, below key statement is used as the main declaration which is pertinent to the attribute toward the centric research design. What is the impact of social media marketing on increasing hearing solutions brand awareness? When move on to the research question, this is my research question, influence of social media marketing on increasing hearing solutions brand awareness in Colombo district. My specific objects are to identify the social media marketing factors that influencing brand awareness, uh, to identify the key factors to enhance the brand awareness in terms of customer view of point. Uh, of course, it's of and significantly to myself to get the more knowledge and get the more scope on this research and also the reader highlight the different ways to influence the social media marketing in Vision Care Hearing Solutions to increase the hearing solutions brand awareness. Furthermore, uh, look at the how theoretical framework of the social media platforms effect of relation between the business and customer after the product is well known. Uh, to the company, actually in the Colombo district branches about their weaves on their social media campaign, how to promote the vision care hearing solution by, offered by us actually. Uh, to the industry, uh, to see if they have any useful of devote to the social media marketing increase to the companies, customers, and keep current ones. Lastly, the researcher's task is, my task is enhance the knowledge and systematic is, is skill to understand the proper solutions for the specific issues in our organization. Okay, uh, this is my review uh, uh, of literature. Uh, I have gone through the branding with the social media marketing entertainment feature, how we can uh, en enhance the entertainment feature to the social media marketing interaction and customization feature, as well as the electronic word of mouth feature, friendliness feature. Okay, this is my methodology and the conceptual framework. Uh, as the independent dependent variable, I selected hearing solutions brand. So as I mentioned earlier, there are several things we are doing in a hearing solution. Uh, independent variables as the features, social media marketing features, entertainment, customization, interaction, electronic word of mouth, uh, trendiness. We'll move on to the research design. Uh, actually, the purpose of studies held to be explorative. Uh, the main approach is considered to be deductive. The investigation based on the influence of social media marketing is my topic. Uh, uh, the unit analysis uh, connected to the Likert scale questionnaire based on analysis. Uh, the selected time is horizontal, cross-sectional. Uh, according to the uh, methodology, research method uh, versus quantitative method, you can see uh, research approach, deductive approach, population among the customer, vision care, optical services here in department, Colombo district, uh, sample size 18 customers, data collection was done by primary data, online questionnaire, direct questionnaire, uh, data collection, secondary data, e-books, journal, website, previous research studies, and the company uh, records has been evaluated. Okay, when move on to the sampling, the selected sampling were convenient sampling where that we can use the below key uh, month basics. Uh, so respond, uh, respondent cluster chosen on the random basic with the total uh, valuation of the magnitude of the sampling being the com uh, compared to a 
using the Morgan formula, and also the, as the result, such, uh, such development is sufficient to use the context of the data analysis to the study as whole. Well. Uh, the sample in, uh, selected for the study was uh, the population of the hearing solution customer uh, of Colombo district. There were 80 customers were asked to participate in the survey using the non probability sampling. Actually, my inten intention was to uh, get the online basis question, but the thing is, then after I, uh, both, both the terms were collected uh, on direct uh, sampling, questionnaire sampling, as well as the online survey sampling. Mm. This is my philosophy. The main research philosophy based on the ideological, on the style of adopt, adopting the research uh, synthesis, synthesis uh, is connected with the attribute, uh, perceivers, knowledge, features, and other things. And when I move on to the research approach, uh, identify between the conceptual framework variable and the dependent variable in the process of providing the disapproving. Uh, uh, the hypothesis is my main concern. The technique of the data analysis was the uh, in inferior statistic. Uh, the inferior, in inferior uh, statistics used to uh, study are mainly direct approval, uh, dis disapproval of the hypothesis connected to the studies, and also the research question with based on the Likert format. Uh, it uh, directly used to insert the data study sheet. Uh, I uh, calculated the data throughout the SPSS. This is my hypothesis. Actually, I have been uh, uh, created the null and positive hypothesis according to the features I have been created on my uh, conceptual framework. This is my favorite part, the results, the data analysis and the results finding. The data analysis and the results finding connected based the critical analysis of the inferior and the descriptive results obtained throughout the values connected hypothesis based analytical assessment and also based on the correlation values connected with the different data analysis technique. This is my uh, descriptive statistic. You can see there is a mean value and maximum mean as you have have been approved, there is a positive mean values. Uh, actually, reliability analysis also have been done. This according to features, there are concave alpha, uh, alpha L values. Based on the res results that are derived on the comparable alpha and the also based on the reliability validity parameters are recognized. Uh, that there is a positive reliability value of data collected and is directly connected to the overall dependent variables. The, this is my regression analysis. Correlation analysis uh, shows that there is a multiple regression value uh, pattern with the multiple data correlation based. There are the positive regression value between the uh, recognized two valuable variables under the subcomponents. This is my model summary and the ANOVA summary as well. As a conclusion, for the conclusion, uh, it can be safely concluded that the overall research established direct correlation between the social media marketing and brand awareness using the uh, descriptive statistics connect with the study. Uh, actually, as the result, uh, such a correlation and the study shows that ET subcomponent attribute with the social media marketing conceptual framework are determined the uh, hearing solutions brand awareness. This is my key findings to identify the social media factors that influence on brand awareness, hearing solutions brand awareness. The analysis and also the literature review led through uh, through word the recognition of the more versatile and the conclusive ideology connected to the my study study uh, the uh, i identify the impact of, impact of social media marketing on brand awareness of hearing solution offered by the vision care the conceptual Realization and the conceptual framework development, hence such impacts has had been materialized with the proof of numerical substances and the research you can have, I have proved in the previous slides.
uh, to uh, provide the recommendation on how we can improve the social media marketing campaign to increase our here in solution brand awareness is my main target my main intent based on the findings about the most appropriate recommendation will be enhanced the features of the advice advertising campaign by the company such as entertainment feature uh, uh, interactive feature electronic white uh, mouth of feature feature and the customer rating feature uh, that's how all the features need to be uh, collectively increase the brand awareness of our here in solution business. Okay, these are my references. Uh, actually, uh, since this is the awareness research, uh, as a take home message, I would like to say social media is uh, about the people, so not about the business. So provide the people and the people will provide for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lakshita. Are there any questions from Judge Panel? Yes. Now, uh, from your research data, how are you going to generalize your data into the society? Uh, actually, I'm going to generalize. Uh, we need to move over the things because we are only prefer the brand awareness of the hearing solution. There are several things, customer loyalty, there are several things need to be added. But my main intention was to create the, how we can influence to the patients which we are coming to the hearing solutions, how we can create the brand awareness throughout that, throughout the social media marketing. What were the problems that you faced during the research? Uh, actually, there are several problems. I was uh, very hard to collect the data. So actually, nowadays, uh, adult to uh, children to adults, they have been using the social media. But when it comes to the adults, like a Nika Discal questionnaire, sometimes they were like a fatigue to fill it out. That's why I have to use the direct questioning technique to get the more responses. Thank you. Thank you. A next audiological profile of auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder in the pediatric population of a selected audiology clinic by Takia Farooq. Good evening everyone, I'm Zakia Farooq and today I will be presenting my research on the topic audiological profile of auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder in the pediatric population in a selected audiology clinic. So the content of my presentation includes I will be introducing you to the study and uh, give a background to it. And uh, then we will be looking at the objectives. Then we will look at how the methodology was, what methodology was adopted. Then we'll discuss the results obtained from the presentation and the conclusions and references. Let's move to the background of the research. Uh, hearing loss is estimated to have a prevalence of over 20% globally and 9% uh, in Sri Lanka. So it is a, a rising concern. So hearing loss can be categorized into conductive hearing loss, sensory neural hearing loss, and mixed hearing loss based on the site of lesion. And this study focuses on sensory neural hearing loss and auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder. First, let's look at what is auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder. So ANSD is a type of sensory neural hearing loss. Unlike uh, the other sensory neural hearing losses, it has intact outer hair cells and the absence of typical functioning in the auditory nerve. So this is observed as a preneural response 
obtained from the autoacoustic emissions and, or cochlear microphonics and absent or abnormal response generated by the auditory brainstem response. Uh, the etiologies of ANSTs are still not well known and the risk factors are also still not firmly established and the site of lesion differs in among patients. So this leads to a, a spectrum of symptoms established by patients. So the management and intervention is very challenging and it requires highly individualized attention. Let's move on to the objective. Uh, the general objective was to develop an audiological profile of patients with ANSD from audio audiological records of the pediatric population that attended this clinic from 2017 to 2022 and to compare the risk factors for hearing loss between uh, patients with ANSD and sensory neural hearing loss. So as the study and the literature reports a variability between uh, populations, uh, the prevalence of population, and also between the regions. This study is, uh, aims to estimate the proportion of ANSD among the pediatric population in Sri Lanka. And uh, since there is variability among ANSD patients itself, this will describe the audiological characteristics of patients with ANSD in, who attended this clinic. And finally, since there has n uh, very limited studies on the risk factors specifically for ANSD, we will compare the presence of risk factors for hearing loss among patients with ANSD and sensory neural hearing loss. So the, let's look at the methodology adopted. The study design is a retrospective comparative case study where secondary data analysis was performed. The sample size was 137 patients. The study instrument uh, ha, uh, was a data extraction sheet which was used to ex extract data from case history forms, audi audiological test reports, and clinical notes. Uh, the data collection period was from 1st of April to 15th May 2023. So the study population included uh, all the patients' records from uh, 2017 to 2022, and the age range was uh, selected from 0 to 18 years. So uh, the inclusion criteria was all the records registered and they excluded uh, some of the records, that is when they did not complete the testings and there was no diagnosis established, we excluded it. Uh, this data analysis was done using the SPSS software version 26. The Descriptive statistics, including absolute frequencies, means, and standard deviation were used to summarize the data, and a comparison of the proportion of risk factors between the two groups was made using chi-square test. So let's look at the results obtained from the research, and it will be discussed in three sections uh, with respect to the objectives. First, let's look at the proportion of the patients. Uh, this is a pie chart of the distribution of patients according to the type of hearing loss. And out of the patients who attended the clinic, nearly 20% of the population were diagnosed with hearing loss. Out of them, 2.9% was conductive hearing loss, 0.5% was mixed hearing loss, and 14.1% uh, was sensory neural hearing loss, excluding ANSD, and ANSD was found to be 2.7%. Uh, this, pre uh, this proportion falls between the prevalences reported, that is 0.42%, and 5.3% reported by Vignesh and colleagues in 2016 and Mittal and colleagues in 2012. So therefore, the proportion of ANST patients among sensory neural hearing loss 
is 16.05 percent. This is close to the highest percentage reported in the literature by Kirkim and colleagues in 2008. Uh, now let's move on to the audiological profile of patients with ANSD. So in the clinic, we found 22 patients to have uh, the ANSD and only one of them had unilateral loss. Uh, and the distribution among genders were equal, while the mean age of diagnosis was found to be four years. So this uh, graph cho bar chart cho shows the audiological test findings in each year. Uh, so the otoscopy uh, was normal in all the patients, while uh, no, it, tympanometry was normal in 91.9 percentage, and OAE was present in half of the nearly half of the patients, that is 44.2 percent, uh, and it was absent in 37.2 percent. This is also reported in literature that over the years, uh, patients with ANSD tend uh, the OAEs tend to disappear. And uh, however, cochlear microphonics were seen to be in all patients and uh, with absent or abnormal ABR. Now let's look at the third portion, that is the comparisons of presence of the risk factors and other associated factors of hearing loss among patients with ANSD and sensory neural hearing loss. So the comorbidities were com uh, compared between the two groups and we found that autism spectrum disorder, speech delay, and cortical visual impairment, global developmental delay to be stat statistically significant. Now looking at the prenatal, um, prenatal risk factors, we considered maternal infections, RH incompatibility, uh, gestational diabetes mellitus, hypertension, and endocrinal disorders and the most common condition was found to be hypertension, that is 18.2% in ANSD and 11.6% in sensory neural hearing loss. However, uh, statistically, uh, it was not statistically significant in this category. Next, uh, looking at the perinatal period, neonatal hyperbilirubinemia was found to be in 50% of the ANSD population, which was significantly higher when compared to the sensory neural hearing loss, that is only 18.8%. And this was also found to be significant, uh, statistically significant on comparison. And moreover, administration of oxygen, neonatal sepsis, uh, or the other infections and neonatal meningitis or uh, encephalitis were also found to be statistically significant. Prematurity and low birth weights were compared as it was uh, high in both groups, but statistical significance was not established. Uh, moving on to other factors like autotoxic medications and uh, convulsions, congenital anomalies, and a history of hearing loss, speech delay, or disabilities, we found that congenital anomalies that is related to head and neck like cleft lip and palate or uh, dysmorphism or uh, an, any ear-related uh, anomalies was found to be statistically significant. So in conclusion, the proportion of ANSD was found in the pediatric population with risk factors is significant and this justifies the need for implementing newborn hearing uh, screening programs for I early identification. So that is also, you, we need to consider the protocol that could identify ANSD. Uh, next, the neonatal hyperbilirubinemia, administration of oxygen, sepsis uh, including meningitis and congenital anomalies can be used as predicting fact, uh, predictors for infants at risk for ANSD and children with ASD speech delay, CVI and GDD required to be screened in for ANSD as well. These are my references. Thank you.
Are there any questions from Judge Panel? Uh, yes. Uh, now, it was a retrospective study, right? Yes. Were you being able to find all these data uh, from yes. U.S. Uh, records? Yes. About oxygen and everything was there, or did you contact them and ask? So how was the mode of... No, it was entered in the case history records, so I collected it from that. Right, okay, thank you. Thank you, take care. So that's the conclusion of all our presentation. Now I would like to invite Dr. Dimuthu Gunasekara, Senior Registrar of the National Eye Hospital, Colombo, to address the audience on behalf of our Honorable Judge Panel. Uh, so it is really, uh, we are really happy to see uh, the budding optometrist uh, doing research and uh, trying to contribute for the upliftment of the field. So that is really appreciable uh, because uh, the field we are in practice, we are in the medical field, uh, which is mainly uh, driven by evidence. So that's, that's why it is called evidence-based medicine, right? So how this evidence is generated? That is principally by research. So as my colleague in the judge panel, uh, Dr. Praveen said, uh, clinic generates research topics, then research again returns back to clinic in our practice, right? So it's very important to practice research. Uh, and let me uh, address you on uh, evidence-based medicine and try to give some insight about research, what is research, how to do research. Uh, so if I tell uh, evidence, right, we have uh, levels of evidence. It's called uh, pyramid of levels of evidence. So the most primitive uh, type of evidence is from our seniors, like expert opinion, that is level one evidence. If we improve further, if we upgrade that evidence further, we have our own patients with their uh, clinical hi history and their management and their outcome. So what is that? If we present, if we talk about one patient, that's case study. If we talk about several patients, it's case series. So case studies and case series, what happens to the patient with the treatment? That is level two evidence. So if we further upgrade the strength of our evidence, then comes the observational studies. So as I noticed, as uh, us at judge panel noticed, most of the research were at this level, level three evidence. Uh, most of you have done observational studies. So that means you have uh, taken a specific problem, right? And you have uh, assessed the contributing factors by percentages, uh, how much contribution is there, right? So that is observation. You are observing from outside. Observational cross-sectional studies. But if we further improve the quality of evidence, right? When we go for level four, level five evidence. So level four is uh, random uh, ran, uh, uh, case control studies without randomization. Then level five is case control studies with randomization. So that is the highest level uh, in a single occasion that we can perform uh, to generate evidence. So what is this? Uh, so just for you to think can uh, do uh, research to generate level five evidence next time, right? Uh, so what is level five evidence? Uh, that is generated by uh, case control uh, studies, right? Which are randomized and double blind, right? What are these, what does these words mean? 
right? Uh, so suppose there is a uh, disease where uh, there is a new drug that we are going to uh, invent. So suppose uh, the drug's name is A, right? So, and we are seeing whether this drug is effective. So we can select a sample of patients, right? Uh, so suppose uh, a disease X, right? A pay number of patients with disease X. And we have to take a good number of sample, right? When we have a, an adequate number of sample, the generalization, what does generalization mean? The results of our research, whether it can applique, applique, applicate, apply to the general population. So there are uh, statistical uh, formulas to generate the uh, minimum uh, number of uh, sample, number for the sample, so we, we can get the samples, right? So we have a sample with disease X. Then we have to exclude the confounding factors. What are the confounding factors? So most of you have done that, I have seen. Uh, so in, uh, in uh, looking at uh, anisometropia, you have excluded trauma, scars, like that. So those are the confounding factors. Other contributing factors for the disease. Suppose for the disease X, we are seeing whether, uh, let's say diabetes, we are seeing whether the patient is having hypertension, dyslipidemia. So those could be confounding factors for diabetic retinopathy like that. So we have to exclude those confounding factors, other contributing factors. So pure diabetic patients without hypertension, without dyslipidemia like that, right? So patients who are having X, disease eggs only, right? So, so we have selected the uh, adequate amount of sample of patients with disease X. Then we have to see whether this drug is working on the patient or the natural cause of the disease is settling without any drug, right? So for that we have to divide the patients, right? Divide our sample and that uh, sample into two groups. Those two, uh, the number for each group should be equal. So then how to allocate the patients for those groups? So that's why, that's why it is called randomized, right? Randomization comes there. So we have to randomize the patient. So they have, can be group one, group two. So for group one, which patient goes? For group two, which number of, uh, which patients goes? So that cannot be determined by the uh, researcher or the patient. So that can be just Random, randomly divided. That's why it is called randomization, right? So there are methods of randomization. So uh, we have computer softwares to generate random numbers. So that we can uh, divide the patient into two groups. And those two groups doesn't have names, should not have names. That's why it's called blind. It's blinded. Uh, so group one can be there, group two can be there. But uh, patient doesn't know whether I am receiving the drug A or I am not receiving the drug. Not receiving the drug means it's called a placebo. We are giving the same shape, same color, same size, say a tablet to that patient but doesn't contain the ingredient, right? So that is called the placebo, right? So the patient, the group that receives the placebo is called the control group. Uh, then uh, the patient groups that receive the drug is called the uh, study group, right? Then we have to uh, analyze whether this drug, uh, with the outcome of the drug. So double blind means the researcher also doesn't know whether this group is the control group, whether this group is the uh, study group. So that that's what that's what why it is called double blind. So that prevents the bias, right? Researcher bias, right? So otherwise, researcher who when analyzing that the researcher know that this patient received the drug, so they might have good outcome. So 
they can get biased. So to, to prevent that, we can do double blind. Uh, so by that method, we can generate level five evidence. So if the outcome is favorable in the uh, patients who receive the drug, uh, we can assess by stati applying statistical uh, formulas, right? Uh, so for that, you can use the softwares. Uh, so that's why you get the p-values and all that to see whether it is statistically significant. The, whether the two outcomes of the two groups, the control and the study group, whether there's a difference and whether the difference is statistically significant. If it is not statistically significant, that drug is not going to help. So it should be statistically significant as well. Uh, and if you are comparing two drugs, uh, suppose current treatment, suppose as an example, uh, the current treatment, the conventional treatment for amblopia is occlusion only. But now you have vision therapy, right? So if you, so you can, so there was a research uh, that she was assessing the uh, impact of vision therapy on amblyopia. So it would be uh, better, will be more strong evidence if she could divide the sample into two, uh, control and uh, study group. So control group would be receiving the conventional treatment, which is occlusion. Uh, so the study group receiving vision therapy. Then we can assess whether there is a difference. So we can justify there is a statistical difference between conventional occlusion method and vision therapy and that vision therapy is superior to conventional occlusion therapy. If you can achieve that, that is level five evidence. So uh, just a little stimulation for you to uh, continue research in that level. Uh, so use the st uh, statistical formulas in uh, uh, SPSS uh, software and uh, you can generate level five evidence which can be published in uh, journals and all that, right? So, so what is level six evidence then? So if you collect all the research, similar researches done everywhere in the world and you compile the, all the information together, that is level six evidence. That is the highest level of evidence that can be uh, generated. So that's why evidence, that, that's why it's called evidence-based medicine, right? So you can generate uh, new knowledge, new practice by, by research. So that's the strength of research. So, so you have uh, put your feet into the field of research so you can uh, continue developing your research like that. So my, uh, all the best for all the presenters who has done very well and my congratulations for the winners. So all the best. Thank you very much, sir. Please remain on the stage. I would like to call Mr. Dasanta Fonseca and Mr. Janaka Fonseca to hand over the tokens of appreciation to our judge panel. Dr. Kihan, Dr. Gihan Tenuvara, Senior Registrar of National Eye Hospital, Colombo, please accept this token of appreciation. Dr. Praveen Kumar, Thank you, sir. Leadership is not so much about technique and methods as it is about opening the heart. Leadership is about inspiration of oneself and of others. Great leadership is about human experience, not processes. Leadership is not a formula or a program. 
It is a human activity that comes from the heart and consider the hearts of others. It is an attitude, not a routine. These are the words by Lance. Being grateful for this strong leadership which has made the way for us to stand on our own, we are most honored to invite Mr. Dasanta Fonseca, Chairman, CEO of Vision Care, to enlighten us with your thoughts. Thank you. Uh, second Sunday of every year, second Sunday of June of every year, we gathered in uh, Colombo and uh, uh, our Vision Care uh, staff family get together in a place in Colombo for uh, this conference for the 13th time. Uh, it's a big task to hold a conference like this. I would, uh, we started very small with small numbers and it has gone uh, quite big now. And uh, I would like to congratulate our academy, first of all, our academy for organizing it constantly with their Hirudini and team. And then the organizing committee, promote their Geet and the team. And then our supporting team of Vision Care, back office and management committee who is supporting it all the time. And uh, uh, this, uh, I would uh, like to add a little bit more to the conference. Like we are in an era, the science is advancing a lot. And things like in the in the in our field of uh, optometry and eye care of ophthalmology, the programs like Revital Vision, which is a technology developed by Israel Company, which we had some presentations today. So not only the eye, they start stimulating the brain to improve the vision. So. So the technology is advancing. We have to be in par with these advances. And if you look at the, our own industry lens, the, this is a myopia control lens. Four, five years ago, we didn't have uh, anything like this. Now we have lenses which controls myopia. And it is a very successful thing. And still not uh, here. We are going to get it very soon. So uh, the success rate, rate was over 90 percent. So the lens industry is moving forward and uh, and there are lenses which we call 4D, not, on, not 3D, we call it 4D, the spectacle lenses, the multifocal lenses now, it's available in Sri Lanka. Also, where, uh, where the lot of areas of, we had problems before with multifocals is covered now and things are advancing. If you look at the intraocular lenses, the, it's one of the intraocular lenses which is in market, in, not in, available in Sri Lanka, but these are the third generation multifocal lenses available. It's a very successful and taking over the intraocular lens market. This is only from one supplier. The size has come up, Ocean Lom has come up with the third generation intraocular lenses. And uh, the other AI is coming in a big way into the, into the thing. This is a, a free software done by the, done by the uh, uh, Canadian company. So this seeing AI is free for a blind people. So it does all the, all the four areas of the recognized people and all that. Google has another one like this. And, uh, and this is uh, the, another thing. So we are just signing the distributorship for Oracam, where for the blind people, they will read and recognize people. So these are the 
newer things that is coming in. So we have to be in par with the, this technology. So this kind of conferences will help us to get uh, in this way. And uh, doing research and uh, development is one of the areas that we have to develop in the future. So I would uh, like to uh, give the challenge to our young academic team and the optometry team to do more on the research and as Dr. Dimuth said, to go to the next level of research. So we are still a school that run for dip only diploma programs with the, with the improvement to the, like trying to improve it to the BSA level. And with that, I think we will be able to go to our, our dreams. The childhood dreams are coming true in the future. So we have to be prepared for those things. And while thanking all of you, Judge Panel, Dr. Dimitu, Dr. Gyan, Dr. Praveen and all that, I will remain. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Your word mean a lot to all of us. And now, we are excited to announce the winners of the day. The most anticipated moment, we have the results on our hand. So the winner of the quiz competition will be displayed in the screen. And it goes to M.M. Kavishka Lakshan. Please come to the stage. I invite Mr. Dasanta Fonseca and Mr. Janaka Fonseca to the stage. On behalf of M.M. Kavishka Lakshan, I would call upon uh, Mr. Purushot. Okay, the winner of photography contest is Malisha Nadun. Upcoming presenter, Certificate in Ophthalmic Assistant Junior Category goes to Netmi Sandeepani. She will be awarded with a cash prize and a medal with a certificate. Upcoming presenter, Diploma in Optometry, Junior Category goes to Aloka Premathilaka. She will be awarded with a medal and a cash prize with and a certificate. Best oral presentation certificate for vision therapy goes to 
अश्का जय सिंह she will be awarded with a medal and a cash prize with a certificate and the next best oral presentation certificate for dispensing optician will go to kavindya silva she will be awarded with a medal and a cash prize and a certificate best oral presentation certificate in ophthalmic assistance senior category goes to pramod das sarani she will be awarded with a medal and a cash prize with a certificate and next the best oral presentation diploma in optometry senior category goes to mahesha nishadi she will be awarded with a certificate and a medal and a cash prize and next best oral presentation will goes to takea farooq for audiology best poster presentation audiology department goes to anisha fernando and tarindu rukshan best post presentation best post presentation optometry goes to isuri piris And now 
the most innovative study of the year goes to Suresh Sulakshan. Finally, the best research of the year and the winner is Ashka Jaisinger. Thank you very much, sir. I congratulate all the winners and the presenters who participated today. And no. now is the time to conclude the Vision Care Optometry Day and 13th Annual Scientific Session 2023. I would like to call upon Mr. Geet Abekorn to give the vote of thanks. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to everyone who made the 13th Annual Scientific Sessions and Optometry Day 2023 a resounding success. As the Secretary of the Committee, I am honored to deliver the vote of thanks on behalf of the entire organizing team. First and foremost, I would like to extend my deepest appreciation to all the participants, speakers, and the distinguished guests who attended the event. Your presence and active engagements enriched the discussions and contributed to the success of the event. I would like to express our heartfelt thanks to our esteemed chief guest, consultant ophthalmologist, Dr. Mrs. Pradeepa K. Sirivardhana, for gracing us with her presence and sharing the invaluable insights. Your expertise and supports were truly inspiring. We are also grateful to our guest of honor, Professor Vajira Disanayaka, for your guidance and words of wisdom throughout this event. Your presence elevated the proceedings and added immense value to our discussions. A special note of appreciation goes to Professor Madhuvanti Disanayaka for your exceptional contribution and advices. We deeply value your commitment to the event and the valuable guidance you have provided. Our heartfelt thanks go to our esteemed keynote speakers, Senior Consultant of Thalmologist, Dr. Pali Mendis, Consultant of Thalmologist, Dr. Lalanta Guru Singha, Consultant of Thalmologist, Dr. Prem Manan, Consultant ENT Surgeon, Dr. Mrs. Vasantika Studiwege, and Consultant Optometrist, Dr. Praveen Kumar. Your expertise thoughts provoking presentations captivated the audience and provided valuable insights into the latest advancements in optometry. We are grateful to our panel of judges, Dr. Dr. Dimuthu Gunasekara, Dr. Gihan Tenwara, Dr. Vasantika Studiwage, and Dr. Praveen Kumar. 
your expertise and fair evaluation of the research presented during the event, your effort ensured the success and credibility of the proceedings. Special thank goes to Mr. Dasanta Fonseca, Chairman of Vision Care Group, Mrs. Kumari Fonseca, Director of Professional Affairs and Vision Care Group of Companies, and Mr. Janaga Fonseca, Managing Director for the Managing Director for their instrumental presence and support which contributed the event's resounding success. We extend our gratitude to Mr. Vidya Jayaratna, and our Head of Academy and the members of the Ceylon Council of Optometry and Orthoptics and the Sri Lanka Optometric Association for their commend commendable contributions and dedication to the field of optometry. A heartfelt thank goes to the cluster managers, branch managers, senior optometry and dispensing and audiology staff for their hard work and commitment to ensuring a seamless and well-organized event. Your contributions were invaluable. We would also like to express our gratitude to the head of the departments, staff members, presenters, and all the participants who attended and actively engaged in the sessions and discussions. It is your collective efforts that made this event a memorable one. And also, I would like to thank Vision Care, uh, Vision Care Director Board and Management, management, of, management and staff of Vision Care Academy, Audiology Department, Sales Department, Marketing Department, IT Department, Accounts Department, and HR and Administration Department. As we conclude this remarkable event, I would also like to announce the committee for the 14th Annual Scientific Sessions and Optometry Day 2024. When I call the name, if you are available here, please get up. Chairperson for the upcoming event will be Lashini Kaushalya. <laughs> Secretary, Mr. Shanil Kayesh. <laughs> Treasurer, Mr. Umesh Dilshan. <laughs> Vice President, Ms. Sachini Nirushima. Vice Secretary, Ms. Devumi Devanarayana. <laughs> Vice Treasurer will be Mr. Dasun. <laughs> we congratulate them and wish all the best. As we bring the 13th Annual Scientific Sessions and Optometry Day 2023 to a close, I would like to take a moment to mark the end of this successful event. It has been a day filled with enriching discussions, insightful presentations, and valuable networking opportunities. Before we conclude, I would like to make an important announcement. The date for the 14th Annual Scientific Sessions and Optometry Day in 2024 has been set for the second Sunday of June, which will be on June 9th. Please mark this date in your calendars and save the day for the another engaging and informative gathering. As we bid farewell to this year's event, I hope you have enjoyed the proceedings and made meaningful connections with your colleagues. I invite you all to take a moment to relax and enjoy the evening tea which has set for your refreshment. Once again, I extend my gratitude to each and every one of you for your dedication, enthusiasm and unwavering support. It is, it is through events like these that we can continue to push the boundless of opportunity, explore new possibilities and shape a better future for our profession. Thank you all and have a pleasant evening. <laughs>